Yo, what's everybody? It's me, Dan. We're here back with a brand new What If, and in today's video, we'll be covering what if Asta from Black Clover was Meliodas's son, and by extension, Elizabeth's son as well. Now, you may be wondering where this idea came from, and that mostly being that as of the anime right now, we do not know who Asta's parents are, which leaves things to be ambiguous, allowing us to fill in what characters they could be, as well as contributing to Asta and changing him as a character in general. So, in this scenario, a lot of things are going to change, for one, because Asta will not be abandoned by Meliodas and Elizabeth, for a few reasons. Asta probably won't have the same relationship with Yuno that he would have had in the original. So, that's just one of the first changes that's going to occur, as well as some other unique changes to his character, personality, and things like that. But enough of the teasing, let's just get right into this part, for part one of What If Asta Was Meliodas's Son. So for anyone who's new to my what ifs on my channel or my, any of my videos in general, with the what ifs that is, for my first parts of what ifs I generally cover what I'm going to do in the what if as well as character situations and differences from the original timeline and things like that. Obviously since this is a crossover between the 7 Deadly Sins universe and Black Clover, there's going to be a, quite a few differences. So let's just get into those right now. As you guys know from the 7 Deadly Sins, Meliodas, spoiler alert, if you have not watched 7 Deadly Sins, Meliodas is actually one of the princes, the first prince, the demon king. And Meliodas' lover is Elizabeth, one of the angels from the angel goddess race, as you would know. So, you might be wondering, how did these two have Asta? And yes, the first difference is that Asta is actually half demon and half goddess in this what if. This means that Asta has two very powerful races flowing through his blood, and, which we'll be getting to very shortly, would affect uh, the story dramatically compared to his original goals, as well as what he stands for in the anime. But enough of that, we're actually going to start getting into the actual what if now, and you may be wondering some questions, but I actually have plans to how to answer everything, which will be going in the story itself. So, if you have questions, make sure to comment them down below, but I will be covering them in future parts as well, because I have a sort of mystery I want to put into this story. Anyway, let's just get into it now. We see Elizabeth. Yes, Elizabeth, alone at their house, when we suddenly hear a loud baby crying, as Elizabeth would get up and run over to the room where we see a baby Asta, with white hair just like his mother's and green eyes just like his father's. Elizabeth would play with her son Asta, who Meliodas has helped name before he had been, well, we'll talk about that later. Anyway, Elizabeth would be raising Asta alone due to some unfortunate disappearances such as Meliodas. With Asta, and now Elizabeth, being together, Elizabeth would actually encourage Asta to become a magic knight, as the magic knights were just like the magic knight squads of Leonas that she and Meliodas had remembered from a long time ago. So by the way, in case you haven't gotten this by now, um, manga spoilers here, Meliodas and Elizabeth's actual child from the Seven Deadly Sins is named Tristan, but in this version, Tr Tristan is basically Asta. So, it's Asta's personality and character in this version. So, anyhow, Asta as a young child would have been very rambunctious and would have been abnormally strong for a child his age, which is to be expected to be a child of the demon prince as well as one of the queen's princesses of the goddess race. Asta would begin learning how to master his powers from Elizabeth at a pretty early age so that he wouldn't destroy things in the house or people around him and they would indeed live in the same village, very far away from the main capital with many royals with a rich amount of magical power. Now, as Asta was a young child, he would have been able to use magic at a much higher level than anyone else's age, except for Yuno. Yuno being this poor church orphan that Asta would have run into every now and then. Asta would have met Yuno, and Yuno was much more timid at a younger, as a younger child, while Asta was still rambunctious and loud. With Asta having inherited a few tendencies from his father, he would have told Yuno that he and him should go peek on girls early on, as Asta had been told by Elizabeth of the many stories of his father and the seven deadly sins and what they had done during their time, with Elizabeth telling Asta to be very respectful towards girls, especially after the way that his father was, with Asta not taking that at all, with his personality having been closer to his father's than his timid mother's. Yuno would eventually get dragged along with Asta's schemes as he goes off to play with Yuno and some of the other orphaned kids, with Elizabeth having encouraged him to do so, being the kind person she was. Elizabeth herself is technically a royal of Leonis, but because they're out in the boonies, no one would know what that is. Asta and Yuno would be helping each other out more often now, as after over the years they become much closer friends. 
This would be the day now when Asta is about eight years old, along with Yuno, and Asta has now begun training to use his magic from Elizabeth. He would show Yuno this one day, with Yuno being shocked as he would watch as Asta uses magic. One of the orphan kids, being the girl with the pink hair, you know, with the big uh, fuzzy hair, she would have fallen and hurt her knee with it bleeding and her, of course, being Sister Lily, along with the priest being rather worried about her getting sick and dying, Asa would offer his help as he reaches down and with his left side holds his left hand up. Suddenly a light white energy would begin to spread across his hand as healing magic would encompass the knee from the goddess race's power. Asa's left eye would begin to turn a soft shade of orange as Yuno know, would notice this. The wound would almost disappear instantly with Asa smiling and asking if she's all better. She would thank Asta, as of course everyone in the orphanage and the priests in general would say, with the church thanking Asta for his help. Asta would say it was no big deal, with Yuno then asking how he knows how to use magic. Asta would tell Yuno that his mom had been teaching him how to use magic since he was a little kid, with Yuno asking if he could even learn, with Yuno then showing a puff of wind saying that he's begun to master his own magic as well, and it would be cool if they could train together. Even though Asta is probably a recovery mage, he could still probably learn a thing or two from him. Re recovery mage? He would ask as he has a questioning look on his face. He would then tell him that he's actually super strong, as he would punch his fist with his other hand, saying he's going to get even stronger than his dad was, with a look of embrace of, well, admiration as well as a goal ahead of him, looking far beyond him. Asta would then tell Yuno tomorrow to meet him up in the fields near the village, and he'd show a Yuno how powerful he was. Yuno would do as he says, as the next day Yuno would go to the fields, where he sees Asta waiting there sitting on a rock, looking rather impatient. As soon as he arrives, Asta would jump up as his hair sways in the wind as he waves to Yuno. He would then ask Yuno if he's ready. Yuno would hold his hands out telling Asta he's ready, thinking that since both of them don't have grimoires, this is going to be a very fair fight. Oh, how wrong you are, Yuno. With him not even knowing how Asta's body is fundamentally different than his. Something that you all should know is that, just like in the Seven Deadly Sins, since both Meliodas as well as Elizabeth can use magic without a grimoire, so can Asta. Because Asta is technically... well, I'll get into that. But anyway, Asta is able to use his full magical power without a grimoire. Which is something very interesting that is not possible, really, in the Black Clover universe at least, without a grimoire to use to channel their power to use spells. As Asta is about to power up, Yuno know, would be shocked as he sees and feels the ground shaking. Yuno's you know, about to give up when suddenly Asta asks if he's ready. Yuno's you know, eyes are now locked on Asta, as on the right side of his face, a black, purplish mark is beginning to spread across his skin, and his eyes have now become black and empty. This demonic like power would begin shaking across his body as sparks begin to fly. Elizabeth would suddenly stand up as she looks out the window, seeing the dark clouds surrounding, as she thinks that Austin must have unlocked his demon power, just like Meliodas is able to. With Elizabeth running out of the house to try and stop him from using it against Yuno, Meliodas would ask Yuno if he's all set to go. Yuno would then be shocked as he says he's about to give up, with Asta running forward telling him he's going to win. Suddenly, just as he's about to throw a punch, he would move it just past Yuno's head to the right-hand side and behind it a whole force of wind would come shaking, ripping the ground of wheat asunder, as the entire ground behind Yuno is now destroyed from just one punch. This would be when Yuno would meet Elizabeth for the first time, as Elizabeth would run up behind Asta and put her arms around him on the right hand side and left hand side, asking him with a soft calm voice, What are you doing, Asta? With Asta turning around looking very scared, we can see Elizabeth her eyes close as she then opened them with the goddess symbol I in one. Asta would then apologize saying he didn't mean to do it, he was just showing off. Asta would quickly seal back his demon power as he tells his mom he's really sorry, with Elizabeth patting him on the head and telling him that he's not supposed to use that outside, and telling him that it's dangerous for him to do that. Asta and Elizabeth would look over as we see Yuno standing there basically about to pee his pants, with Yuno having just almost been killed, as what he would imagine. Yuno would tell Asta that he's amazing, with Yuno having been shaken to the core. Yuno would ask how powerful Asta is and how it can even be that strong without a grimoire. Asta would say that he trains every day, just like what his dad used to do. When he would ask who his dad even is, both Elizabeth and Asta would get quiet for a second, as we now see a flashback to when Asta was now just a baby, with Asta not having this memory but her his mother telling him about it. Elizabeth and Meliodas are raising Asta together at their house now out in the middle of the boonies here in the Clover Kingdom. Do you really think it'll be safe here? Elizabeth would ask as Meliodas is now putting a cloak over around himself. Yeah, we'll be safe here, Elizabeth. 
There's something I gotta do, though, he would say. He would tell Elizabeth everything that he's planning on doing, and that he hopes that she'll be alright here for the next few years with Asta, and he promises that he'll come back. He would kiss Elizabeth as he holds her close, telling her that she'll see her very soon, with Elizabeth crying as Meliodos leaves, telling him that she should come back as soon as he can. This is when we would see Meliodos would be leaving, to go and report to the Wizard King. Wizard King Julius would have met Meliodos many, many years ago, when he had first landed there from a, a dark portal from the ground. He would have found Elizabeth trying to heal Meliodas as best as she could, with black tendrils of energy surrounding Meliodas' body. Julius would have helped the wounded Meliodas along with Elizabeth, and this would be before they even had Asta, and helped them eventually come to live in the Clover Kingdom, far away from the royal capital, away from people, where they could have again regained their bearings until they were ready to go home. That is, if they could return home. Meliodas would have explained everything to Julius by that point, but I won't be getting into that in this part, but in the future parts I'll be explaining exactly what happened during the Seven Deadly Sins. Anyhow, Meliodas would have now reported to Julius, who would be telling him that he would be going to the Spade Kingdom, where he'd been sensing some extremely demon-like magical power. And in order to return home, like he'd been telling Julius they'd been wanting to do for a long time now, Meliodas had to find it because he would need it for something. Julius would give Meliodas permission to leave the kingdom, telling him that he has secret be safe of him and he won't tell anyone about his son or his wife. Meliodas would thank King Julius of the Wizard King and tell him that he will repay him back someday, as Meliodas would leave the kingdom and head towards the Spade Kingdom, the kingdom that worships demons. Anyway, as I said, years have passed now and Meliodas still has not returned, unfortunately, for very specific reasons, which I won't be getting to for several parts now. But back to the actual story, Asta has just revealed his demon power, with Elizabeth now explaining to Yuno, and Asta telling Yuno, his first friend, that he was actually not a human. With Asta being well aware of his actual parents being a goddess and a demon. Yuno would be shocked to hear this, but he wouldn't doubt it after seeing that monstrous strength. But this wouldn't make Yuno run away from Asta, as he'd always been known as a prodigy, and having someone that was above him in terms of magical potency and power was almost reassuring to him, as he felt like he could almost be considered normal. Asta and Yuno become close friends at this point, and the years would pass. In this version, though, Yuno doesn't look down on Asta like he had pretended to in the original for those years. This would all come to the forefront after Asta and Yuno would both reach the age of 15 where they would both head to the tower where they were to be to receive their grimoires. You know, at this point is renowned for his magic in the village, and he is the pride and joy of Hodge Village, with Asta not having revealed his power again in many of the years after he had first fought against you know. Asta had still been training though, as he had found the giant demon skull in Hodge Village himself and would be training there every day. However, instead of drinking that magical aiding potion since he already had magic, he would simply be physically training because of what his mother had told him about the seven deadly sins and their physical strength and how it was beneficial in fights with against other people who can use magic. Asta would think this was very smart and he wanted to be just as cool as fa his father was to his mom and he wanted to impress everyone in the village, especially Sister Lily, who he had proposed to multiple times by now, saying that he was literally a goddess who she could worship, and she would deny him, respectfully saying that she was not interested. Asu would be training super hard to become the best he can be, with him having tried his own father's tricks of stealing Sister Lily's panties, with him being slapped by water extremely hard every time. Asta at this point would have now learned a little bit more, and it would now have a full handle at least on his angel's powers. With his demon-like powers still being uncontrolled due to not having anyone to teach him how to use them, he would still be, have access to them though, and which it would increase his physical strength and magical power. Anyhow, Asta would be now heading towards where the Grimmar ceremony would be in the tower with Yuno, as well as the other kids who were turning 15 in Hajj village and surrounding villages. As all the Grimmers are being sent flying out, Asta would be holding his hands up waiting for one as he closes his eyes. After several minutes, everyone would be shocked as Asta would open his eyes and look to the right where he sees Yuno having received a four-leaf grim clover grimoire. A four-leaf clover, people would be whispering, as the last person who's had that was the first Wizard King. The Wizard King, Asta would be thinking, as he remembers the Julius guy that Elizabeth had told him about who had saved his dad and mom. 
At this point, Asta would be thinking a lot about how he wanted to become like the Wizard King, strong and helping to people, and it was his dream actually, as well as Yuno's, to become so strong that they could be the Wizard King. That was Asta's dream. And Asta would watch as Yuno has his rival had actually just received a four-leaf grimoire. He was proud of his rival and would think now it's his turn to get one too. As he closes his eyes hoping for one to appear, nothing would happen. And you may be wondering why, but as I've already explained before, Asta's body is different as well in this timeline as his was in the original, with him not having the same kind of magic as other people in Black Clover. People would be laughing at Asta, as in this version, Asta would be sitting there as his eyes are wide open, thinking that there's no way he didn't get one. As people are mocking and laughing at him, Asta would consider to unlock his demon power and make them stop laughing, as he feels himself beginning to get mad at them. Asta would hold himself back as he then remembers what his mom had told him, that he was special and different from other people, and that it wasn't his fault if things were different for him. He remembered what his mom had told him before he had left that very day, telling him that she was proud of him no matter what, as she would then tell him that she doesn't have a grimoire either, with Elizabeth having expected this to happen. He would remember what she had told him as his shoulders were then slumped to the ground, as he just falls to the ground feeling completely empty, sad that he is, his hopes of having received a grimoire just like Yuno have gone a dash. With Asta leaving the area, he would now be walking alone, as we would then see Yuno as well. Yuno would be walking away when Asa would see a shadowy figure following after him. What's that guy do going after Yuno for, Asa would think, as he would then run after where he sees Yuno walking down that long alleyway. With now, the magic knight who had been kicked out of the magic knights, the one with the chain ability, would now ambush Yuno, taking his four-leaf clover Grimrar from him and threatening Yuno's life, saying that this can sell for a high price. Asa would then yell from behind, telling him to get away from Yuno, as Asta would then look his eyes up, with Yuno looking towards Asta. The magic now would then turn around and ask, Oh, it's the brat who can't even use magic. You didn't even get a grimoire. How pathetic, he would say, as he begins laughing. Asta would tell him to shut up, as he would then begin walking towards him calmly. Yuno would then tell Asta he doesn't have to do it, with Asta now telling him to shut up, shut up, shut up. He told him that he doesn't need a grimoire. As he's saying this, suddenly a chain would come flying towards him. Asa's pure, raw physical strength as a demon would suddenly rip the chain as he grabs it, ripping it out of the guy's arm as he keeps pulling until more of the guy's magic's being used. I dare you to come at me, he would say, as Asa would then reach to his left waist, where we see a small sword. This sword, of course, being Lost Vein, the sacred treasure of his father, Demon Prince Meliodas. He would send, then send another chain flying towards Asta. Asta reached back as he pulls out the sword and says, You asked for this! Full counter! He would say, as he then swipes with the blade. As he uses his own father's technique that he had been training all these years to use from pure memory of what Elizabeth had told him how it worked and how it was called and used. He had finally been able to master just full counter. He cannot use full negate or full counter revenge, like his father can, but he can use full counter. As he uses this, suddenly this would be when the chain would then turn around and slash back towards the magic knight. You know would be impressed? Asa found a way to negate magic? No, it's a reflection technique, you would think. As Asa would then be holding Lost Vane, telling him he's not going to go easy on him. As he runs towards him, using the sword and cutting up the chains, and fighting like his life depends on it. Using his pure physical strength, he'd be beating this man down. As this strange child with a strange sort of magical power would interest a flying bird called Nero. We see suddenly as a grimoire begin to drop out of the sky. Asa would turn around as he notices it. What the, he would say, as he then sheaves Lost Vane, with the chain user now trying to crawl away with Asa, you know, grimoire. Suddenly, the grimoire, which now float in front of Asta, as a black and red energy would begin to surround it. This is, he would think, demonic energy. Just like, suddenly Asta's demonic energy would begin to synchronize with the book. Asta can now feel his connection to the grimoire, as he then would sheave Lost Vane, picking up the entire sword and placing it inside of the grimoire, creating a brand new spell, the Lost Vane Sword of the Demon Prince Meliodas. With now two swords in the book, he would see a new blade that he has without him no even knowing what it is, the Demon Destroyer's Sword. With Asta realizing that as he reaches with his right hand to grab it, that sparks are flying off his right side. I have to use, he would think, 
As he reaches to his left, using his angelic side of power that he has access to from his mother, he is able to grab the demon destroyer sword and hold it without it absorbing any of his magic due to, as I said before, Black Clover and Seven Deadly Sins magic being on different frequencies, allowing Asta to use this anti-magic that only would affect people from Black Clover. As he pulls out the anti-magic sword, it feels weightless to him, as he then tells this guy that he's going down. As Asa begins swinging at a maximum speed, slashing at this guy and beating him to a pulp, before he tells him that he's going down. At this exact moment, a brand new form of energy would have entered Asa's body, directly between his angelic and demonic sides. He now has access to null magic, nullifying magic through anti-magic from the demon of the book. Yuna would smile as he tells Asa he knew that he would get one. He knew he would get a grimoire. Asa would look up as he smiles, with his right eye actually appearing red right now. He would then thank Yuna so much for his believing in him, as he would grab the four-leaf clover grimoire and put it in his hand and give it back to Yuna. Asa would then deactivate the anti-magic sword as he then closes the grimoire and puts it at his side. He would now be able to feel this different energy, as Asta is able to sense magic in this version because of his ability from Seven Deadly Sins, because if you remember they can do that. He could sense inside of him that he has a third origin point. He has his angelic side, his demonic side, and a new red and black, a dark energy that nullifies the magic from this world. Asta would feel himself as he's about to pass out, realizing that he just absorbed three types of magic and his body wasn't used to this much strain. With Asta falling to the ground, almost unconscious from the amount of physical energy he'd be putting to it, he would now be smiling as Yuna would help Asta up as he would carry him back to his house and Elizabeth would greet him. She'd be shocked as she sees that Asta actually has a grimoire, with Asta saying that he's going to be a magic knight and he's going to become the wizard king, no matter what. Last time. Asa has just took inside of himself the power of the anti-magic devil, which he can sense within himself due to him already possessing magic from the Seven Deadly Sins universe. Anyways though, his mom, Elizabeth, would be extremely shocked when he had come home that night and showed her his new grimoire that he'd gotten from the ceremony quotation marks. With him not telling Elizabeth about him having received the grimoire after it, with Elizabeth extremely proud and confused with how her son actually got a grimoire, since the Wizard King himself had told her and Meliodas that it was unlikely that either of them would ever come to possess grimoires of their own, like everyone else in this kingdom, which is one of the main reasons he had to hide them away so that people wouldn't grow suspicious of how they could use magic. With Asta, anyhow, now possessing a grimoire, this fear would now leave Elizabeth as he can now go to the royal capital and apply to become a magic knight without any suspicion. Elizabeth would embrace her son, as she's extremely proud of Asta when she tells him that she honestly didn't think he would get a grimoire, with Asta then looking up to her as he smiles saying it's no big deal. With him excited too on the inside, he would tell his mom that he's going to become the best magic knight in the entire kingdom, and eventually, the wizard king. We see a quick flashback to actually the day previous to this one, where Asta and Yuno give each other a fist bump, with Asta being slightly shorter than Yuno, a lot shorter than Yuno. And this actually has been something that's bothered Asta for a while, but with his mom being tall and him being short, he would ask why he's so short compared to everyone else, with this causing Elizabeth to laugh as she remembers Meliodas, and he would, she would explain that it's his father's fault. This would actually cause Elizabeth to laugh as she remembers a memory of Meliodas now being hit around by Deanne. When Elizabeth remembers Deanne and he, she thinks of the other seven deadly sins, she would go quiet for a second before telling Asta with a smile, that he'll be fine. With Asta going off on his journey with Yuno to head towards the royal capital so that the two of them can participate and try and join in on the magic knights exam, Elizabeth would wish Asta good luck as she waves off her son as he goes on his way to try and become the next wizard king. Asta and Yuno would be traveling for quite a while as the two of them would be eating together and overall just traveling across the land before they can get to the royal capital. With Asta having never been to the royal capital, at least not in his memory since before he was a baby, of course, Asta would be seeing things new for the first time, with Yuno following close behind him. Asta and Yuno would then see it, the great stone walls of that protecting the royal capital. It's huge, Asta would say, as his eyes are filled with wonder, as he gazes at this humongous structure, that being the royal capital, with hundreds and hundreds of buildings be making and composed between the walls, as he sees the great castle on top. 
that's where he w- would be, right? I also would think, as he thinks about the Wizard King, if that's where the current one is sitting right now. Austin Yuna would then enter into the gate, as the gate would open for them, with them as well as other people from around the land having all been sent by their families or willing to go on their own to try and apply to become magic knights. With Asta and Yuna now entering into this royal capital filled with nobles and royals, so many new things would pique their eyes. As Asta would see different types of food he's never seen before, heard of, he would see people going about their day with different types of magic and different clothing that they would wear. With Asta now being introduced to this new world, Yuno himself would also be in shock, as Yuno, who had always been rather quiet and soft-spoken, was now seeing something amazing for the first time. Asta would tell Yuno that he's going to go off and find something for him to eat, as he would then run off to the stalls with Yuno holding his hand out telling him to wait. With Asta coming back rather quickly with three garden snakes on a stick, he would then offer one to Yuno, who would smell it and say he'll pass. Asa would then say, suits yourself, as he would then gulp all three down, before tasting it for himself and then gagging on the flavor. He would then pull his hand away from his throat, as he then says it's actually not that bad, as he and Yuno would then continue walking towards the arena, where everyone was supposed to meet up for the Magic Knight exam, as they were told by letter. With Yuno and Asa now heading through the city, they'd finally make it as they enter through the great doors and see hundreds of participants sent from all over the Clover Kingdom, hoping to become those of the elite of the elite, the Magic Knights. There they are, the Magic Knight squads, the Golden Dawn, the Silver Eagles, the Crimson Lions, the Blue Rose, Green Mantis, Coral Peacock, Purple Orca, Urger Deer, and the Black Bulls, with all nine magic squads and their captains assembled, something that was rather rare for all the captains to attend to. Everyone would be shocked, as they hadn't seen all the captains together in such a long time that it was a major event. With everyone in the stadium excited, especially the participants of course, the participants would be ready to show what they've got, as we would then see Asta and Yuno preparing for their first test that they'd have to take. The first, of course, being how to fly using a magic broom. Asa would gulp as he feels nervous, as he's never been able to, or try, to actually fly using a magic broom before. You know what easily grasps as he begins flying around the stadium, as many other participants have started as well. Asa would close his eyes as he focuses on his magic. He feels his angelic and demonic halves, as well as the new line that's formed between them, his anti-magic. If you remember those birds that were in the stadium that can sense if someone has low magical power, you can see that all of them are being converted into the corners far away from the middle, or that's where Asta is, you would say. Asta, although not having Black Clover's magical power, is extremely powerful when it comes to having copious amounts of magic, since he is half demon and half goddess, and his pure presence has enough pressure on it that the birds themselves would be wise enough through instinct not to mess with him. With Asta now stepping on the broom, he would focus as he tries to use his own magic, the demonic and angelic magic he has from the Seven Deadly Sins. As he focuses this more powerful form of magic that he's used for all of his life into the broom, the broom would shatter into pieces, as all the captains would be curious about what just happened, as the entire broom just exploded from the overload of power. Asta would be worried now, as he tries to use his other, his third power, anti-magic, As he's given another broom, as he tries to focus, this time the broom would do nothing as it doesn't fly or anything. He'd be nervous and sweating, as you then put the broom down then walk over to the captains. He'd raise a hand as he then shouts out expectantly and asks something. Does he have to fly using a broom? Or if he has another way of flying that he prefers, could he do that instead? The captains would nod over thinking this and then saying that that would probably be fine. As long as you can fly, that's the most important thing during missions so you can get to places. Asa would thank them very much as he's now at ease, with Yuno know, looking over and seeing what Asa's about to do, thinking this is going to be flashy. Asa would focus as he tones out his demonic half, as he then focuses on his angelic side, remembering how his mom had explained it to him. We see a flashback to Asa when he was around 8 or 9 years old. From his perspective, we see Elizabeth standing there, as she's showing him how to use Ark, the magic that the goddess race is famous for and is used against demons. This arc is something that she'd only been able to master after she'd awakened her memories and had escaped with Meliodas after, well, the Ten Commandments had struck. Anyway, back to the present for a moment, we suddenly see a golden and white light begin to surround Asta, as Asta's hair would take on a much brighter tinge as it becomes more white-like and a softer energy would flow around him. As on the left side of Asta's back, suddenly this magical power began to take shape, 
as Asu began to float into the air. He'd be flying around easy as a bird now, as he now has on the left side of his body a massive wing with pure white feathers. Back in the past, we see around an 8 or 9 year old Asta, who was now with Elizabeth as she was training him how to use Ark, the famous magic that the goddess race was known for, and she would teach him how to convert this magic and use it to create wings so he could use flight. Asta would now be flying around the stadium with bits of feather and magic trailing off of him as we see Yuno flying next to him on his broom. Asta would be impressing the captains ama amazingly so, with even Yami impressed now as he's now taking his eyes off from the ground and would see this as no one else has ever used something like this during the flight test. After the test ended, Asa would turn off his magical power as he feels the flow of magic through his back and would cut off the flow of magic causing the wing to disappear into a bright flash of white light before Asa's back on the ground and looks like he's back to normal. Everyone who was participating would have been shocked at seeing Asa's magical power, as he had used that to actually fly, which was rather impressive. People were running up to him and asking what kind of magic he has, as how do he do that? Does he have some sort of flying magic? Some sort of maybe transformation magic that allowed him to grow a wing? Asa would be trying to push everyone off him, as Yuno know, would tell him to back off. Yuno know, would help protect Asta, as everyone would also respect Yuno know, after seeing his flying skills as well. With Yuno impressed with Asa not even knowing about that he could do that, he would tell Asa that was amazing, and definitely a good way to show off in front of the captains. Asa would smirk as he then looks from left to right saying he was just showing off a little bit. With Asta and Yuno now waiting for the next stage of the participation, the captains would now have an eye on both Yuno and Asta, thinking that they have two prodigies on their hand this year. The next stage everyone was even more excited for, as it was now time for everyone to battle in the arena. Asta and Yuno would be the two people that everyone wanted to avoid most. However, the nobles themselves would be going after Asta specifically after sh them showing off in front of everyone. Damn that peasant, they'd be thinking. Which is actually funny since Asta is actually the Prince of Leones, so he is technically above them in royal ranking if they really wanted to think about it. But they don't know that and Asta doesn't even know about that either. Anyways, with Asta now being targeted by the nobles along with Yuno, one of the nobles who would have ice magic would t target Asta, saying that he wants to fight him, with them being the first people to participate. Asta would tell him he has 10 seconds to take it back if he doesn't want to lose and get kicked out immediately. With the captains being extremely excited to watch this fight, the noble would laugh as he tells them that a peasant's trying to command him what to do. Asa would tell him that he warned him, as he would then ask him what he wanted to beat him with as they entered the arena. What? I'll give you a choice. Would you like to lose from this power? He would say, as Asa would lift his right arm, and suddenly bl a jet black and purple energy would shoot out as he creates an axe by using his demon metamorphosis where he can create dark energy, as he then slammed this axe into the ground causing a large explosion. Was that dark magic? The other captains would be looking at Yami expectantly, as he would just shrug his shoulders saying it was way too fast, that he couldn't sense it in time or even scan what type of magic it was. With then Asa saying, or how about this one, he would say, as he then opens up his other hand and creates arc, causing an explosion destroying the ground on the left hand side. The noble would be falling as he's shaking to the ground, with him realizing, oh, but that's not without using my grimoire, right? Asa would say as he smiles, pulling out from the left hand side his grimoire, as he would then reach in within and pull out the Jack Blatt sword of the Demon Slayer's sword. The Noel at this point would be crying as he just fell to the ground from pure shock, with the captains impressed that that wasn't even using a grimoire and that's how much power he had. Asa would then ask if he wants to go the fourth route, I won't use any magic at all. With him then putting all of the magic power that he just flexed away, him showing off as expectantly for the captains, Asta and his head would be freaking out right now saying he didn't mean to go that hard with his ability as he hadn't even tried to use that much of his demon power since he doesn't have a, such a good handle over it as his angel or even his anti-magic power. With Asta now freaking out in his head but still trying to act confident, the noble would then say that he, there's no way he could beat him without magic power. Asta would then tell him that he'll prove that theory as the noble would then run towards Asta. With the noble running at Asta and about to use ice magic, he would freeze the entire area saying that if he doesn't want to die then he should forfeit now. As he creates a blizzard of complete ice, Asta would then rush forward as he uses his demonic-like strength, 
He pulled back his fist as all the captains were watching as he physically punches through the attack. As he's now in close range, then Ola then try and use a sneak attack as he pulls out a knife from beneath him and covers it with his magic as he's about to stab Asta with it. <laughs> Asta would think as it's too close. Asta would take the hit as his skin, which is almost like as hard as rocks from being a demon, would suddenly be covered with purple markings as he activates his demon sign of energy to cover him. As the blade is about to pierce into Asa's body, the blade would shatter on impact as Asa quickly then reseals his demon power. As he then slams his fist into the noble's face, causing him to go flying into the wall and crashing to the ground, Asa would have a solid victory. He would have completely outclassed that high-ranking noble in both magical power and physical strength. All the captains at this point are watching. Even the coral peacocks, whose captain's usually asleep, would have stopped snoring for once, which everyone was surprised about, as even she could sense this power. Asa would then go back outside to the participants, who would all be shying away from him as they'd saw that dis monstrous display of power. Asa would then feel a hand on his shoulder he turns to the right and sees Yuno patting him, telling him that was impressive, but he needs to be more careful. If he hadn't been able to block that in time, with him, you know, seeing the black markings having appeared just in time to block that strike, then he could have actually taken some damage. Asui nods, saying that he needs to show off in front of the captains though, right? If I'm going to become the Wizard King, you know, then I might as well start impressing from the very beginning, he would say as he smiles. It'd be Yuno's turn up next, and Yuno would use his wind magic to easily dispatch his foe as well, with all of the fights now taking place. Now that the battle portion had ended, it was time. They would explain how the captains would be choosing who would become their new squad mates, as the examiners would then say that if a captain wanted you on their squad, the examinee would be called forward individually, and if any captains would wish to induct that examinee, they'll raise their hand. If more than one captain raises their hand for an examinee, then that examinee would be free to choose which squad they would wish to join. Examinees are considered to have passed the test if at least one captain is willing to recruit them into the squad. With multiple participants going up and being denied or being accepted, it was finally time for Yuno's turn. Yuno going first before Asta. With Yuno walking in, all the captains would raise their hands. As we see Yuno be shocked, as he would then choose the Golden Dawn to become his squad. Everyone would clap as the Golden Dawn usually doesn't accept anyone besides nobles. Asa would cheer for Yuno, telling him he did an amazing job, saying how proud he was of his friend for having accomplished that much, but saying he's still not going to let him become the Wizard King before him. With now more examinees passing, it would now be time for Asa's turn. As Asa would walk out onto the sta stadium arena area where he'd be called forward, Everyone in the participant section would be holding their breath, as they had seen Ostek do some incredible things during his time at the entire performance of the ceremony. As Ostek takes a few steps forward, he can feel the beat of his foot clacking against the stone, matching rhythm with his seven heartbeats. As he stands in the dead center in front of the captains, he would take in a deep breath as he closes his eyes, waiting for them to raise their hands. As he would open his eyes looking up, he'd breathe out a gasp of relief as everyone in the stadium began to clap. In front of him, all of the captains would have raised their hands, and now it was up to Asa to choose which squad he would be in. This is a tale of ancient times, an era before the human and non-human worlds were forever divided. After many, many battles, the Seven Deadly Sins, an order of legendary knights, would be divided. Dragon Sin Meliodas and Princess Elizabeth would have a son in a faraway land, and his name was Asta. Asta would eventually attain his own grimoire and start his journey to become the Wizard King. We see Asta standing there before the captains, shocked that all of them raised their hands again. Should I choose the Golden Dawn? No, I don't want to copy you, no. D damn it, he'd be thinking, as Asta would be looking inside his mind, thinking what is the right thing to do. He'd remember all the stories that Elizabeth would have told him about the Seven Deadly Sins, the magical knight order that his father had created, that had gone many journeys together with his mom, and had fought so many different bad guys. As he looks at all the groups, he'd be thinking, which one would be the best fit for me? As he's looking at all of them, he'd already realized that the royals were a no-go, and they'd already be against him merely for not being a royal, with quotations, since us is actually a royal on two fronts, being the grandson of the Demon King as well as the grandson of the Supreme Deity. Asa would look into each and every one of their eyes before he finally meets Yami's. When he looks at Yami, he sees something interesting in his eyes, this look of intense curiosity. Asa would gulp as he then decides that that's what he would pick. I choose the Black Bulls, 
This would be when Yuna would turn around shocked. All of the captains would be shocked, including Yami himself, not even thinking he had a chance. I'd also be sweating as you can see that the Silvas, the Silver Eagles, would already be ex upset as some of the squad members would be now cursing out Asta for choosing a, such a lower ranking Magic Knight squad. Asta would then proclaim that he's going to make the Black Bulls the number one Magical Knight squad in the entire Clover Kingdom. And if he had to be do it by himself, he would give Yami a smile with Yami actually feeling that this kid's going to be something else. We can already see some of the other captains thinking that Yami might be Asa's father, because why else would he choose such a low-ranking squad unless he had some relation to that trash? Besides, he didn't look like he came from the Clover Kingdom anyway. His hair color as well as Asa's general look just had something foreign emanating about him. Anyhow, the rest of the captains would be quite disappointed as they all wanted Asta a lot. Even some you could say more than you know. You know, in his mind, would be freaking out as he's thinking, why didn't Asa pick the Golden Dawn? Like, as if he made a mistake or something, since you know thinks that he screwed up now. As Asa would walk out of the stadium, with him deciding to meet up with the Black Bulls after the ending of everyone else being picked for their squads, you know would follow after him quite fast, as he then asks in a whispered hush, and also angry tone, Asta! What were you doing? You could have joined the Golden Dawn and we could have been in the same squad. Well, yeah, but that's your thing. I want to do my own thing. Asa would say simply as he's looking at Yuno. Know. Yuno know would fall backwards on himself as he now realizes how stupid Asta can be sometimes. Asta, you picked the lowest ranking Magic Knight squad when you had every captain wanting you, including the Royals. That's a big feat, you know, he would say. Well, you got the same thing, so it can't be that impressive. You know would cough as he then tells Asa that, hey, that was mean with Asa giving him a wink and sticking his tongue out. Anyway, you know, it'll be fine. Soon the Black Bulls will be on top as number one, and then the Golden Town will be on bottom, he would say, with you know taking this as a challenge. Well, I won't let that happen so easily, you know, you know would say. Then I guess it's a challenge, Asta would tell you know, as the two would bump this with them then turning and walking in different directions. As we can see, the noble, who would now be having a major grudge against Asta, would try and intercept Asta in the restroom, just like we would have seen what would have happened to Asta in the original. This time, as Asta would enter the restroom, the noble was trying to sneak behind him, Asta would be able to sense his magic, or more likely his source of magic, as he would turn around, his eye flashing seemingly red for almost a second. If you try anything, he would say, seemingly into nothing, open air, then I'll kill you, Asta would say as he closes the door behind him. We then see the camera pan out to behind the wall on the other side, where we see the noble shivering as his eyes are now shaking with him gulping, as he then runs away, deciding that he doesn't want to risk it. Asa would finish his business as he then leaves the restroom, where he would then run to Yami, Thunder, and Gordon. The three of them would then tell Asa that they'll be heading back to their camp now, and that if he wants to come with, then now's the time. Asa would be preparing to release his angel half as well as his wing so that he can fly when then Fenrir would open his hand as a portal would appear. Asa would stop as he looks forward amazed at this magic. Asa being surprised as he asks what that is with Fenrir going on to explain what his portal and transportation magic works. Yami would laugh he then says that Fenrir's also his personal ride as he would then slap Fenrir on the back a few times. Fenrir obviously not looking too happy about it. With Fenrir then, along with Gordon, Asta, and Yami now walking into the portal, where they would then arrive back at the Black Bull's base. We can see it sitting there in the large stone castle-like area. Asta would be quite impressed, as this is his first time ever seeing any of the Magical Knight's bases, and as he looks around the area, seeing the forest surrounding it, he would be pretty shocked, as he's walking around, excited to walk through the door. As he runs up and opens the door, ready to meet the other members, suddenly a fireball would come blasting into his face. As a fireball comes crashing towards Asta's face, Asta would take like a champ. As a flaming ball pierces right through Asta's face, Asta would take no damage, as a fireball would just sputter out, with Asta taking nothing physically or anything, as Asta would just take in the hit. Asta would proceed to walk in like nothing happened, with Yami whistling as he would watch that, with Magna not being an easy shot to throw off. We can see Magna and Luck chasing after each other, almost like they're playing a game of tag, as they're playing around in the Black Bull's base, destroying a ton of things. Asa would be super concerned as he then would ask Yami if that's really alright for them to do, as he then sees a chair burst into a million pieces. Yeah, this happens all the time, he would say, as another fireball comes flying towards them with Yami catching it and throwing it away, telling Magna not to hit him with it. Magna would say, sorry boss, as he would then keep going after Luck. Luck, on the other hand, would be laughing as he's being chased around by Magna with Luck having the obvious speed advantage. Hey, he would think as he sees a new guy. 
He looks strong, Luck would be thinking, as he then jumped down and asked if he wants to fight him. As Asa would see this gleam in Luck's eyes, he would hesitate for a second before saying he'd fight him any time. With Luck now jumping up and down, saying he wants to fight right now, right now, right now, Yami would push Luck back, saying to calm down with the new members. Magna would tell him to wait just a damn minute as he says that he's going to give Asta an initiation trial. With him then jumping down from the ceiling as he then holds up a fireball telling Asta that if you really want to join the Black Bulls then you're going to have to show me how strong you are. He would then walk outside with Asta following sharp behind him. Asta would open his grimoire and so would Mag Magna as he would then reveal his flaming bat and fireball. He would then tell Asta to get ready and that if he can hit this ball without dying then he's definitely a member ready for the Black Bulls. As then we would see Magna trying to charge up his fireball, now making it much larger than the one that hit Asta beforehand. Asta would pull out Lost Vein this time, which he hasn't used for quite a bit, and he would notice that something on about it was different. He could feel that there was something else within it now, some sort of the anti magic that he's been feeling with along his other two sources. He would decide this should work fine as he then holds up the blade, with him being the most comfortable for short blade like this since that's what he had been using most of his life. With Asa telling Magna to come at him any time, this would be when Magna would throw the ball of flame. Asa would take the sword as he waits for it, waits for the exact time. FULL COUNTER! As Asa would slap the ball of flame, barely with the tip of the sword, suddenly the ball would stop midair as it began shooting back towards Magna. Magna would be shocked as he has no idea what's happening as he is almost about to get hit by the fireball. Magna would be able to barely dodge out of the way as the fireball would then slam into the ground just behind where Magna's head used to be as an explosion happens. Asa would ask if that satisfies him, with him then putting Lost Fame back into the grimoire. He would then close the grimoire and put it back to his side as he looks at Magna. Magna would give him a thumbs up saying, damn that, he's pretty strong, asking what kind of magic that was, with Asa saying that it's his own magic, it's called Full Counter. It's a technique that allows me to use any blade of any sort and gives me the ability to reflect any attack, so long as it's offensive magic. If it's any kind of magic that's physically close or something that isn't a projectile, then I don't think I can really counter that. As Asa recalls the words that his mother had once told him. Magna would say that that's pretty cool, as he would then tell Asa to welcome to the Black Bulls. Vanessa, who had been watching this point, would then give Asta his new Black Bulls uniform, as well as change the headband that he had on to match the Black Bulls' signature. With Asta ecstatic about this, Asta would be practically jumping up and down with his extreme joy, as he would then be allowed to go and choose a room in the hideout that would be his and his alone. Asta would then run to the hideout as he thanks Captain Yami, as he then runs in, with the rest of the Black Bulls members thinking about this new member. A lot of them be staring at Yami, as we then see a few hours ago from Charlotte's perspective. Charlotte's the captain of the Blue Rose Knights, by the way. As we see Asta a few hours beforehand that very same day activate his dark half by using his demon, demonic as well as his angelic side when he's flying. We can see the dark type of magic that is surrounding him, and all the captains have begun discussing if he has dark magic, which was extremely rare. Charlotte would immediately be looking at Yami as she thinks in her head that he might have a, a kid. Oh, damn, she'd be thinking as she's now having some more self-confidence issues, wondering if she could just ask him about it. With Asta then having passed and her wanting to try and see what would happen, as soon as she saw Yami raise his hand for Asta along with the other captains, she would know that this was something up. So now she has a theory building about Asta being Yami's son, which would be another thing in the puzzle that makes Charlotte's love for Yami a bit more funny since the two of them actually aren't related. Back to the present, however, we see Asa now choosing his room, and as he chooses his room and sits everything down, he begins writing his letter to Sister Lily, as well as everyone at the church and his mom. Asa wrote pretty much the same letter that he had in the original, with instead him telling them that all the captains had raised their hands for him and you know too. With we now see Elizabeth reading the letter, she smiles, thinking that she's so happy that her son had passed. With Asta now glad that he's made into the Magical Knights squad, we can see everyone at Hodge Village happy for both Asta and you know. Now back to the present, we see Asta, just as the morning had started setting in, we see Asta outside of the Black Bull's hideout training. We see him physically working on his physical strength since those swords are no joke, but if he wants to keep up his physical build, gotta train every day, as he would remember from what his mom had told him about Bon the seventh daily since Foxen agreed and his dad Meliodas now they used to fight each other. 
He'd be thinking about this while he's training, as he would then brush it aside when he would see someone new. As Asta was just taking a trip around the house to go and actually train, this would be when he and Magna would have actually run into Noel Silva. And Noel, of course, being immediately patronizing towards Asta for him being a peasant, quotation mark, and talking about their differences in the royal status. Asta would know that he's a royal, but he hasn't told anyone about it, so he wouldn't really be that upset by this comment or anything at all, since it doesn't really matter to him. And also, his magical power is way higher than hers at this point, which is pretty obvious for anyone to see. As she would coldly reject him, with Noel still being Sundare Sundare, she would then arrogantly explain more about the royal family and the Clover Kingdom's houses, as well as saying that they're not equal as squad mates. With Asa showing no reaction to this at all, just like he would have in the original, Noelle would then get angry, she then tries and use a physical means to convey what she's talking about. She would send a water attack towards Asta, and it would miss and hit Magna just like it would have in the original. So Magna would have gotten pretty pissed off as well and demands an explanation, with Noelle now trying to figure out how to explain. Noelle, instead of apologizing though, would just say a snide comment implying that it was Magna's fault to get hit anyway. This would really piss Magna off as he then demands to know why she's even in this squad to begin with. No one would say the same thing as she wonders why too as she throws her robe away, with now her running off. We see Noelle training in the forest as she tries to work on trying to hone her magical power and blast waters with against targets, with her missing every time. We see Noelle having flashbacks and memories of all the things her siblings had done to shun her, for her being a failure as a royal, they would say, eventually leading up to her brother not allowing her into the Silver Eagles. This would be when Noelle's magical power would go out of control, as she would begin to form a water sphere around her, causing massive destruction to the nearby area. We see Asta as well as several other of the Black Bulls members run out from the hideout as we see this massive sphere of destruction ripping up the land, the trees, and getting close to their base. We can't let this stay here for long, Yami would say, but he couldn't do anything about it because with if Yami tried to attack the sphere, he could risk hurting Noelle. Asta would raise his hand and offer to take it down as Yami would nod, telling him to do it. Asta would power up so he can get up there as we see him release both sides as now Asta would charge up as we see him with his angelic wing. As Asta would fly into the air, we see him now beginning to speed towards the water as he would then pull out the Demon Slayer sword. With a single slash, we see Asta cut right through the water ball as he then flies through to the other side. As the water ball has now been completely decimated by the anti-magic, Asta would then fall to the ground as well as he f flies downwards as he attempts to catch Noel before she hits the ground. Finral would save Noel with a portal and Asta would be relieved as he would then also let himself go to the ground. As Asta is now on the ground, Noel would be lying there with Yami complimenting Asta on his technique saying that was a good job. Yasta would rub the back of his head saying it was no big deal as he thanks his captain. Noelle at this moment would be worried about everyone's beginning to scorn her just like her family had, and as she's sitting there waiting to be punished or have someone say something about her, this would be when everyone began complimenting her on her magical power. Asta saying that was crazy, saying that that was a ton of magical energy she released just there, and that if he hadn't been there she probably would have destroyed the entire base. Noel was shocked as Asa was complimenting her for how much power she had, as well as the other Blue Embers were doing so as well. This would be when Noel would take their hand, as she would then put on the black back the black robe of the Black Bulls uniform, and officially decide to stay with the Black Bulls. Last time we would have seen Noel's crazy destructive power, which Asta would have stopped, utilizing his anti-magic and his ability to fly which we can now see is much different than the original where Asta had to have Yami throw him in order to do that. Anyhow, the Black Bulls would now have gone back to pretty much business as usual, with Asta and Noel tagging along eventually on their first mission coming up today. With We see Magna, who him and Yami had been betting with this village chief for a long time now and gambling, would have lost a lot of their stuff. Yami and Magma, after a few days of this, would eventually have been sent over to that same village to where they'd be sent for the Black Bulls to take out some wild boars, just like they would have in the original. Asta and Noel, being the two new members, would be sent with Magma. This time, however, unlike Asta, Noel, and Magma all having to ride the same broom, it would only be Noel and Magma on the same one since Asta can fly by himself. So, as they're told that they're going to be leaving, Asta would power out as he then flies into the air using his wing. As you see him using his angelic side, Noelle would be a bit impressed, but she wouldn't want to show it just because she couldn't show that she was impressed to a, a commoner's power. 
With Asta flying into the air and Magma and Noel shortly behind him, the trio would then fly off towards the village with Magma telling them about the mission plan and this would be their first mission. Asta would be excited this is his first ever mission as a magical knight and a knight of the Clover Kingdom. As they approached the village, they would see a strange fog already covering the area. This this is the village of Soshi, right, Magma, Senpai? Asta would ask as he asked his older squad mate, with Magna who had been there just a few days ago where they'd lost the bet, which was the reason they were coming here at all, would recognize the landscape around the village, but the entire village was seemingly covered in fog. That might be some sort of mana of some kind, Noah would comment as she notices the fog swirling. Asta and then Magma would both agree, with Asta saying he'll check it out as he blitzes forward. Magma would tell him to hold up as Asta would ignore him. Asta would use his grimoire as he then pulls out Lost Vein, his short sword from his father, Meliodas. As Asta then approaches the fog, he would then swing at it as hard as he can, almost like a hurricane of wind would come flying through, as Asta's pure physical strength combined with the anti-magic blade would cut through the fog as they can now see inside the village. What is that, Asta would be thinking, as in the very middle of the village where all the villagers are gathered, flying above them about 20 to 30 meters are huge icicles that are about to pierce down and kill all the villagers. As the icicles begin to fall down, Magma himself would rush in as he uses his fire magic, blasting the icicles and turning them back into water just before anyone could get hurt. This would be when they would come to find that the village chief, the one who had originally wanted the request to come and slay the wild boars to begin with, was already dead, as he had protected the villagers from these villains who they still had no idea who they were. It's possible they're outsiders from outside the Clover Kingdom, Magna would be saying, as he tells Noel and Asta to keep their guards up. Asta would stand in the way of the villagers, as he is now defending them from a man who's sitting on the wall, opposite from the direction where the Black Bulls members were standing. He would then try to throw an attack at Magma, with Asta watching as he sees that this man has a cold look in his eyes, meaning to kill a Magna. Asta would burst forward as he then uses Lost Fan as he slices the magical attack in half, saving Magna, who was at this point de depleted from energy, but not so much as he was in the original because he didn't have to carry Asta and Noel, but depleted enough to the point where he couldn't defend himself. The man would sigh as he then reveals his name to be Heath, and that he and his group are going to take the Black Bulls down in less than five minutes. At this point, Asta's getting pretty pissed off as his first mission's getting interrupted, as he then says to stop screwing around. We can see Asta's magical powers beginning to rise, as the ground's beginning to shake underneath his demonic, angelic power. As Asta begins to walk forward, he would hold out Lost Fin as he then points the sharper point towards them as he slides his hand across. The whole group watches as Asta's assault begins. He'd rush forward towards Heath about to slash him in half by using Lost Fane when suddenly one of the members would use a misspell attack. Asta would say that's not going to work on him as he uses his anti-magic quickly covering the blade and slicing through the mist. He would be analyzing this as he realizes that this kid has the ability to negate magic. He thought of a plan as he then tells his mages what they're going to do. The group of mages, while Asa is distracted cutting through the mist, would begin spreading around the group of villagers as icicles begin to form. I can't protect them all, Asa would be thinking. Damn it, I'll have to use that, he'd think, as he would hold his hand against his blade. Sacred treasure release! Asa would utilize Lost Vane's power of creating clones of himself to create five clones, five clones of Asa to defend the villagers from around all sides. Asa would spread out as each clone is a bit weaker, but with anti-magic and full counter, it should be able, f it should be fine. Asa would be thinking as he's waiting and ready. Magma would jump into the circle as well as Noel would be behind covering them. With Noel trying to shoot a blast at Heath, with him easily not even having to dodge as it misses him, saying that her aim is terrible which would disheart Noel, obviously. The icicles would be blasted as Asta is ready to defend. FOOD COUNTER! All five of Asta's clones would say this as they use full counter on the blade, Lost Vein, that they possess. The icicles flying towards them would suddenly be hit by an invisible barrier as they would turn around and then f go sent flying back towards the mage that sent them. Suddenly, man many, many mages would get pierced through by the icicle as they fall to the ground with blood coming out of them. As some of the children of the villagers are scared, they would go to Noelle and ask if what's going to happen to them, and if she, they, she could protect them. Noelle, who'd be incredibly scared herself, would be watching in fear as Asta and Magma won't be able to keep up with all of them. Even with six Astas defending them all, it was still too many, as Noelle would be forced to make a decision. Noelle's Grumar began to evolve as a new spell, Dragon's Den, would arrive. 
As Noelle would use this water spell, she would create a barrier of water spinning and surrounding the entire villagers with Asta and Magma outside of it. Asta would thank Noelle for the protective spell, saying he can focus on their attacks better now. As now that he's taking down most of them, he would turn around as Heath was standing there, disappointed by the results from his lackeys. Asta would burst forward as he deletes all of his clones at once. As he shoots forward at full speed, he would say he's done playing games. As just as he's about to hit into Heath, he would freeze the ground beneath Asta, catching his foot. Don't think that's going to stop me, do you? Asta would think. As with Asta's pure, raw, physical power, he'd rip the ground up with his f shoe, and then use it to kick Heath in the face with a clump of ground on his foot. As Heath would get sent flying into the dirt by Asta's physical attack. He would be knocked out cold from Asa's pure strength, and Magna, using the rest of his magic that he has access to from the flames he already threw out, would take all of the leftover minions along with Heath himself and wrap them up using chains of Heath to actually restrain them. After a few minutes, or I'd say around 10 to 15, Heath himself would wake up as well as his minions and they'd realize that they'd been captured. This would be when all the four and Heath who had been left alive would commit die by using the same device they had in the original to end themselves so as to not give any information to the enemy side. With Heath and all the minions who had been left alive having off themselves, Asta would be disgusted by the lack of appreciation they held for their own lives, if not just theirs then others as well. This would be when an anti-magic bird, which we would now know would be Nero, would be coming out from Asta's robe, as it would fly through the house and find the magic stone that the chief had, bringing it back to Asta and pecking at him. Asta would grab the stone and ask what that is, as Noel would notice the bird that would be landing on Asta's head. The villagers who had been left alive would be extremely thankful to the black bulls for saving them, and it would tell them that their chief had fought to the very end to protect all of them. With the Unknown Order being the Eye of the Midnight Sun, having been defeated, Asta would help the village kids as they would be forming a grave for the village chief who had died. The grandson of the village chief, Nick, would ask Asta if it was really true that he was from the Forsaken Realm and had still become a magic knight, then explaining how his grandfather had regretted never applying to become a magical knight, saying he had enough magic power to do so and had always wanted to do it, but he never could. Nick would then be told by Asta that everything was possible if you put your effort into it, and this would remind Asta of his original goal of proving that he could become the Wizard King. The theme in this version is a bit less heavy hitting since Asta's actually nobility, and it's not he's not a peasant, so it's not the same thematic beats as it would have been in the original, but it still hits hard. Anyhow, Asta, Magna, and Noel would leave the villagers as they thank them for saving them. With, when they returned to the Black Bull's hideout, Yami would greet them as he says that the Wizard King had bestowed a star upon them for their defense of Soshi Village. With now there being a, only a hundred star difference between them and the Golden Dawn. With Asta asking if that means they were a hundred stars ahead of the Golden Dawn already. With Yami laughing because he says they were in the negatives. This would be when Yami would then give all of them their paychecks for the month, with Asta amazed at the money that he had received. He would thank Yami as he would then head up to his room where he goes to write a letter to his mom, which he would be sending all of his funds to. As he sends his money home to Elizabeth, Elizabeth would be proud of her son, who is already working so hard, as she thinks back to her time with, with Meliodas, Deanne, Bon, King, Gother, and Merlin, and Escanor. As the seven of them, eight, nine including Hawk, had been traveling across Leonis to save the kingdom, She'd be thinking about what Asta tells her about how he had defended Soshi Village as well as saved the people there, but how he, she couldn't get how those people could just kill themselves just by the drop of the hat just because they'd been captured. Anyhow, Asta would have been rewarded for his duties of saving the people as a magic knight, and this would be, have been the conclusion to Asta's first mission. A couple of days have passed this point, and now it would be time for the next arc to begin, that being the dungeon exploration arc. With the dungeon having appeared between the borders of the Diamond Kingdom and the Clover Kingdom, the Wizard King would be then telling the two squads that he was assigned to it, being the Golden Dawn and the Black Bulls, that they would be sending some members to go investigate the dungeon and find any treasure that might be hidden beneath it. The two squads of, I'm referring to, of course, being the Black Bulls and the Golden Dawn. With From the Black Bulls, we have Noel, Silva, Asta, 
as well as Luck Voltia, all sent to go and investigate the dungeon. From the Golden Dawn side, we still have Yuno, Mimosa, and Klaus. The trio from the Black Bulls would set off. And almost immediately as the three enter the dungeon, Luck would tell the two good luck because he would then jump off on his own, using his lightning creation magic to create his gauntlets and his leg armaments, which he would then use to jump and basically run away, as he is, has his own mission that he wants to go and find to fight someone or something. Asu would be a bit upset that their older squad member just abandoned them, but him and Noel should be fine on their own, he would say, as Noel would blush from Asu turning and looking at her when he says this. Asu would just be a bit confused as Noel would tell him to keep going forward as she would push him with her wand, spoking him in the back. By the way, the same thing happened or that, I'm, that happened in the original with Nasta, Noel, and of course Vanessa going to the common realm and Noel getting her wand, but I didn't feel it was necessary to mention it since Asta didn't really have that big of a part in there. And Asta probably would have just had a similar situation occur that happened anyway, so we're just going past it. But Noel does have her wand that she bought to focus her magic. Anyhow, as Asta and Noel are traversing the dungeon together, Asta would step on a trap as Noel would then be attacked from behind as a large plant would try and attack her. Asta would easily take the sound as he uses his angelic side by using arc. He points his right hand forward as he then grabs the air, seemingly, as a ball of light would appear, choking the entire plant as he destroys it using his light magic. Noelle would be impressed as she sees his light magic for the first time, asking what that was. Asta would say it was just a little spell called arc that his mom had taught him. With Noel now more curious about Asa's mother, they would continue traversing through the dungeon at this point when the second trap would then go on them. This time, however, as the trap's about to activate, Asa would easily take it out as he takes out the sword and slices through the air with it, cutting with anti-magic as he deletes the trap instantly. This would be the time when Yuno, as well as Klaus and Mimosa, would meet up with Noel and Asta as he would see Asta's attack from and notice it from anywhere. Asta, you know, would say, as Asta would look up towards Yuno. Know. You know? It's been ages. At first, the two would be quite happy to see each other. This would be when Klaus would ask Yuno know, why he saved those Black Bull trash members. Asta would look at Klaus at this point and tell him to stick it out of their business, with Klaus being absolutely offended at how such a, a younger, lower-class magic knight could talk to him like that. Asa would stare at him with dead eyes as he tells him that if he really wants to interrupt, then he can go and do it by himself since no one else cares what he has to say. Asa, at this point, basically roasting Klaus, causing all of his metal to just melt to the floor with the amount of disrespect this man's causing him. Klaus would basically now be enraged as he starts mocking the Black Bulls, asking where their third member even is. This would cause a lot of tension between the two, as this would be when Mimosa would break in, saying that their squad recently got a gold star and commenting how her and Noel were cousins. Noel would try to say that their squad also recently got a gold star with Klaus brushing it off as a lie. Asu would be quite pissed off at this comment as he then tells Klaus that he doesn't believe them then asks them how he did it and he'll explain every detail. Klaus and Asta would now be getting into it as Yuno would be watching thinking that if Asta and Klaus had to fight, Asu would probably win. Anyhow, Asu would challenge Klaus saying that he didn't join the Golden Dawn on purpose since he wanted to prove that the Black Bulls were better even just by having him on there. Klaus would be laughing at this arrogance as he tells Asta that there's no way the Black Bulls will ever surpass the Golden Dawn. Asta would take that as a challenge as he asks Klaus if he wants to race to the center of the dungeon, with him accepting this. Asta would tell Noel, as they're going to win this, that they're going to get to the center first. This would be when Klaus would create his metal chair and tell Yuno to lead him, as Yuno would use his wind magic as the three would then move, using Mimosa's plant magic as a map. Asa would tell them all they're going to go through an easier way, as Asa would begin charging up his power and looking down at the ground. Asa would tell Noel to hop on his back, with Noel blushing and asking what does that even mean, with Asa then telling her just do it, as she would then jump as Asa would grab her two legs, as he would then power up, releasing his wing, as he then blasts forward with a whole burst of light and dark energy. He would zoom past Klaus, Yuno, and Mimosa as he goes flying to the right with a ton of magical power from, from going behind him with Noel on his back. Asa would tell Noel where he, they think they should go next with them flying through the dungeon trying to get towards the center as fast as possible. Little do the groups know that at the center of the dungeon, some of the Dying Mages had already arrived and were waiting for the Clover Kingdom's arrival. 
Last time Asta, as well as Noel, had met up with the Golden Dawns to members that had been sent, including Yuno, Mimosa, and Klaus. The five people now, the five magic knights I should say, would then descend into the dungeon as Asta and Klaus would have a contest, with Asta insulting William Vongens, the leader of the Golden Dawn, and then of course with, well, Klaus attacking back against Yami, the two would be all fired up as they decide they were going to make it to the bottom of the dungeon first. And currently we see Asta flying using his angel wing along with Noel as they're flying down towards the descent into the dungeon. Meanwhile, Luck had gone off on his own to find danger, and Luck would begin to have his battle just like he had in the original with one of the members of the Diamond Kingdom's Magic Knights. As Luck uses his lightning armaments, he would be continuing to do battle with the smoke user as they begin to descend through the dungeon as well with the smoke user being broken up for Mars and the others who we'd know had been sent. This magical knight who uses smoke would then introduce himself to Luck as being Lotus. Lotus sent from the Diamond Kingdom as he begins reminiscing over his battle with Yami Tsukihiro. He explains to Luck about his battle with the Black Bull's captain many years ago on the battlefield in war between the Clover and Diamond Kingdoms, but Luck just says that he wants to have a good fight as he then pounces towards Lotus. Lotus at this point had been using his weakening spell ever since the fight had started, and Luck was starting to feel his magical power draining away. However, in Luck's mind, we can see an image of his mother, pushing him to fight harder, as Luck would dive deep into the depths of his magical power and export even more energy, as he pulls out more lightning magic and continues fighting against Lotus. Lotus at this point would have no choice but to use one of his trapping spells. Using his smoke, he would create a bars of smoke that surround Luck and capture him, while Lotus makes his escape to go and try and find Mars. Speaking of Mars, meanwhile, towards the center of the dungeon, the Golden Dawn have run into a problem, as Mimosa has been attacked by Mars, and now Yuno and Klaus are fighting against him, with the two having actually a hard time keeping up with him. Asta, on the other hand, is with Noel, as the two are keep flying down into the dungeon, would actually run into Luck just like they did in the original. As they see Luck capture and smoke, Asta would quickly pull out Lost Vein as he covers it with anti-magic and slashes through the bars, quickly releasing the smoke. Asta would ask what happened with Luck saying that there's no time and he's going after that guy. Lotus would turn around as he can sense his magical power having been deactivated, wondering how Luck could have escaped his slow death by suffocation as Luck comes charging down at full speed towards him. Both Asta and Noel follow close behind his lead, as they see Luck taking on the smoke user, who is now throwing heavy swaths of smoke everywhere to block their vision. Asta would offer his help with Luck declining almost immediately. Asta grit his teeth and saves their comrades, and that he's not going to leave them to this fight alone. And if they actually want to beat the Golden Dawn, they have to get to the middle layer of the dungeon as fast as possible. After a little bit more fighting between Lotus and Luck, Asta would have had enough, as he tells Noel to stand back. As he's now preparing to get into the fight himself, he pulls out Lost Fan again from his anti-magic grimoire, as well as his demon slayer sword. As he charges anti-magic and covers the blades with them, he would then prepare himself as he then releases a bit of his demon power to increase his physical strength. That's enough, I said, he would say, as he swings as hard as he can, a burst of anti-magic flowing forward like a wind, and hitting through the smoke, destroying the entire smoking area. With Luck and Lotus both impressed, Asta at this point would have suddenly teleported, as his full speed is even higher than Luck's. Asta at this point would then slash a floss fan on Lotus's back, causing him to fall to the ground unconscious. I used the blunt end of my blade so I didn't kill him, Asta would say, as he tells Luck that's enough and they need to get to the middle of the dungeon there. Luck would be disappointed as he says that he's going to fight Asta once they get out of here. Asta would agree, giving a smile and saying he's down to fight Luck whenever. Luck would be giddy, thinking of fighting Asta and the prospect behind it, as he says he can wait for a little bit longer, with the three of them then now descending into the dungeon more. Mars at this point is pretty much bullying Yuno and Klaus, with Yuno now having to actually use his full power, and that not even being enough. Before anyone can do anything, Lotus suddenly begins to turn to smoke as he escapes out of the dungeon. Asta turns around just in time as he sees, thinking that he should have been knocked out, before realizing that he didn't put enough anti-magic into it, thinking that he must have more anti-magic than this. What Asta doesn't realize is that the dripping of anti-magic power that he has access to is nowhere near as am an amount of energy that he has in his other halves. So when Asta released all that anti-magic, his swords had none left on it when he hit him, so... He really just knocked him out temporarily, but he didn't take away his magic. 
Asta would be frustrated, but the three would continue into the dungeon, as Lux sent his son with even more power approaching. Someone incredibly strong. Back to Yuno and Klaus, Klaus is analyzing the target, Mars, and he can see a magical stone on Mars' forehead, which gives him the recollection of the rumors that the Diamond Kingdom had been performing experiments on children with magic stones. As this is the point when Yuno's finally pushed Mars enough to make him use his grimoire, Mars will unlock his grimoire as he prepares to use his ice magic. Mars would recommend to Yuno that he gives up, with Yuno breathing heavily. I'll never give up to someone as weak as you, he would say, as Yuno powers up more wind magic and is preparing to now hit another assault of wind blades towards him. But it's futile as Mars prepares to launch a huge attack that is most certainly going to be fatal to Yuno. As Yuno closes his eyes, thinking this might be it, suddenly everyone in the room, Mimosa, Klaus, and Yuno, all would open their eyes with shock, as a mass of magic power is now moving towards them. Mars could feel it too as he turns around, and just as he's about to throw his attack towards Yuno, Asa would be holding up his hand with a single finger, telling him to stop. We can see Asa's eyes, his left and right eye having now completely different shades, one covered in darkness, purples and blacks, an empty pit and abyss and the other got shining so bright, golden. Asta now has released almost 60% of his full power, as he has half of his half with the angel half, and he now has some darkness covering his body on his right. As Asta begins to walk forward slowly, Mars would quickly throw the attack towards Yuno. Suddenly, Asta's clone would move up as it attacks using Lost Fan and cuts the blade in half, causing Mars to be shocked. Asta would deactivate his clone as he swipes Lost Fan, this is when he would tell him that he's not going to fight against Yuno anymore. His fight's with him. Asta would ask what the hell happened, and Yuno would be sitting there in a pitiful state. Asta would then get an apology from Yuno saying he was too weak, with Asta saying he'll take it from here. Mars would be intrigued and also scared. Asta would close his eyes as he then reseals his magic power, saying that's way too much for a small fry like you. Mars would get angry from this, as he then tells him not to underestimate him, saying that he has two types of magic. Mars doesn't hold back as he creates a humongous blade, and then shoots it towards Asta full power, as he then activates his flame ability from his other half, as he then begins healing himself and recovering his magical power from his fight. He'll need everything if he's even going to damage this guy. Asta looks up as he just blinks towards the blade. It's almost like nothing happened. No one in the room even saw the movement, as Asta had swiped his lost vein against the blade. Full counter. Asta using full counter would have sent the blade flying back. Mars shocked as the blade is then completely turned around and shot back towards him, piercing him in the right arm, almost ripping it off in fact. If he didn't have Thingix Cloak, it would have not been able to heal as quickly and he would have been disarmed. While Asta continues pushing Mars towards the back of the dungeon room, the treasure room, Asta would already have won the battle. Both mentally and physically, Asta was superior. With Asta, right at this point in time, probably being around the same level as a Magic Knight captain, with just his pure physical strength. Klaus, who had been berating Asta for, has his mouth wide open, as he had felt that raw magical power, untamed, as Asta's energy was probably even higher than Captain Vengeance's. You know, would look back towards Klaus, who just has nothing he can say, as we see Asta now taking off his black bull's robe and throwing it aside, saying he doesn't want to get a damage in the fight. Asta would suddenly speed forward as he slaps Mars across the head with his hand, open palm, as Mars feels a surge of energy slam into him. Mars didn't even have time to react as he now has memories of Fauna come flooding back into him, thinking about the time of what happened to her. He tries to push this aside as he then gets pushed back, with Asta throwing a quick punch into his gut. Mars would be sent flying backwards as he covered himself with crystals in order to defend the blow. Mars is still completely knocked out though, and then Klaus would just bind him using his steel magic. Asta would question the ability of this bind with Klaus not able to say anything, Asta offering to do it himself instead, but Klaus would say he has to do something. This would come back to bite them later, but not for now, as they would then enter into the treasure room to figure out what treasures were there for the Clover Kingdom. There was an enormous amount of gold as well as some other magical treasures there as well, with Yuno gravitating towards a certain scroll, which had wind currents around it. With Asta being guided by Nero to a different location, Asta would see a wall that has a similar door opening to the one that they had to use to get into the treasury, which is made of magical power. 
Asu take out the lost main blade and cover of anti magic as he slashes through the door, revealing that behind it was a jet black steel sword. Asu would pick up the sword as he can already sense it has anti magic in it, as he would then tell Nero that was a good find as he stores it in his grimoire. By adding it to the grimoire just like Kiri had added lost strain to it, he now has acquired three blades that he can use anti magic from. Asta would then walk as he turns around, noticing something is off, as suddenly Mars would be standing back up as he's using his Phoenix ability. He'd broken out of Klaus's weak binding, as he had now gone back to full power. We see him as he's using desperation as he's saying that he's not going to fall here. Using his crystals, he binds Yuno, who had just unlocked the scroll by the way, as well as Klaus, Mimosa, and he was now attacking Noel. As Noel just gets hit by a critical injury, Asa sees it just in time, as he's shocked. Mimosa, who's trying to heal Noel, would suddenly be attacked by Klaus as Asta appears just in time, using his newfound blade as he slashes at the attacks. It's still not lighter than Lost Vein, but it's something, and he already has grip on it, so it was easier than having to recall Lost Vein. By using his new Demon Dweller sword, he would continue blocking the attacks as a barrage of attacks continues flying towards Asta. Asta would say he's not going to let Mars get away with this, as he's about to power up and you unlock more of his energy. Before he can though, Asta would quickly grab the blade that's next sent towards him with his bare hands, as Asta's left side would have been unlocked. Asta would unlock his angelic half, which would increase his strength and magical power, as using his right hand, he can easily now handle these attacks single-handedly. While Asta focuses his right side on defending, he would look back to Noel and tell Mimosa that he's got this, as he places his hand over Noel, healing. As Asta uses his energy, he can see the orange light in his eye glow for a split second, as Noel's injuries would almost instantaneously heal as she gasps for air. Good, you're alright, Asta would say, as he's still blocking attacks. Asta would reseal his energy as he then tells Mars he's going down, as Mars throws another extremely fast attack. You know at this point would have broken out, but he doesn't actually have to do anything in order to save Asta, since Asta is easily able to handle Mars in this timeline. Mars would break down from the memories of Fauna as well as everything that he had done to get to this point, as Yuno would watch as Asta casually walks forward and would slash with full strength as he stabs Mars, taking Mars down. As Mars completely knocked out and devastated from the anti-magic that flowed through him, Asta would and Yuno would both have missed a recollection in this. In the original, we would see that Yuno would have met Sylf for the first time, that's the wind spirit, but we didn't get that because Asta was easily able to handle it, so Yuno wasn't desperate enough to where he needed her. And then we also don't learn about Asta's second, well, third sword in this case, the Demon Dweller sword, having the ability to absorb magic and then resend that magic. So that's something that Asta would miss out on as well. Anyway, everyone's alive and Asta and Mimosa would help heal everyone, with both Mimosa and Noel impressed and acknowledging Asta as being so powerful, they couldn't even believe that he was a peasant. It's just not possible that someone from such a lowborn family could have that much power. Asta would then suddenly feel a shaking in the ground, as he would then tell them all that they need to get out of there now. With, in this time, not having to worry about Asta being injured, Asta would insist they take Mars with them, as Asta would pick up Mars and say, let's get out of here. With the entire group now going on to uh, Yuno's wind vessel, they would all then begin to get out of the dungeon as they escape falling rubble, as well as Luck and Klaus would help defend against it, with Asta covering the rear. The Clover Kingdom mages would escape as they successfully get out of the dungeon, which had been causing them so much trouble for this entire day, and they'd finally escaped after collecting some of the treasures as well. With the entire group having made it out of the dungeon, suddenly we would see some of the Diamond Kingdom's knights also come flying out from just before the cavern would collapse. We see Lotus using his smoke magic along with several other Diamond Mage Kingdom knights. In all the shock and confusion with Lotus and then releasing a whole bunch of smoke, they would grab Mars off of Asta's back and run, as Asta realizes with a big blinking sign pointing down on his back with Mars missing that they lost their captive. Ah, damn it, Asta would say as he asks them if he wants them to go after them, with Klaus saying that it should be fine for now, saying that they mostly accomplished their mission here anyway, and then they would head back and report to the king. With the entire group heading back, both Mimosa and Noel would be impressed with Asta even more now after seeing his incredible power. You know, I wouldn't be too shocked after having seen Asta actually go at 100% before, back in Haj Village, and these guys haven't even really seen Asta's full power. 
See, when I said 60% of Asa's power, I meant physical strength. I should probably clarify that, by the way, not magical power. If Asa released around 60% of his actual magical power, a few things would have been different. You guys remember when Meliodas, yeah, Asa's father, had his power re-unlocked? How just that much power actually had the sky grow dark? Asa using 60% of his magic power would probably have caused the entire dungeon to just be completely immersed in darkness. Enough of my blandering so as I can make the power scaling make a bit more sense for anyone who's wondering. Basically, Asta used 60% of his full physical strength, because demons have incredible high physical strength as well, and that's what he had to use to defeat Mars. Enough of that, back to the Clover Kingdom. So, the group would have reported back to Julius, who would have reported to William and Captain Yami for a thanks for a job well done. Julius would invite each group to come to a magical night banquet, where they would then have their classes moved up as well as any stars given to them and things like that. Asa would be excited to go to the capital for such an event, and Yuna would be pretty excited too. When Julius sees Asta again for the first time, he's quite amazed as he's about to say something. In his mind, Julius wants to say that Asta looks so much like his father, but he can't. Asta would be confused as to why the Wizard King's looking at him for so long, before Julius would then snap back to his senses and laugh, touching his head saying it's no big deal, and telling all of them to be on their way. Asta would give Yuno a fist bump as he tells him that was a pretty awesome mission, and tells Yuno to get stronger for the next time. With Yuno nodding, saying he's going to have to figure out what this message in the scroll actually means and what kind of spell it is. Asta and Yuno would part ways, with Mimosa now blushing saying goodbye to Asta. Asa would wave back to Mimosa, and he and Noel, along with Luck, would then head back to the Black Bulls hideout. Alright everybody, welcome back. It's been two weeks, it's been a while, sorry, I've been a bit cut off with some other videos. But, we're back, and with that, we'll be doing a little bit of a recap before we get back into the story. So, let's get into it. Last time, Asta, you know, the Black Bulls members, along with the Golden Dawn, had fought down in the dungeon against some of the Diamond Kingdom's mages, including Mars. Asta actually released a bit of his demonic power, and using his physical strength had pretty much overwhelmed Mars, taking him down even with his multi-types of magic, with Mars having two types and Asta having three types. Now, thanks to their deeds, the Wizard King has invited both the Black Bulls members, including Asta, as well as Yuno and some of the Golden Dawn to go to a rewarding ceremony to give them a thanks for their accomplishments. Let's get into it right now. Asta is ecstatic as he and Noel Silva are now sent to go to the royal capital for the rewarding ceremony, the award ceremony for their accomplishments during their attack on the dungeon between them and the Diamond Kingdom. You know Mimosa and Klaus would also be invited from the Golden Dawn, and thus all of them would be sent to go to the royal capital. Asta would be excited since he hasn't seen much city life before, and going to the royal capital is going to be a bit of a first for him, so he's pretty excited to go and see the sights. With Asta and Noel going together, this would be the point where Noelle's beginning to wonder what this feeling she has for Asta is. It's something that she just can't put her finger on, and every time she gets close to him, she just feels strange. But I'll digress. As Asta and Noelle would then wave to everyone in the Black Bulls hideout, everyone would say goodbye to Asta and Noelle, with the two then heading out. This is where a pretty interesting event occurs, and for any of you shippers out there, this will be something you can think about. In the original timeline, both Asta and Noelle couldn't control, well, Asta not having any magic, and Noelle not having very good control over hers at this point. So Noelle at this time is unable to use a broomstick, and so when she and Asta are about to head out, the following scene would occur. Asta closes his eyes as he focuses on his left half, his half where he channels angelic power. Suddenly a beautiful white wing would burst out of Asta's back, as the long feathers would then explode with a plume, as a bright light would appear, as Asta's left eye would change to a bright orange with a symbol in the middle. He would turn back towards Noelle who would be in awe at looking at this angelic display. Asta would fly up into the air as he then asked Noelle if she's coming with him or not. This would be when Noelle would begin to turn red as she realizes something. And thus we see Asta carrying Noelle as she's forcing his head to look away from her as she's completely beat red. Asta would carry Noelle as he would then fly off towards the royal capital and he would arrive there in around 2 hours with him going around top speed. As Noel and him would finally land, Asta would breathe out a sigh of relief as his wing would then fold back into his back with a bright flash of light with it disappearing, as his eye returns back to its normal green color, just like his father's are. Asta would then turn back as he smiles asking if she's ready to go as he holds his hand out, with Noel beginning to think is he asking if I want to hold his hand. Just as she's about to reach forward to grab his hand, Asta would then turn around and start walking, with Noel getting a bit pissed off at this as she then shoots a ball of water at the back of his head, with Asta turning around and asking what that's all about. Asta and Noel would then have a bit of an argument for a few seconds and a back and forth, 
but eventually Noah would stop, she sighs, and he, she and Asta would then walk into the capital, going through the front gates as they see the huge city spreading out before them. Eventually, after walking for a bit, they'd run into Mimosa and Yuno, and as soon as Mimosa sees Asta, she'd begin to blush too. And this would be when Noel and Mimosa would have their conversation from the original, where Mimosa would tell Noel that she thinks she likes Asta, which would actually cause Noel to feel agitated for some reason. You know and Asta would be pretty excited to see each other again, as you know would give Asta a fist bump, with Asta asking you know if he's ready to get to go to this reward ceremony thing. Klaus would be a bit more resundere in this timeline as he sees Asta and turns away, with Klaus telling Asta that he is actually kind of impressive as he turns away. Asta would rub the back of his head saying thanks and telling Klaus he's not half bad himself. The group would then all head towards the royal castle, as it was almost time for the banquet to begin. As Asta and Noel would arrive into the banquet hall, there would be all these royals from the other groups there, and even some from the Silver Eagles, which Noel would see them as she then narrows her eyes and looks away, feeling embarrassed by seeing her sister and brother, as she doesn't want, really want to see them right now, after she had made a mockery of herself with her magic power back when she was still living with the Silva household. Asta would be excited as he goes into the banquet hall and immediately start plowing his face with food, eating as much as he can, tasting the deliciousness of all these fresh fruits and vegetables, along with this fresh, high-quality meat that's in the royal capital. He never tasted anything like this before, so Asta's pretty happy just chowing down on his food. He'd remember as he would then ask if he can bring some of this home, since he wants to give some and share some with his mom, because he doesn't really know that his mother has actually had royal-quality food before, since she's actually a princess, but anyway... Asta would be thinking about his mother, so that was sweet. Both Noel and Mimosa would blush at this as they think about how kind Asta is. This would be when something would happen that Asta would stop eating for. As we see Noel's sibling beginning to pick on Noel, asking if she's gotten any better for magical power if she's still completely useless. Noel would say nothing, she just looks down, as Asta would see as the royal is about to pour a cup of water on her head. Hey, Asta would say. Suddenly, before anyone could even see what happened, Asta's hand would be gripping the Silver Eagle's wrist as he can't pour the cup over Noelle. Noelle would tell Asta to stop that she deserves it, with Asta telling her to not look down on herself. Asta would look straight into the eyes of this royal, who would now be prepared to fight, as he throws the cup of water away and pulls himself out of Asta's grip, who would let him go. You filthy peasant! How dare you touch me, he would say, disgusted. Solid, no, don't, Noelle would say. That's Noelle's older brother's name, by the way. Not the leader of the Silver Eagles, her younger older brother, if that makes any sense. Anyway, as Sal would prepare a water attack to blast at Asta, a few other royals would join in as well. As Noelle's about to stand up to tell him to stop, Asta would hold his hand telling him that they're nothing, as he walks forward and holds both arms out, telling them to do it. This would be when the royals would begin to step down this peasant, as they attack him all at once. Magical power would ricochet into Asta, who doesn't even try to defend it, as he stands there taking every attack. As the smoke clears, everyone would laugh, thinking that peasant's done, as Asta stands there without a scratch on him. That's your magic? And you call yourself royals? That's weak. Asta would say, his eye would begin to turn to a darker purple, but he would restrain himself as he's holding back his rage, his demonic anger. The room would suddenly begin to feel a bit darker, as one of the captains would actually have to intervene. Asta's pressure is almost equivalent to that of one of the captains, so when, when Flungolion as well as Nozel would step in, Asta wouldn't even hesitate as he looks at the both of them, with the three almost about to fight. Noel would beg Asta to stop as he would then relent, stopping and telling the others not to make fun of your siblings. Also, flaunting your magical power isn't anything. It's worth shit, he would say, as he looks back at the royals before sitting down and beginning to chow down to food again. The room would be filled with tension as everyone's ready to attack Asta, and Asta doesn't even flinch, as he feels no fear from any of them. The only ones here who he knows could actually put a fight up against him, and could maybe win, would be the two captains. Before the other squads are about to jump Asta, suddenly, this would be when the Wizard King would then step in, with him knowing that this was not a good fight to begin with. Since Asta isn't even a peasant, he's actually more royal than any of the other royals here, being an actual prince, but that doesn't matter. He wouldn't tell anyone about that anyways, he then would relieve the tension in the room laughing and saying that it must have gone to some partying in here. Julius would then tell everyone to get ready for the announcement ceremony, and the tension would disappear in the room as everyone began to calm down. Julius would almost be staring at Asta, which would make him a bit uncomfortable, but in Julius's mind he's thinking and comparing of how much Asta looks like Meliodas. It's kind of creepy to be honest. 
You also decide you have to ask Asta how his mother's doing after this whole banquet thing was over, since he hasn't talked to Elizabeth in years. Things would be interrupted though, as a guard would then rush into the room, telling the Wizard King with heavy breaths that the city is under rampage. It's like the citizens have gone mad, there's riots everywhere in the streets. This would be when the sand and the stone user would begin to create the miniature model of the capital and begin to see that there were crowds of magical powers gathered around different sections of the city. There was an attack on the royal capital of the Clover Kingdom. Ulysses would fall into command and lead, as he would begin to tell the captains as well as the other squads there to go to different sections of the city. Asta would be sent with Leo along with Finn Golion, as he'd be sent out with those three to go fight the main force. All the knights would head out to go fight, with Charmy now being in the main chef area just like she was in the original and eating food the whole time. Yino would be sent out along with everyone else as the battle would begin against the undead armies that had invaded the kingdom. Before we get into the battle, we have a small flashback of a few hours ago once Asta had arrived in the kingdom, along with Yuno. The two after they had met up and the groups in the city would have gone and reported to Julius their findings in the dungeon. This would be where Yuno would have shown him the spirit, the different spell he had attained in the kingdom in his grimoire, which was actually Sylph. Julius would know this, but he decided when Yuno can't activate it willingly, that he wouldn't tell him about it yet. Asta would show the Wizard King his grimoire, as well as the sword he had found, but Yulius would be unable to identify it, just like he wouldn't have been able to in the original. Yulius would feel pretty tempted to ask Asta about his parents, but he would hold it off, just like he would feel the same urge again later. This would be when Asta would ask the Wizard King how to become the Wizard King, with his eyes looking rather determined. Ulysses would have a soft smile as he began to explain to them, just as Klaus had interrupted it, beginning to explain how they can become Wizard King, that it's pretty impossible and how you have to be a noble to do it and have grace. This would be when Ulysses would interrupt and begin explaining to both Yuno and Asta, who would be rather curious about this, that it's about results, which would cause Asta and Yuno to light up in hopes that they can achieve this. Ulysses would smile knowing that Asta would become a king someday anyway, and if his goal is to become the Wizard King, then he might have to rule over two countries. He would laugh to himself. Anyhow, after the two had, an had their question answered, Yulis would then have invited them all to go to the ceremony, which this is why they're all there. Back to the present, we see Asta flying down with his wing now out and the two crimson lions impressed with Asta's flight ability, as the three were then heading over to the city area that they were supposed to be at. Now we see him, Raid Spirito, the commander of these corpses, as he's now seeing a little girl in the middle of this entire courtyard. The corpses have already begun ripping through people, as we see Asa heading along with Leo and Fungolion as they are arriving at the actual scene of the Northern District. Asa would see the little girl being attacked by these monsters with no one coming to her aid, as we see Raid's about to run forward and kill her. Suddenly a blitz of light would, and darkness would appear, as the two would flash as Asta would suddenly be holding the little girl far away from the courtyard as he puts her down. The zombies would turn around as they begin to attack Asta, the undead monsters. Asta would simply look at them as he then activates his power releasing it. Suddenly a purple marking began to grow on Asta's face as he unleashes some of his demonic energy. Fungolian would suddenly feel like puking as he and Leo are there and both are shocked at this power, this presence, this pressure, this darkness, it's, it's so intense. Fungolian would be shaking as he doesn't know if he and two other captains could even take down Asta at this point. With a simple swipe of his extended hand and arm, he would slash through all of the zombies, cutting them all in half with just his bare hands. As they all fall to the ground, done. This would be when Raids would summon his strongest zombies to attack Asta. This is when the corpse Jimmy, the one with the ability to shoot bullets out of its hand, would appear it with strong physical powers that punches Asta. Its hand would shatter on Asta's body as Asta blocks the attack with a few scratches on his arm, which would quickly heal from his angelic half. Undead magic, huh? Asta would say. Asta would then quickly unlock his power on his left side as his wing would then appear again with a golden flash on his eye. He would hold out his hands, he would then say one word, one magical spell, Ark. Suddenly, a large magic circle would begin to be cast around the entire royal capital, as Asu would use a lot of his magical power into this attack. I'll neutralize the entire city then, if it's all undead, this shouldn't hurt any people. Ark. Suddenly, Asta would use his angelic magic as a sphere of pure light would surround the entire city and destroy all of the zombies. As all of the undead monsters begin to disintegrate, their souls being released to heaven. 
What is this? He'd be thinking. As Raids watches Asta as he purifies and takes down all of the undead, his magic easily able to counter this dark magic. Before Raids can escape, Asta would simply walk forward with one quick step as he punches him in the gut, knocking him out to the ground. In the bright light, Leo went to notice where his brother, Fungolion, had disappeared to. Before the actual attack had happened, someone would have taken advantage of Asta's attack with the brightness covering and ruining everyone's sense of vision, as Fungolion would have been sucked into the dark portal and would now have been taken away, just like in the original. A big difference in this timeline is that Raids is captured by Asta, and so they actually have one of the members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun in their possession. Luckily, Asta had knocked out Raids in time to the point where he couldn't take away his own life to prevent information from falling to the enemy hands. So that means that Asta had actually captured a key member of the Eye of the Midnight Sun earlier on than they would have usually in the original, meaning they'll have some more information that they can identify using Marx's as memory magic. The raid on the city would have been much less catastrophic since Asta would have used a super tier level spell almost early on. Julius would have been watching the battle and he would have been incredibly impressed with Asta's power. That boy sure is your son, Meliodas. Julius would say with a smile as he remembers his friend. Meanwhile, at the site of the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, we see several members including Sally who are extremely intrigued by Asta, saying that he even captured raids and his powerful magic. Sally would begin drooling as she thinks about experimenting on Asta. His body has so many abilities. Sally would begin giggling with laughter as she's excited to experiment on that kid. Anyhow, the group would begin talking about how they have to rescue raids as well as the other members that had been captured, with Valtos telling them that the boss had actually been injured by Julius, with him actually being able to inflict a wound on him. They're definitely going to destroy that damn kingdom and create a new, better Clover Kingdom. Meanwhile, back at the capital, Julius, the Wizard King, would be almost forced to, in fact, actually upgrade Asta to the next level of Magic Knight. The next time there was an advancement ceremony, Asta would be invited since he had definitely earned an upgrade from his current status. He'd also earned a star for actually saving the capital almost single-handedly with that great spell. Also, many of the royals were incredibly impressed with his magical power, having seen it firsthand how he had taken down so many enemies with a single attack. People would actually begin to respect Asta much quicker, since Asta's power is already much greater than theirs. Yuno wouldn't have even gotten to do much this time, which he was used to at this point with Asta being insane. Yuno would wave as he, Mimosa, and Klaus would be heading back towards the Golden Dawn. With the sun beginning to set, Asta and Yuno would be heading back now too with Charmy in tow. Charmy would now be hitching a ride on Asta along with Noel with Yuno know, shooting a blast of wind towards Asta, and Asta flicking it away with his hand, the two smiling at each other, saying they'll see each other again. Asta would fly off with Charmy and Noel, as the three would then head back towards the Black Bull's hideout. Meanwhile, we see off in a cold, faraway land. We see someone sitting there with a cloak and a hood over their head. Four people are sitting at a table with three of them laughing. Ugh, Dante, I can't wait till we can start our attack on this whole world. We can see as Vanessa is laughing, Zeno would be sitting there silently as he also chuckles at the thought of taking down their other kingdoms. Dante would laugh as he says that they'll have to wait a little bit longer for the attack to strike, as Lucifero has a little bit longer in their plans before they can attack. Why aren't you laughing? Do you not find it amusing too? Dante would say with a bit of chuckle in his voice, taking down these humans, Lord Meliodas. As all three would turn towards him, we see the camera change angle, as we see someone with golden blonde hair and dark green eyes as a smile would appear on his face, a wicked grin. With a purple streak going up his left eye, his eye looking darker, as he unlocks a bit of his demonic power. Oh yeah, I'm ready to take down the kingdoms whenever, Meliodas would say, with a smile on his face. Asta, Noel, and Charmy have now all returned back to the Black Bull's base. As soon as Asta walks into the door, he would actually run into Magna and Luck, who would tell him that they had actually earned a star for their job that they were sent on by Yami. Asta would then smile before he would tell Magna, his senpai, that he had actually leveled up onto the next rank of Magic Knight. Magna would be shocked. Al already? You've only been in the squad for a little bit anyway. Magna would be surprised when Asta and Charmy had both risen in ranks as the Magic Knights. Yami would congratulate his two squad members, as Asta would then begin to explain to Luck and Magna the battle that had happened at the capital. At the end of Asta's explanation, the two senior magic knights would ask Asta both at the same time, what happened to Captain Fungolion? 
Asu would peer downward as he analyzes the stones that were bricklaid inside the Black Bull's base acting as its floor. He would then take a moment to respond as he then would say simply, I don't know. Asu would then have a grimace on his face as the two seniors would be also equally confused. Yami would then come around as he then puts his hand over Asu's head, squeezing it a little bit, as Asu would ask what that's for. Yami would then laugh, saying Fungolian would not die that easily, so they don't really have to worry about him that much. Asu though would still feel guilty as he was the one who saved the city, but he forgot to save the one person right by his side. How can how can he call himself the next wizard king if the person right behind him just gonna go missing right under his watch? He didn't even have any idea what happened. It's like he just vanished. Suddenly a portal would appear as Finral leaps out of it, saying that he needs Asa's help as he bows down on both knees, practically begging him. Whoa, Finral, what what's up? Asa would say. Finral would look up with tears in his eyes saying, Asta, please, please come with me. You see, I I may or may not have scheduled a mixer with these three girls, and the other two guys ditched on me, man. Um, Finral? Y yeah What's a mixer? Asta would say with a question mark practically forming over his head. Finral would fall on the ground as he realized that Asta might be one of the worst people to ask. Luck would then volunteer asking if it's going to be a fight, then he'd want to go too as he starts punching the air. Finro would decide that these two guys are probably his best bet. But then again, pretty much everyone in the Black Bulls is a weirdo, so <sighs> I think these two are the most normal that I can get right now, Finro would say. Asu would ask what he means, before Finro would then cheer up as he makes another portal. Onwards, men! To our date! As Finro would point towards the portal, Asta would say, alright, as Asta, Finro, and Luck would all enter the portal. Noelle would quickly run in behind the portal before it can close, as she would find out where the three of them are going. Luckily, Asta, Finral, and Luck would all be too distracted in order to notice Noelle, as Noelle would decide to follow and spy on Asta for the entire duration of the date. Now at the mixer with Luck and Asta, Finral and the other two would introduce themselves to the girls. It goes about as well as you would expect with people as dense as Luck and Asta, and the girls really aren't that impressed. The three girls introduced themselves, saying that their names were Erica, Ellen, and Rebecca, and that they were all friends. Finral would notice that the girls were not really gaining any interest in any of them, and he was deciding this was going to be a bust. So he would try and ask them about what they did in their free time, their jobs, any hobbies, just keeping the conversation going. The girls would tell them that they'd actually rather hear about them and what they do as magic knights. Which then, Luck and Asu would finally have something to add to the conversation, when they talk about their jobs and fighting, and it gets pretty gory from there as Asta begins talking about how he took down a guy from the Diamond Kingdom with a single slash. Finra would practically be banging his head into the wall at this point as he has no idea what to do about these guys. The girls were obviously trying their best, but they were losing interest rather quickly. Asta and Luck basically just described a battle scene to these three women, and clearly that's not what they were here for. Now I'll be watching, almost cackling with a smile as she watches, glad that no one's trying to steal her Asta. W wait my Asta? Thus, the battle for Noelle within her inner dialogue begin, as she begins having an, her own argument with herself over what Asta is to her. Suddenly we hear a BAHA! As we see a very familiar someone from the Green Mantises telling Noelle, or this waitress girl from his perspective, to get him another drink. Noelle to this would then huff, as she then takes out her wand and points it at him, blasting him with water magic, saying not to order her around. She is royalty after all. Meanwhile, back at the table with Asta, Finra, and Luck, Finra and Luck would have successfully begun to interest the girls with their conversation topics, as Luck and his partner would actually be having a rather good time, and Finra would be doing the same, naturally being a smooth talker. Both Asta and Rebecca would be having a bit of an awkward time, as Asta doesn't really know how to break the ice. He would try to talk to Rebecca, but eventually she just couldn't take any more. She would stand up and say that she's leaving, saying that the other two had practically dragged her there anyway. She had to get back to her siblings. This was when Asta would actually have a pretty good conversation topic, as he talks about his days back in Hodge Village and how he used to play with all the kids back at the church. His best friend in the world, you know, who's practically like a brother to him. This would be when Asta and Rebecca would actually begin to hit it off, as Asta would begin to talk more about his childhood and what it was like living out in the Forsaken Realm. Asta would talk about his mom, Elizabeth, and how beautiful and kind she was, saying how popular she was among the villagers and how everyone would always go to visit her whenever they were ill or sick, especially since his mother was so good at healing magic. Now that Rebecca and Asta were talking, eventually something would occur. 
as a drunken customer would begin to wander over to their table. He began mumbling about how he'd always seen her walking around town for siblings and she was trying to get a <clears throat> man. This guy's wasted us to be thinking. This would give him memories of what he had heard about the stories of Meliodas and Bon, his father's best friend. Elizabeth had told him all about the boar hat, the bar and tavern that his father and her had been in together for some time. Back to reality, Ost would stand up as he sees the man trying to grab Rebecca. Ost would react at almost lightning speeds as he grabs the man's hand before flipping him over the table, crashing it coincidentally into Seke's table who would say, Baha! in fear as the man crashes into his table and actually ruins his own date. Rebecca would take Austin and leave the restaurant, with Noelle quickly changing out of her disguise and then following behind. After they get away from the scene, Rebecca would thank Asta for saving her, and then asks if Asta has anyone that he likes. Suddenly, a warm smile would grace Asta's face, and Noelle's heart would flutter for some reason, but she didn't know why. Asta would then say, with a smile as he closes his eyes, that he does. Rebecca would say that she's rooting for him, but she's not going to give up on him either, with a wink. Now, back at the restaurant, the girls would leave, and they would be leaving Fenrir and Luck alone, pretty much a sign that they weren't that interested, with both of them thinking that the Black Bulls were all weirdos. A few hours would pass, and this would be when Ghosh is deciding to head over to Nairn to visit his little sister, Mary. Anyway, as Ghost would arrive, he'd be heading over to meet her for her birthday after he had finished his mission. When he arrives, he would be shocked and utter horror as he sees Asta playing with Rebecca's siblings as well as Marie. Suddenly, Ghost would send a blast from his mirror magic towards Asta. Quickly, Asta would pull out Lost Vein from his grimoire as he would then use Full Counter on the attack from Ghost, sending it back towards the caster. The ironically reflected attack would hit into Ghosh from his own magic, sending him flying back onto his butt, with him quickly pointing out his finger towards Asta and asking why he was there. Asta replies he smiles, saying he was actually there to play and visit Rebecca's siblings, with Rebecca peeking out the corner of seeing who had arrived, with seeing it was another black bull. Mary would then make a pouting face towards Ghosh and tells him to stop picking on her future husband, Asta. This would cause Ghosh to have a somewhat sudden heart attack, Noelle, who was still following close behind Asta on his tail, would also fall over, realizing that she was going to have Asta stolen from her by a child. St stolen from me? Noelle would begin to blush again, and now enter back into her own self-argument. Later, Sister Theresa would show up to bring Mary back to the church, and Gosha would begin to argue with the old hag. Theresa would sigh, eventually being able to win against Gosha in an argument, and take Marie back with her back towards the church. Rebecca would invite Asta and Gosh to spend the night, and the two would decide to take her up on it, since they could leave tomorrow morning. Later that night at dinner, Asta would compliment Rebecca's cooking, saying it was amazing. Two of Rebecca's younger siblings, Marco and Luca, would then whisper into her ear, telling her that she should really try and go after Asta, asking if he was her boyfriend, causing her to blush. Later that very same night, Gosh would then quickly, on his tippy toes, enter sneakily into the room that Asta was sleeping in. He would then try to use his mirror magic on Asta to try and kill him, saying that he has stolen his sister's heart, and so he'll take his life, with would then be following his weird sister kink that Ghosh has in the anime and manga. As Ghosh releases the attack, Asta would suddenly turn over in his sleep, causing Ghosh to blast a hole through the floor, as Asta would still be snoring. Suddenly, Asta begin to wake up as he feels and can smell the heat from the ray. Asta would pull himself up as he rubs his eyes. He would then ask Ghosh with a yawn why he's attacking him. Ghosh would reply that he will stop Asta from stealing his sister from him, as Ghosh would create two double mirrors and continues to blast attacks towards Asta. Asta would tell Ghosh to not ruin Rebecca's house as he quickly pulls out his blade, the Demon Slayer sword, as he negates Ghosh's magic completely just using his anti-magic, his third level of power. Suddenly, Asta would notice something behind Ghosh. There were small flakes falling from behind the window. Wait, Ghosh, stop! Ghosh would try and send another attack. Asta would then say he's serious. This time he knocks the attack back, this time using anti-magic instead of full counter, as it slams into Ghosh, sending him flying out the window. I'll fix that later, Asta would say, as he would then hop down outside of the window. We see Ghosh lying on his back in the snow on the ground. The two of you looking up would realize that it actually was snowing. At this time of year? What's going on, Asta would be thinking, as he and Ghosh would decide to investigate. Quickly, Rebecca would come out of the house saying she heard a huge crash and she can't find any of her siblings anywhere. She would see Asta and Ghosh on the ground asking if either of them had seen them, with Asta shaking his head saying he hadn't. 
The trio would then decide that there was definitely going on of the snow and that it has to be having some sort of effect somehow. Almost as if though on cue, other doors of houses begin to open as people would begin to wander outside wondering where their children had gone. Noelle would come out of hiding saying she actually saw that all the children had left, almost all at once. It was kind of weird, she would say. Asa would ask why she was actually here, which she would say she was just passing through the area. Asa would question this, but he let it fly for now. Teresa would suddenly show up saying that the snow is a spell, and she can feel trace amounts of mana in it. This spell is having someone control the undeveloped magic within the children, using them like puppets. Teresa would then say that Marie had actually been one of the children to have gone missing, which Gosh would then try to attack Teresa, but Asta would again use full counter on his anti-magic blade, sending it flying back towards Gosh and sending him back into the snow, to which he would begin screaming as Gosh is getting really tired of that move. Asta would then attack as he would then swing the sword down and bash Gosh over the head of it. Gosh falls back to the ground saying, Ah, oh, that really hurts, you know? Asta would tell Gosh to cool it and to remain calm. Suddenly, Gosha remembered that he had actually given Marie a magical mirror that he can use to track. Asta, Gosha, and Theresa would then decide to go and find the kids. Asta would tell Rebecca not to worry and he's going to bring her siblings back for sure. Noelle would say that she would defend the town while they were gone, and Asta would nod, telling her to do her best. Noelle would have a slight blush, but she would nod, saying she will. Asta begins to charge magical energy into his back. Suddenly, a burst of light energy would cause a bright flash in the area, as the reflection off the snow would create almost a sun-like effect. As Asta stands up now, with his wing having now appeared from his angelic half. As Asta floats gently into the air, he would tell them about the contact headquarters, and that something bigger might be going on here. Meanwhile, outside the village, there's a cave on the mountainside. There we see two people. A man with bright white hair, almost like the snow he creates, who's controlling the children, as he begins to talk to them in a creepy tone, saying he's so glad that he has so many new friends. The white-haired man would notice that Marie, her eyes are different. She's obviously not under his magical powers control. Marie herself would know this, but it's because of the mirror that Gosh had given her, that when he had started to use his tracking magic, had freed her from the spell. The man would then tell Marie that if she wants to be friends with him, then she needs to go back under his control so they can be friends again. Marie would then reply with a pouting face that that's not what a friend is. The guy would then hit Marie over the face as she falls to the ground with a bit of tears in her eyes. Nij, the guy with the white hair, Nij's brother, Baro, would then punch Nij, telling him to not hit the goods. The brothers would then look at the kids saying that they can make a whole lot of money from their mana. First off though, let's get rid of the ones without any mana potential as they would notice a boy named Macro, and throw him out of the cave for having low mana. The brothers would then begin work to extract the mana from the children. Gojin's sister Theresa would be on broomstick while Asa would be flying through the air, as his wing feels cold from the night breeze and the snow. Gosh would say that they're there, as the three would then land outside the cave, where the mirror said that the tracking point last was located with Marie. Asa would notice several children had been thrown outside the cave, outside on the ground, with their face in the snow. Asa would then tell Gosh to head down to the cave, while he and sister Theresa can take these kids back to the village so they can be safe. Gosh would say he's only going to help Marie, and if Asa wants to help the other kids, that's up to him. Theresa and Asa begin to use their respective healing magics, while we see Theresa beginning to use fire magic to warm the children up, and Asa would create a healing light using his angelic half. Asa would tell the little kids to wait out here while he goes and takes care of the bad guys, and to also get the rest of the kids. The kids would be unresponsive for some reason, and Asa would then realize that they're all still under the spell, as Asa would then decide to use his anti-magic. Gather them all around here, as they would then pile the kids in a circle. Asa would take his right hand as he then places it over each of their chests. Asa would close his eyes as he feels tendrils of dark energy wrapping around him. The symbol on his forehead that every demon prince can acquire when they're about to go into assault mode would suddenly flicker for a second, before dark red energy would then come pouring out instead of the usual dark purple that the demon race is known for. This anti-magical energy would cover the kids, as Asta would easily negate the spell. Suddenly they would all snap out of it, asking what's going on, with Asta then repeating his question, telling them all to stay out here while he goes and saves the rest of the kids. They'd nod and say they'll stay with Sister Theresa as Asa would begin to enter the cave. The brothers would be laughing, having extracted so much mana from just a few kids. It would be Marie's turn next, but Gosh would arrive just in time, as Gosh sees Marie bruised and battered from their attacks after she had been awoken from the spell. Gosh and Arage would attack the two brothers. Nia would be ordered to stop Gosh, and 
Nij is unable to do anything, as Gosha's rage is easily blasting through all the snowmen that, that are being controlled to attack Gosh. Gosh is just blasting through them easily. The brothers would be wondering how much power Gosh has as he sees them in his rage state. Suddenly, even Gosh could feel this, as the two brothers would fall to their knees, almost like gravity just got heavier in the room. The air itself felt like their lungs were sinking in their chests, as every step felt like a pounding of an elephant. We hear it. Step. The cave rumbles. Step. It shakes like an earthquake from a mad god. As Asta gently walked into the cave, it would appear like the calm before the storm, as suddenly Asta's right eye would begin to turn into a dark purple. This energy began to sink through the entire air, making the entire cave feel like a dark abyss, even darker than it used to be before. As I've already mentioned, people in Black Clover cannot sense the same magical energy since it's on a different frequency that people from the Seven Deadly Sins world has. So when Asta is powering up his magical power, and he actually releases some of his demonic energy, which boosts him a lot, they just see that he has no mana, since he still only has anti-mana in this world, from this world's frequency of magic. The two would begin to nervously sweat as they laugh, saying that Asa is probably just a weakling who's there to try and do his best against them, saying his mana level is pathetic, it's like it doesn't even exist. While Goja is still just ripping through snowmen, the two brothers would decide to gang up on Asa, thinking that he must be easy prey. Asa begins to fold his wing back into his back, as the bright light would then disappear as he allows the darkness to continue to take over his right half of his body. Sister Theresa would become walking into the cave, saying that the kids were alright outside and she told them to wait there, leaving some fire magic with them. She wanted to come and assist Gosh and Asta. As Theresa would walk in, sensing that some of the kids' mana had been taken from them, she would say this aloud, letting Asta know. Suddenly, Asta's face would tense up as his muscles would tighten, revealing his strength. Asta would simply say one word to Baro, and Nij, kneel. The two brothers would be shocked as Asta says this, his face barely holding back the rage that he feels. The dark marking on his forehead beginning to become more and more apparent as its opacity becomes less and less thin. Asta's darkness would begin to grow as he holds out his hand saying, You have ten seconds to kneel. If you two aren't kneeling before me in that time, you die. Suddenly, Gosh would scream out as he attacks, trying to kill the two brothers. But before they can do so, Asta would look at Gosh as he suddenly swings Lost Fane almost out of nowhere. A wave of anti magic would come flooding out as it blocks Gosh's attack. Five, four, three, two. On the number count of three, the brothers had then sent a contact to someone to come save them, as the two would then dive on their knees before Asta. Asta would take his foot and place it on one of their heads, smushing it into the ground, saying, That's the attitude I'm looking for. Now, how do you reverse what you did to these children? Nija begin to mumble as he says they just wanted some friends, as he asks his brother what should they do. Suddenly, Sally would appear. Sally would begin cackling and laughing, as Asta's eyes would look up. Asta would tell his sister Theresa and Gosh to get back, saying he'll take care of this one as Asta pulls out his other blade, now dual-wielding Lost Vane as well as the Demon Slayer sword. Sally would rush forward with an attack to swipe at Asta, who would lift his foot off as he jumps up and high into the air. The two brothers would scoop backwards quickly, as suddenly a bright light would appear in the cave. Light magic, Asta would think. Suddenly a beam of light would hit Gosh as he falls to the ground, with Marie screaming out for him. Asta would look up as he realizes he's going to have to fight all four of these guys at the same time. Can I... Can I win? Asta would say. This power. Asta would laugh as he begins to smile, his teeth now moving together as he pressurizes them, feeling his jaw tighten. Asta's eyes would lock with that of the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun. So a four-leaf clover grimoire, just like you know, huh? Asta would say. Well, I've kicked you know's ass plenty of times, so I don't think this will be too challenging after all, Asta would say. Oh, and by the way, Asta would say, his eyes now narrowing, as he begins to smile even brighter, I can use light magic too. Asta would access both sides of his power as he evenly distributes his magic, Licht being kind of shocked as he watches this. Suddenly, a dark wing from the energy of the demon race and the light bright white energy that of the angels would come together in perfect harmony, as Asta for the first time in what has been years would decide to go at 100% of his capabilities. It's time to push my limits, Asta would say as he braces himself, gripping both the demon destroyer and lost vein. Anti-magic. 
Suddenly, red and dark energy begin to cover the swords. Goddess magic. The wing in Asta's left side would begin to appear, as Asta's angelic half would begin to glow. His left eye began to turn into a bright light, orange with the same symbol that his mother has, the symbol of the goddess race. And his right side, darkness, the power of the demons. This, leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun, is my assault mode. Asta peers upwards towards Licht, half his body covered in light, a cloak of light surrounding him, and the other half covered in darkness. Two wings, one of dark and one of light, cover his back, as the symbol on Asta's head would be finally complete, the crowning symbol of a demon prince, half of it being covered in dark energy, and the other half practically glowing with light magic. The two opponents' eyes would meet as the battle would begin. Valtos, Licht would say. Immediately, Vons would use his teleportation magic, where he creates those dark portals and can shoot curse-like beams, as he would then attack Asta, giving Licht enough time to charge some light attacks, as he begins sending blasts of incredibly fast beams of light towards Asta. With both Licht and Valtos tag-teaming against Asta, it wouldn't even be a fair fight. That is, for them. As Asta would then use full counter on all the attacks coming at him. As they were moving faster, faster than a normal human could see. But Asta is no human. Asta's demonic and angelic eye could see everything, as they would see the beams of magic coming towards him slowly, almost as if time was slowing down. As Asta would then pull up his lost vein blade, slashing at the beam of light, as well as all the other attacks flying at him. Fu counter. Suddenly, the beams would then get sent flying back, as the magic would counter the magic, sending them flying back towards Lick and Valtos, who would have to use magic again to block or counter, or they'd even take a hit, with Valtos getting hit by one of Lick's light attacks. Lick would be shocked, asking, v Valtos, are you alright? Valtos would grimace, saying he's fine, and then this would be when Lick would use his light magic to heal his leg. You think you can heal right in front of me, Asta would say? Too slow. Lick would suddenly turn around just in time, as Asta would have retrieved another blade from his five-leaf grimoire, this time the Demon Dweller's sword. Asta would go for a piercing attack, covering with anti-magic, and then covering over the anti-magic with dark magic, using 1,000 divine cuts as a dark hellfire flame would cover the anti-magic, as he prods, spearing it directly towards Lick's chest. Valtus would jump in front of the way using his teleportation magic, blocking the blow and sending it flying to the side of the cave, causing the entire area to begin to rumble as the dark flames would begin to spread. Lick would create whips of light as he begins attacking Asta, aiming towards his dark side hoping to counter his dark magic. What he doesn't understand is that Asta is no ordinary dark magic user, he has dark demonic magic, as his power is easily able to overwhelm Lick. For some reference on how powerful Asta is currently at this moment, if you guys remember how strong Meliodas was against Escanor, and Asta's power is pretty close to that amount of strength. So Asta's assault mode, which is imperfected and hasn't been trained, is already almost as strong as Meliodas' full power assault mode when he's fighting Escanor back during the Seven Deadly Sins. Anyway, back to the main fight itself, Lick would be getting worried, knowing that even though he is loved by the mana, his seemingly infinite amounts of magic would still seem to be coming up short against Asta's pure power. Asta's physical speed and strength alone would be enough to overwhelm Lick. However, Asta's newfound power would be a double-edged sword. As you remember how Meliodas, one of the most powerful demon princes, who had been one of the generals of the demon king for a long period of time, would lose control of himself while accessing his assault mode. And unlike Meliodas, who had only darkness to worry about taming, Asta has three aspects of his magic in order to worry about. So Asta's mind would slowly be able to be losing control of his magic, as Asta would slowly begin to lose his consciousness, beginning to fall into an almost beast-like state using his magic and just ripping up the terrain. At this point, Licht would be bloody and beaten, and Valtus would now be trying to escape. As Valtus and Licht barely are able to leave in time, with Asa shooting a powerful beam of darkness and light energy towards them just as they're leaving, ripping up the entire land, almost creating a canyon, a valley, behind where they had just been. Asta would now be in an enraged state, as Yami would arrive. The moment Yami steps out of the portal, he would not sense any magic power, but he would feel an intense pressure. All of his key, all of his bodily senses were telling him one thing, to run. 
Yami would wonder where this guy was that Asta was fighting before he realizes that he ran away. Seeing Asta now, with drool now coming from his teeth, as he has teeth and now elongated into almost fangs on half of his face. And now each time his body was contorting, as the light and dark energy were now beginning to expand. Now, with Asta heading closer and closer towards 100% of his power, Yami would have to shut down Asta, as he would need Finral's help. Asta would turn around, his golden eye locking with Yami's, as his pupils would then thin towards Yami. He'd be mumbling as he says, Die. He turns around with a slash, ripping through the air, cutting with lost vein. In this mad-like state, it was much easier for Yami to read his moves, but that doesn't mean that he could physically keep up with them. As he dodges out of the way just in time, the slash would cut another slice through the earth, as the clouds above would actually have been cut in half from the strike. I can't get hit once by that attack, Yami would be thinking. If I get one touch off of him, then I might die. Yami would laugh, saying this is going to be a challenge. Yami would then tell Asta, I guess you're trying to get into a rebellious phase now, huh? Well, I guess it's time for me to act like a captain. I'm going to show you the power of a true magic knight captain, Yami would say. Yami would reveal his katana, his blade now shining in the moonlight, and his stars would be twinkling overhead. Asta's power would be creating a pressure, almost like increasing the gravity around the entire area. Asta would suddenly hold up his left hand as he would use arc. Suddenly a blast of light magic would attack Yami, as Yami would quickly use dark, lightless slash, cutting the light magic, defending himself against it. <sighs> Asta would now begin to growl, as he rushed towards Yami in his beast-like state, with assault mode having taken over his mind now. Yami would charge forward to charging dark magic into his blade and using reinforcement magic as he locks blows of Asta, feeling his arms go numb. Thousands of miles away from the Clover Kingdom, we would see a man of golden hair and a purple mark of the Demon King over his head, smiling and laughing, with Dante as well as the other dark triad turning towards their lord Meliodas, asking what's wrong. Melodos would say nothing that he's just amused right now, as Melodos could sense the demonic energy flooding over the Clover Kingdom. Yami and Asta be fighting until dawn, with Yami barely able to keep up using Ki and Asta now beginning to slowly slow down, wearing through his stamina as he's throwing full power attacks at every chance he can get, having already destroyed the entire mountainside making it look like a crater had hit there from a meteor. Yami had gashes and burns all over his body from the light and dark magic, and as Asta was about to throw the final blow, cutting down with his sword on Yami, Yami would not have time to defend as he holds up the katana with the last of his strength, before Asta closes his eyes and pass out to the ground, his hair color returning back to normal as his eyes would recede back to their normal green color, as he falls to the ground unconscious. Yami would fall to his knees, gasping and breathing heavily, as he had never had such a battle that had lasted so long, that had been so hard fought, and he hadn't even won. If he had been fighting that guy from earlier, I... I might have lost, Yami would say. As Asta would now be unconscious, Yami would then tell Fenrir after recovering a bit, saying that Asta must be unable to use 100% of his power without going insane like that. Yami would then chuckle, saying he guesses Asta is still kind of a weirdo, just like the rest of the Black Bulls. Asta had been taken to the royal capital where Marks had been healing him, as Yami as well as Fenrir would be waiting, also getting treated with Thinral having gone there as soon as he could using his magic after having evacuated all the children and citizens that had been sitting near the cave where the battle between Yami, Asta, and Asta vs. Licht had been. Speaking of which, actually, Licht would be in bad shape, as he would already be getting healing treated from the other members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Who could have, who could have damaged Licht so much? He could have died, they'd all be thinking, worrying about their leader. Licht would be saying that this is why they can't trust the Clover Kingdom. They never could and they'll never forgive them. We're going to destroy that kingdom and rebuild our own, he would say. With the other members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun all agreeing and nodding, saying that they need to figure out who had done this, asking if the Wizard King had happened to be where he had been attacking. Licked would laugh, saying no, that it was just some brat. So, a kid? A kid did this much to you, Licked? That's no ordinary kid. He has... He would begin explaining about the five-leaf clover grimoire, as well as this strange power he has. His magic must have been insane. It was so high I couldn't even feel it, he would say. But it was like this pressure was covering my entire body. The entire cave felt dark. I couldn't even penetrate that darkness of my light magic, he'd say, looking down at his shaking hands. It reminded me of that day. We would see burning, as we see 
a demon. Meanwhile, back at the Clover Capital, Asu would be getting healed by Marx, as I'd said earlier, as well as his memories would be getting read. Everything would be going smoothly as the fight with Lux was about to start, before suddenly the memory would begin to start turning in a weird way, as half of the vision would begin to turn bright white and the other half pitch dark, as the memory would then slowly fade out from both colors, just returning to a blank red. That's weird, Marx would say. He actually lost consciousness while fighting. He would then explain to Yami what happened, saying that Asa's memories cut off just before his actual fight, but he could tell that Licht had been using light magic on Ghosh and the others who had been in the cave, saying that whoever this Licht guy was as he had introduced himself, he was incredibly strong and he was also probably the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun. If Yami hadn't gotten there, Asa would still probably have been rampaging and destroying towns, which would have been really bad for the reputation of the knights with well, I guess the Black Bull's reputation already being that bad, Marx would say, chuckling. Yami would laugh as well, saying they are the misfits of the Magic Knights, after all. As you look over to Asta, still passed out. I'll tell you though, Marx, his power was insane. If he can actually get a handle on that, he might actually be able to become the Wizard King. Not just that too, Yami would say, but his healing, it's ridiculous. Yami would have a quick memory of when he had used his dark lightless slash on the angelic side of Asa's body as he had cut his arm off. Yami would be worried as he had said whoops and immediately after he would say that suddenly a dark energy would begin pulsating over the arm and it would return back connecting itself back to Asa's body before it began healing itself with light recovery magic. Gee that's creepy Yami would say before we now are back to the present. Yami would say that Asa is all healed up and patched up, so they're going to head back to the Black Bull's base. If Julius has anything he needs from us, then tell him to send word. Also, feel free to tell Julius everything that happened with the battle against the Eye of the Midnight Sun. I'm thinking that guy might have left a trap for Fringoleon. There's no way that the King of Prepstuck noses like him would get caught by someone as weak as this guy. Especially if a rookie magic knight like Asta could beat him, Yami would say laughing. Marx would nod, agreeing, saying that he probably was the one to take down from Golion, as he would then let Julius know. Yami would nod as Finral himself, Ghosh, and everyone who had been at the Black Bulls, including Noel, who had been incredibly worried about Asta after hearing about his condition, would head back to the base. A few days later, we would see the entire Black Bulls group having fun at Rack on the beach, with Asta and his swim trunks running across the beach and swinging the seashore, with Noel walking out and asking Asta w -w -w what he thinks about her swimsuit. Asta would be seemingly oblivious as he's laughing, saying that this is really fun, swimming through the water and moving at breakneck speeds, with Fenrir relaxing on the beach and trying to pick up girls, and the rest of the Black Bulls members all doing their own thing. Noah would blast water at Asa, telling him that he's stupid sta. A while later, Yami would finally arrive, reminding the rest of the members that they're actually there on a mission that had been shortly assigned to them after the attack that the Mid Eye of the Midnight Sun had done earlier to those kids in Narn. Yami would bury Asta, Noel, and the other members in the sand up to their head, as they would all apologize to the captain, with Yami laughing, telling Noel about the plan, that she's the only one who can actually get them to the temple. Noel would gulp asking what he means before he would explain that he had learned that the temple is actually at the very bottom of the sea through a strong mana zone. And not all of us are crazy monsters who can hold our breath for hours at a time as she then punch Asta in the head as Asta would say, Hey, what was that for, Captain? With now Asta pounding a bit. Noel would hold back a giggle before she then remembers that she actually has to be the one to save them and that she's going to have to surpass her limits in order to get them all to the temple. Later that night, Noelle would be training. She's using her water magic and trying her best controlling it, trying to create the sea dragon's nest. She's trying to work on forming the ball of water that can protect them as they go underneath the sea. Later that night, while she is controlling it and thinking about how she has to get better, she would hear a noise and that's when she would find Asta training and running around. She would then talk to Asta asking if he'd be willing to train with her and Asta would agree. And so they decide to help each other out. Eventually, while they were training, Asa would notice that someone would be singing, and both he and Noel would then find someone, which would be this girl just singing on top of a rock into the moonlight. The girl would then notice Asta and Noel, and would introduce herself. Noel would then both introduce herself and Asta before asking Kahono, who is the girl, as she had introduced herself as. Kahono would then reply to her that she's practicing her singing and that she had actually wanted to be an idol. She noticed that Asta is injured and would heal him with some of her song magic. She would then ask if the two of them would be interested in being their friends, so the three of them would then become friends with them agreeing. Kohono would then tell Noelle to not suppress her magic too much, 
or she'll lose control of it. Kano tells her that using a good memory to obtain a peace of mind works best, but Noelle can only really think about how her family looks down on her and her failures from the past. Noelle will continue training as helped by both Asta and Kahono, with Asta being a good training partner and Kahono just being good at teaching and explaining how to control magic more efficiently. This will continue for the next few days, and it eventually become the night of the full moon. Noelle has not been able to completely gain control over her power, and Asta would then tell her as he grabs her shoulders, telling her to stop thinking and just use all of her mana. Noel tells him that she's worried, looking down at the ground, that she's hoping, but she doesn't think it's going to go right. Asa would say that he will, and that if anything goes wrong, then he'll just stop her and save all of them going back to the surface. Noel would agree as she would then release all of her mana, and is going to fall unconscious when she would hear the Black Bulls cheering her on. Noel would think of how the Black Bulls had taken her in, acknowledged her, and were supporting her from the very beginning, trying to push her beyond her limits. And as she does so, she would then finally gain control of her sea dragon's cradle. I- I'm doing it, Noel be thinking. As she would then suddenly, in her excitement, release the control of the spell, and she would then fall out of the water bubble, directly down as Asta would catch her. She would then blush as he tells her to him to put her down as Asta would do so, then grabbing the behind of his head and saying that Noel did a really good job, saying that now they can actually get to the temple and find that stone that they were looking for. Noel would then look around for Kahono, but she was gone. And she would then think, as we see Kahono walking away, that she's looking forward to meeting Noel down at the temple below. As both Noel and Asa would gather the rest of the Black Bulls, the entire team would then head down into the ocean, with Noel creating the spell. After a while, the group would eventually make it to the Great Magic Zone, underneath the sea. With both Yami and Asa cheering her on, Noel would be able to somehow get through the rough currents and finally see something beautiful, as they see the temple about to approach them. Suddenly, a whirlpool of mana would come swirling towards them, as Yami would pick up and throw Asa at it, who would destroy the whirlpool using full counter on the magic, as it gets sent flying back into the ocean. As the entire group then lands into the seabed temple, the Black Bulls would then look around at this ancient civilization, as they begin their search to try and find the magic stone that Julius had sent them to look for. Last time, Asta and the Black Bulls had finally made it into the Undersea Temple, and they were now looking for the magic stone that the Eye of the Midnight Sun was after, that the Wizard King had sent them to retrieve. Let's get into it, right now. Seemingly just as the Black Bulls arrive into the temple itself, people would suddenly come out from the inside of the buildings as there'd be a lot of people. There's a whole civilization down here, they'd be thinking, as the Black Bulls would be shocked not having thought that there'd be anyone down here. Yami would ask in a loud voice and an angry tone, asking where their boss is, with one of the villagers yelling out that he's looking for the High Priest. The villagers would take the Black Bulls to the High Priest, who would then greet them. As the group enters the temple, suddenly a large goldfish would come swimming out and almost barrel into them, as both Magna and Luck would easily dispatch it, using their magic and seemingly taking out the goldfish as it just disappears. This would be when an old man would walk out laughing as he has a cane. This old man would be the high priest who would use his game magic to test to see how strong they were with that. He would have told them that he already knows why they're there, but they're going to have to do a little something if they want to attain it, saying that they're going to play a little game with him. The Black Bulls would be a bit reluctant to agree, but eventually with some persuasion and convincing from the high priest, he would manage to do so, as all the Black Bulls would be then be split up aside from Yami and sent throughout the temple, as the game would begin. Yami would ask why he wasn't sent along with them. The High Priest would tell Yami that he's too strong and that it wouldn't make the game any fun, or even interesting at all. He tells him as he pats Asta on the couch to come watch the games with him, and Yami would reluctantly agree, as he smirks thinking Asta's gonna wipe the floor of this guy's games, since Asta, unknown to this guy, is also at the level of a Magic Knight Captain. Asta, Magna, Luck, and Ghosh would have been sent together, as they were all now in a corridor down inside the temple. Asta's group would then encounter some of the priests, specifically the Hammerhead Shark Priest, as they would then tell them that they're going to wipe the floor of them. And you guys have to remember that the people in Black Clover cannot sense the same magic frequency that Asta uses, meaning that Asta looks like he has almost no magic power, if any at all. The priest would target Asta, thinking he him as the weakest link, and Luck would try to get into the fight, but Magna would grab him from behind and pull him back by his cloak, telling him to stay back for this one. The moment that the priest left forward, Asta would slash his blade, as all the priests in the entire room would go down in a mere instant. What? The old man would say, shocked with Yami laughing his ass off now. 
Yami will be slapping his knees, he thinks that's hilarious. Seeing this head priest bravado go out the window almost immediately as the game starts. Uh, Asubi confused, he sees them all laying on the ground. What do we do now? Luck would be pretty ticked off telling Asa that he has to fight him now, since Luck was expecting a fight and you can't take them all out in one blow like that. How else am I supposed to have any fun? Luck would say, as he kicks and punches in the air. Magna would let go of Luck and immediately he would burst like a strip of lightning towards Asta. Asta would simply hold up his hands as Luck would be belting at him with his fist and Asta would just take every hit with him receiving minor injuries and scratches. I'm just glad Marie wasn't there to see that, Ghosh would say. Otherwise, she might like Asta more. My Marie! Ghosh would be upset as he thinks more about Marie, but everyone else would be pretty much meh. Magna would be the one who cared the least, saying less work for him the better. Asta and the rest of the group would move on, almost instantly from when they started, which would cause the head priest to be pretty annoyed now. Ooh, that short little... Mm. He's laughing. He would look over at Yami, his eyes narrowing. This kid has no magic power at all. How did he... How do you take them out so fast? He moved faster than even my game magic could keep up with. I didn't even see the attack. He'd be really annoyed as he's now stomping his foot on the ground, with some of the other priests now around him trying to console him, as he says that they haven't met the grand priests yet. Asta's group would decide to split up down different pathways, seeing as Asta could handle himself fine. Luck and Magnum would go together, and Ghosh said he'd rather go on his own, to be honest. And so the group would split up, with Asta running into a priest pretty quickly. This being Kayato. Kayato, the swordfish priest. As he began to pull out a large blade, he would tell Asta that he won't go easy on him, saying that his dream is to become a famous idol dancer, and that in order for him to accomplish his dream, he needs to be able to go to the Clover Kingdom. And the high priest said that if any priest can win one of the battles in the games, then we'll be allowed to go to the surface, Kayato would say. Kaito would charge towards Asta, and as Asta would open his eyes. Asta would have many things in his mind, as he thinks of what his dream is. Asta would say that he wants to become the Wizard King. I want my mom to be happy. I want... I want dad to come home, Asta would say. Asta would move forward in a blink of an eye, and with a singular slash, Kaito would have been put down to the ground just like the other priests. As Asta would continue moving forward, Asta's dreams and hopes pushing him along the way, along with his friends. As Asta moves down towards the center of the sea temple. He beat him that easily? The high priest would be thinking. Kaito's movements are practically impossible to read. He struck so swiftly he had no time to dodge. The high priest would point out and say out loud that that's cheating. As Yami would laugh saying that he was the one who decided to keep him here instead of Asta. What do you mean? Yami would then hold his hand over his face saying. If that kid was really serious against me in a fight, he'd look over to the high priest. I don't know if even I could win, Yami would say. Meanwhile, Noel would run into the dolphin priest, aka Kohono, the sister of Kayato. As Noel would be shocked seeing the girl who had helped her train with her magic up on the surface down here, she'd realize what was going on. You... you set us up? Noel would say. So you used us. Kona would try and assure Noel, saying that she still was her friend, but she definitely also wanted to bring people down here in order to play the game, telling her also about the deal with the head priest about her and her brother, and her dream in order to become an idol and sing on the surface. And then she'd begin to attack. She used her singing magic to try and cause Noel to fall asleep, ending the fight. Before she can finish the spell, Noel would cast a defensive barrier of water, defending herself from the attack. Using her song magic, we would then see Kohono then attack the water barrier Noelle makes, shattering her defenses, as Noelle's battle would begin. Kohono would ask Noelle why she was holding back, asking why she doesn't attack her. Noelle would say it's because she doesn't have full control over her magic. I can barely create defense spells, she'd be thinking. But she can't let her know that. Kohono would tell Noelle that she thinks that Noelle could attack, but instead she's afraid of hurting people, that's why she can't control her mana. Noel would be shocked at this thought, thinking there's there's no way that's true, right? Elsewhere, Luck and Magna would be fighting the High Priest's son, one of the Grand Priests, as we see him battling using his Sea Water God hammer against them. Luck and Magna would be having a bit of a tough time, with his magic power being pretty high, and the two would be having a pretty even match together against him. Suddenly, we would hear a crash as the Sea Temple would begin to shake. What is that? 
Asu would look up, sensing something. Suddenly, a tsunami of mana would come crashing through the sea temple as it rips through the wall and enters into the game magic's territory, crushing the high priest's son, Geo, under its weight. Geo would try using his sea god water hammer magic as he continues bashing the target, but it's not doing anything. This is... Luck would be excited and also sweating, as the person in front of them has even more magic power than Yami. Yes, that's right. The Eye of the Midnight Sun has finally arrived. That being Veto and three other members from the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Back up at the beach, we can see Seke shocked and fears he's hiding behind a tree. On the ground sprout in front of him would be 50 magic knights that Veto and the Eye of the Midnight Sun's group had completely taken down single-handedly before they entered and down to the waters to enter the temple. Veto using his beast magic would easily take out the high priest along with Magna and Luck, sending them crashing against the seabed wall as dust would now fill throughout the temple. The high priest would be shocked, his son defeated by this monster. He's never seen someone so powerful. Who is that? He'd ask Yami. Yami would explain that they're probably members of a terrorist organization called the Eye of the Midnight Sun, and they need to get out of there now. I need to go help my team. Let me out of here, Yami would say. We we can't leave, he'd say. The game magic doesn't end until the game's over, he would explain. Yami would try to leave anyway, simply trying to break out his magic, since his magic power, as the priest had said, was stronger than his. As Yami tries to break out, he realizes that there was a second magic holding him there. Someone from the Eye of the Midnight Sun must have identified his location through his magic power and created some sort of seal around them. It was a different dimension sphere, a seal that held them inside of a different dimension. Can I still contact them from in here, he would say? Yami would ask. Y yes the High Priest would say. Yami would then inform all the Black Bulls telling them they need to suppress their limits if they're going to beat these guys, saying that the Eye of the Midnight Sun has entered the temple, and to do their best. All the Black Bulls would nod, agreeing to Yami's condition, saying they're going to kick their ass and get them the hell out of the Sea Temple. Yami would smirk, saying that's his team, as everyone would get moving. The High Priest would change the rules of the game, telling everyone that the game rules are now, that in order to get out, they need to defeat the members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Everyone would nod, as those still capable of fighting would then head towards the new threat. Luck and Magna would pull themselves up, just as Veto was about to look for new prey. Veto would turn around, smirking, saying he'll give them despair. The two would smirk, wiping blood from their faces, saying it's going to take a lot more than that to take them down for good. As the three begin to fight, Asu would be running, as he actually rips holes in the ground from his feet hitting them through his shoes. As he's running at such fast speeds, he'd be running towards Luck and Magna's location where they're fighting Veto. As the two are now almost out of their magic power, they shoot one composite attack, combining both their magic power of lightning and fire. As the two combine into one massive attack towards Veto, Veto using his pure beast-like strength will rip through it, defeating Luck and Magna. As he says, all they will feel is despair. The two would be embarrassed, saying they can't face Asta like this. And just as they're about to fall to the ground and die underneath his foot, suddenly a wave of wind would come streaking into the room, as Veto gets pushed back, falling over as he asks, what's that? Asta would come charging into the room as he grabs Luck and Magna, and then jumps back, pulling them out of harm's way. Are you two okay? Asta would say. Yeah, we're <laughs> fine, Magna would say. We're out of magic power, though, Luck would say. We're sorry, we're such useless teachers, they'd say, as the two would pass out. Asta would now harden his eyes, saying that they did fine, holding him off until he got there. No one's hurt, right? G would still be unconscious on the ground, as Veto was already beginning to recover from that blast of wind that Asta projected when he got into the room. Y you Veto would say. Veto would recognize Asta as the person who had almost killed Licht. He was hurt because of you. I'll like inflict ten times the despair on you, he would say, as his muscle began rippling. Asu would not be impressed as he begins walking forward saying, come on big guy, let's do this. Veto would move forward so fast Asta wouldn't be able to react, shocked, as Veto would grab Asta's right arm and rip it off of his body. Everyone would be shocked watching Asta get disarmed. As Asta would look back to, now Veto, about to destroy and crush his arm under his hand. Asta would quickly react as he begins to pulse dark energy through his body. Suddenly, Veto would be shocked, as Asta's arm would suddenly have a small connection of darkness, a straight line to his arm, back to his body, as Veto would feel a strong pull. Suddenly, Asta's arm would get ripped out of Veto's hand as it reconnects itself to Asta's body. 
Asu would scream as he charges up, his demonic symbol now appearing on his forehead, as his armor then completely reattaches his body, healing himself. You're an annoying one to kill, Vito would say. Asu would say he was surprised, but his physical strength won't be something he can't overturn. Asu would say he's pretty strong too, after all. As Asu leaps forward, now powering up to around 20% of his physical strength, Asu would punch Veto in the chest, leaving a huge indent in his body. <clears throat> Veto would cough up blood as he then bulges his muscles out and pushes the indent out of his body, sending Asu's fist back. As Asu would now grip palms directly with Veto, the two's muscles now shaking as they begin to buff up on each side. Damn it! I need more power! Asu begin to increase his physical strength. As you could see his muscles now bulging, as he would then send dark magic through his body. Asu would use more demonic power as he reaches 50, 60, 70% of his physical strength. Suddenly, Veto's knees would buckle as he falls to Asu's pure physical might. Damn it! He just keeps getting stronger! I had to use more beast magic, but I'm going to burn through my magic power! No. He would see an image of Licht in his mind. For Licht's sake, I'll give you despair! Licht using his beast magic would push all of his weight down on Asta, as Asta could feel his arms beginning to creak. Damn it! I can't! Asta would think about the last time he accessed 100%. And Yami's not here this time, if- And there, he would see the t unconscious bodies of his friends. If I- If I did that now, I don't know if I could contain myself! I'm going to have to! Asta would tap into his other power, his third power, anti-magic. As Asta would begin screaming out, Hyah! Asu began charging magic, well, anti-magic, into Veto's body. D Damn it! Veto would feel his arms getting weaker, as the physical magic enhancement he'd been using on them was beginning to disappear. Get away! He'd pull one of his arms back as he slaps Asta, sending him flying across the room as he then lands on the floor, crashing into and leaving a crater. Asta would pull himself up, regenerating, as he then activates his angelic half, a wing sprouting. Asta would flap into the air, as his other eye turns gold the symbol of the goddess race. He'd point his hand down towards his friends, as he would then use Ark, protecting them with a shield. There. Now, if I go 100%, I shouldn't have to- Suddenly, Veto would come flying around, grabbing Asta by his wing, and spinning him around before throwing him against the wall. Asta would crash, now knocking the air out of him, as he falls to the ground, falling out of his angelic form. Asta would be almost unconscious from that blow, as he would then reach into his grimoire and pull out Lost Vein, blocking one of the fist strikes of Veto. Veto would be pushing harder as the sword began to creak. Asu would then push back as he then activate it. Secret treasure release! Suddenly, a clone would appear of Asta, and Asta would power that clone up to 100%. This being half of Asta's strength, meaning that it uses 100%, would be equivalent to Asta using around 70% of his full power. This amount of Asta's power would be more than enough, as this demonic and angelic Asta's clone would punch Veto, sending him flying to the ceiling. After the clone hits Veto, it would instantly disappear, with its durability being much weaker than Asa's body, and not being able to handle that much magic. Asa would now regain himself as he looks around, regaining his senses. Veto would come crashing off the ceiling as he jumps from the ceiling, charging towards Asta. There! 1000 Divine Cuts! Hellfire would come splashing from Asta's blade, and waves as it cuts Veto. Veto would feel the burning as his limbs would begin to dissipate. Veto would then use his beast magic, as the flames were beginning to burn him up. He could feel himself burning away. They're not disappearing, but we're underwater, how is it? It's hellfire, Asta would say. You might want to have some defense against it before you fight a demon, Asta would say. Just as Asta says this, suddenly a sea water dragon would come rushing from the side, bursting, as it crashes into Veto as he hits the side of the wall of the sea temple. We would see Noel blasting the dragon out towards Veto, as he had no idea what that attack had come from. Noel had unlocked the sea water dragon attack from after her battle of Kahano had occurred, and she had really realized what happened. So she now had her first attack spell unleashed. Asta, are you? Asta would fall over as his arms would begin to feel weak for some reason, specifically his right arm, which had been ripped off. If I'm gonna die, Veto would say, then you can bet that I'm gonna use this. Asta would be shocked as he senses it. That's, that's demonic magic. What is that? He'd look up to Veto as a third eye began to open in his skull. I've never seen anything like it before. Noel would be shocked after having released her water dragon, having seemingly almost killed Veto. He was regenerating at a massive speed, just like, just like Asta. He's tapping into demonic magic, Asta would realize. 
I'll have to be the one to take him out. I also would activate his angelic half. I'll use Ark and deactivate his demonic energy. Fenrir and Vanessa would arrive telling Asa to help him, as Fenrir and Vanessa would use the same strategy they had in the original, as he then would charge at them, firing a blast of demonic energy. It won't work against me, Asa would say. Asa would raise his right arm as he then flicks his wrist, saying, Ark. Suddenly, a blast of white energy would eradicate the demonic magic that Veto was using. Veto would begin to enter physical combat against Asta, as Asta would be flying through portals and being pulled every which direction from Vanessa's thread magic. He's... he's too fast! Veto wouldn't even be able to track Asta with his third eye, as Asta would appear behind Veto. Veto would then turn around asking, WHY? WHY DON'T YOU FEEL DESPAIR? Asta would look up, as he says because his true magic is that of NEVER GIVING UP! Asta would charge as he takes his hand and places it directly on Veto's head. As he touches the eye, Asa would begin to feel the curse running through him. Now! Asa would use Ark as he covers Veto's entire body with the light magic. Damn it! Damn it! Veto would be completely eradicated, turned to ash as his body and this magic would have been erased from Asa's power. As Vanessa and the rest of the Black Bulls would cheer, Asa would fall to the ground having used a lot of magic power almost passing out as he falls unconscious. Just as Asta finishes defeating Veto, suddenly Yami would appear saying he's here to save the di- as he sees Asta now on the ground with Veto gone. And I miss my cue, Yami would say. Gee, thanks Asta, he'd say as he grabs his head and begins squeezing it. Asta, who'd already be unconscious, wouldn't say a thing. As everyone else would try and get Yami to stop, Yami would point his sword at them saying that that was going to be his kill, and you just unlocked this really cool spell too. He said he wouldn't show it to them this time though. He'll save it for a different occasion. He'd look away a bit sooner as Yami would be disappointed, not being able to use his dimension slash on this guy. But thank you, Veto. Yami in his mind would see all of the growth that his teammates had gone through from this threat, and having seen the strength that they had accomplished through teamwork together, Yami would be pretty impressed, saying they all did a pretty good job. As Nero would appear pecking Asta on the head, Asta would look up, now regaining consciousness, as he would say, oh, there you are, Nero. What's up? Asta would say as he begins recovering, his wounds beginning to heal over his body, but his stamina being completely gone. Asta would nod as he looks up, seeing Nero holding the magic stone. We got the magic stone, huh? Asta would say, as he would then fall back into an unconscious sleep. Hey everybody, it has been two months, so I know for some of you guys who remember the last part, but need a refresher, I will do a quick review of what just happened. Speaking of which... Last time, Asta battled against one of the key members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun, that being Veto, the user of beast magic as well as demonic magic, which Asta defeated using his arc, his angelic half from his mother's side, as well as using the raw power of Meliodas that he has. Anyway, this time we will be covering the Forest of Witch's Arc, which has been something you guys have been looking forward to for a very long time, and we'll be getting into that now. Asta's right arm would be completely immobile, even using holy magic and light magic, he couldn't dispel the curse that Veto had imprinted on him with his death. This curse magic was not affecting his demonic half due to it being demonic magic, but his other side was taking it brutally. He could barely f even feel his right arm, and after the fight, he was knocked unconscious. And currently, Yami and the other black bulls are worried about him, with Noel being especially concerned. Asta would be taken back with them as they prepare to leave the Undersea Temple, with its now residents thanking all the Black Bulls and saying they'll hold a feast the next time they come to visit. Kahano, as well as her brother, would be waiting there. Asta in this version would be unconscious, due to him being extra affected by demonic magic when it comes to his angelic half. One difference this time, though, is that Kahano and her brother did not lose anything from Veto's curses, due to Asta being strong enough and powerful enough to handle Veto by himself, meaning that the two were completely unaffected by the curses alongside Asta, with Asta being the only one to suffer any major damage from the fight. The two would wave to Noel and Asta, who was unconscious, as they would say they'd be sure to find them on the surface once they become idols and pop singers, with him and his dances as well. He'd remember the fight he and Asta had using their swords and blades, as he promises that he will find Asta on the surface. Asta and the rest of the Black Bulls would use Noel's Dragon's Lair in order to escape the Water Undersea Temple and its strong magic zone. With the entire Black Bulls now having made it up to the surface and now getting back to the beach, 
Asta would be immediately taken by Finral and Yami, along with Charmy, who had detained what was left of the Eye of the Midnight Sun's forces, back to the Wizard King at the capital, in order to make sure that Asta was okay, as well as to drop the prisoners off. With Yami now holding Asta, as we would see Fenrir open the portal, the group would enter as the rest of the Black Bulls would head back to the hideout, which Fenrir would have opened a portal for beforehand so that they could all make it there without having to ride brooms. Anyway, Noelle would be quite worried about Asta, but she would head back with the others, as Asta, Charmy, Yami, and Fenrir would then head to the capital. Yami would accompany Asta as he would take him to Marx, the royal healer who also has those memory abilities while Charmy would go along with Fenrir as they go to drop off the prisoners they had captured. Back at the Black Bull's hideout, as soon as everyone would arrive through the portal, this would be when Ghost would look in the corner and we'd see Gordon sitting there, depressed. Everyone would walk up as Ghost would point out Gordon, and Gordon would then say in a melancholy tone that they all left him behind, his precious friends abandoned him, which would cause everyone to feel quite uncomfortable for a second. Yami and the others would meet up with the Wizard King, Julius, as they would then explain everything that happened in the report, Julius would praise Yami, as he would then think about back when he had first made Yami the captain of his own Magic Knight squad, the pleas of all the people telling him not to do it. As he thinks about how they must be proven wrong now, seeing how successful Yami's becoming, he'd be really proud of his previous subordinate back when they were all in the same Magic Knight squad on the Grey Deer. Yami would hand Julius the Magic Stone, and then he'd switch into his Magic Geek mode, as the Wizard King would then proceed to analyze the stone from every single angle he could imagine. After realizing that Charmy, Yami, and Asta would be staring at him, he would then cough as he then begins to compliment Asta, congratulating him on defeating such a high-ranked member of the Eye of the Midnight Sun, to which Yami would look away for as he still remembers his shining moment being stolen by his subordinate. Asa rode the back of his head saying thanks, as Julius would see him and in his mind see an image of Meliodas. Julius would then pat Asa on the back saying that he's one step closer to being the Wizard King, and Asa would then remember his goal, as he thinks about Yuno. Speaking of which, suddenly a transmission from Marx would occur as he would tell the Wizard King that there's an attack on Kitan from the eight generals of the Diamond Kingdom, which would cause everyone to freak out besides Asta, who would then ask, what, what, are, what are the eight Shining Generals? Yami would explain that they're the same level as Magic Knight Captains, and immediately Asta would be excited, saying he wants to go over there and fight them. The Wizard King would immediately get on the situation, as we would then be told that the Golden Dawn would arrive on the scene, according to Marx. Meanwhile, at the invasion, the three generals would begin talking about how the Clover King's defenses are down. <laughs> yeah, there's like no mages here at all. It's a perfect time to attack. Anyway, the few magic knights that were in the city would begin putting up barriers to try and defend against the incoming army from the Diamond Kingdom. Almost immediately as the attack would begin, 14 members of the Golden Dawn would intercede, as Yuno would take one of the captain's attack full on and blast him away with wind magic, using the wind spirit Sylph's power very minorly, as he would completely overwhelm the general. Everyone would be amazed seeing the power of Yuno, comparing him to when he had only joined the order a few months ago. Little do they know that Asta had just completed a very similar feat, defeating even an opponent above a Magic Knight captain just a few days ago down at the Undersea Temple. Anyway, back at the battle itself, you know when the Golden Dawn would pretty much easily be able to take down the rest of the generals before they retreated because Longris and you know would be more than enough to handle them. Asta would be watching through Marx's telepathic link. As Asta sees Yuno has gotten much stronger, he decides it'd be great to spar with him again, remembering the last time when he wiped Yuno across the floor and Yuno said he wasn't going to fight Asta again. Asta would laugh, remembering how timid Yuno used to be back before he became Magic Knight. Time sure flies, huh? Again, Asta would plead to Yami asking if he can head out to Kizan and help, with the Wizard King commenting that it would probably be a good idea to send a few more mages out. Asta would be excited, thinking that he can go and help Yuno and show him how strong he's gotten. Yami would point at Asta's arm and say there's no way that you can fight like that. Asta would look down as Charmy would then nod, saying that she'll help protect Asta if he lets them go. Yami would sigh, saying he'll go with too, but it's gonna be a pain in the ass. 
And so, Yami, Charmy, Asta, and Finral, who would have been found by Yami as their transportation, would go through the portal as they were then sent to Keaton, where the now Black Bulls would intercede into the battle with the Golden Dawn and the Diamond Kingdom. Asta, Charmy, and Finral would begin helping evacuate the citizens, since Asta's arm is pretty busted right now, so they don't really want to make him fight with one arm. Anyway, in the city, suddenly an explosion could be seen as we see a burst of wind magic as Yuno is fighting off another one of the eight Diamond Kingdom's generals. As the general gets closer, Asu would take the lead as he'd say, I gotta take this one. Asu would jump up as he activates just a bit of his physical power. As the general comes crashing towards Asta, he then summons his grimoire as he pulls out the anti-magic sword using his demonic hand and then slams the general with the blade, completely deactivating all of his mana, as Yuno is just about to send a blade at him. He then say, oh, it's you, Asta. What are you doing here? Asta would then look up and he says, geez, you don't gotta be so cold, you know? Asta would laugh as he then points out to Yuno saying that they were here to help. Yuno would narrow his eyes and said that maybe you shouldn't take my fights. Asta would say, oh, you wanna go? Yuno would remember the last fight and say he'll pass, and that they have more important work to do. <laughs> Sylph would then ask if Asta was scared of Yuno, with Yuno now sweating as Asta would laugh saying yes, he was terrified. Asta would pat Yuno on the back of his good arm, as Yuno would ask what happened looking down at Asta's other arm which would be completely bandaged. He's never seen Asta in such a physically worse state, considering that Asta heals wounds faster than healing magic itself. Asta would look up to Yuno and then say that he got into a little fight with someone who wields curses a few days ago. It was pretty intense. Even for you? Yuno would be shocked thinking about how someone that strong could even exist. Well, we should probably focus back on what's actually happening in the fight. Yuno and Asta would both nod as they would then split up. Sylph would ask Yuno who that was and why he was so scared. She could feel it in his mana. It was shaking. I wasn't scared, Yuno would say. You're, you're lying. He's like a brother to me, we grew up in the same village. From what I know from his mom, who's actually a nice person like him. What was that, Sylph would ask? Nothing. You know then say that, apparently, Asa's father was some powerful demon, but he's never met him before. Hell, I don't think even Asa's met him. Sylph would be shocked remembering the demons, thinking about it, and turns back to see Asa running away. There's no way. That's not... whatever. Longress would notice Finral as well as Asta and Charmy, and ask what they're doing there, misfits of the Magic Knights. Asta would turn asking who this shorty is, with Longress pointing out that he's taller than him. Asta would ignore his comment. Finral would then reveal that Longress is his younger brother. Longress would insult Finral saying that begrudgingly he is, but I don't even consider you a brother. Asta would defend Finral saying that Finral would probably be a great older brother. But Finral would stop him, pulling his hand out and telling Asta to stop it. Longress would begin to insult the Black Bulls, saying that they're all just a bunch of failures anyway. Finral would tell Longress to knock it off and not make fun of his teammates. Suddenly, an attack would get launched towards Longress, who would easily counter it, flicking his hand as a portal blocks the attack. Then, one of the eight Shining Generals still remaining would appear. That being, Yagos also saying that Longris can never do anything to stop him. He'd say he's going to take Longris' head back to the Diamond Kingdom. Everyone would notice as Yagos would have captives. Longris would decide to attack, but the citizens. Asa would stop him, telling them that they need to save the citizens first, as he holds his hand out, blocking and disabling the attack of anti-magic. Longris would be shocked as his portal was disarmed before he could even launch it. Anyway, Asa, Charmy, and Finn would begin their attacks, as Fenrir would launch Asa towards the general using his portals. This would be when the battle would start and Yagos would try to attack Asta. But the moment that his blow was about to hit him, Fenrir would warp Asta then up directly above Yagos. Asta would pull out the huge demon slayer sword, that being the anti-magic blade, as he would then slam down hitting Yagos and deactivating his spell. The diamond general would then attack again, attempting to hit Asta with a physical attack. Before Fenrir could do anything though, Asta using just one arm would block it without using any magic, as he takes the full physical impact, and then would reflect it, twisting his hips midair as he pulls out a black wing from his demonic side, summoning it using his demonic magic. What the? 
Asu would suddenly spin his body at super fast speeds in the air, using both of his wings, his demonic and angelic wings, to spin like a drill, as he would then throw the attack back at almost double the force towards him, hitting the Diamond King General with a massive amount of damage as he gets sent flying and crashing through two buildings. This would be when Fenrir would turn back to Longris and say, so who's the failures again? Asu would give Fenrir a high five saying that was awesome using his portals, and Longris would be speechless with his mouth gaping. What the? When? When did they? That stupid short kid. Damn commoner. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Yami would be interrogating the captain of the Golden Dawn. William, sorry, but I can't have any chances. He'd pull out his katana, pointing the blade towards him. Remove your mask. Now. William would sigh as he then holds his hands up as the two stand atop his world tree magic. I understand, I understand. Really though, thinking I'm the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun after this long? I've seen with my own eyes, you know, Yami would say. If it's anyone, it could be you. And someone with light magic. I wouldn't be that surprised if you had two, someone being as skilled as you, William. William Vengeance would then remove his mask, as he would then reveal his brutal facial scars to Yami. Yami would be shocked, as William would then proceed to explain how he owes the Wizard King for this mask, and how he had saved him back when he was still a child. That's why he joined the Magic Knights to begin with. Yami would sense that he's not lying, as he decides to trust him and tells him that it's fine, as he puts his katana away, telling William that he's sorry for suspecting him. William would nod as he says that it's good to see him again though, as Yami would nod, grunting. Yami would then say it's time to get out of here as he would go meet up with the rest of the Black Bulls in the city. Yami would then leave along with Charmiasta, Finral, as they go back to the main castle, where Asta can finally get his arms checked by Dr. Owen. Back at the castle, Yami would drop off Asta as he then goes out to go gambling, saying just to come get him after he's done. Asta would go in as Dr. Owen would then summon a type of jellyfish thing. He would use this magic as he would then scan Asta's arms like an x-ray. After he examines them, Owen would be shocked, gasping, as he tells Asta that it's a miracle that his right arm is still functioning as he explains that there's some kind of magic inside Asa's arm that's battling against this curse, but from the way it's looking, it's not winning. The way I see it, if you didn't have whatever that light magic inside of you is, your entire right arm would be unable to move. It's a miracle you can feel it at this point. Asa would be shocked, as Dr. Owen would say that at this point, it might even be worth getting amputated. It's, it's really that bad, Asa would say. He would nod as he explains that curses are a very serious type of magic that can affect your vital organs and even just small parts of curses can affect you for life, even kill you. They're so powerful that not even light and healing magic can disable them. I've never seen anything like this before, at least nothing to this degree, he'd say. I'll also be shocked looking down as he decides that it's fine, if, if that's really true then. I can still fight with one arm. Outside of the door, we would see Fenro looking shocked as he thinks that it's all his fault. If we didn't rely on him so much back then, we could see a flashback of Asta fighting against Veto back under in the sea temple. Then maybe he wouldn't have lost an arm. I have to, I have to figure out a way to fix this, Fenro would think. Fenro overhearing the conversation would escape just as Asta was opening the door. Afterwards, Yami, Asta, and everyone else would head back to the Black Bull's headquarters. Yami would then announce saying that they're going to be having a party to celebrate getting rid of all of their negative stars. Everyone would cheer as they begin drinking. Noel would offer to help Asta eat by feeding him, but Asta would then laugh saying he still has his other arm, with Noel turning away saying that's not why she offered to begin with. Asta wouldn't hear her though as he continues to eat happily along with the rest of his friends. Noah would blast water at him for being such an idiot. Anyway, after a while, Asta would leave from the party, as he says he has to go take care of something. Asta would reveal one wing as he tells Yami he'll be back later, as he begins flying back to Hodge Village at top speed. If mom really can't heal this, then I don't know if anyone can, he'd think. As Asta would get back to Hodge, we would then see his house on the outskirts of town, as he'd land and deactivate his wing. Elizabeth could already have detected Asa's magic power coming back towards the village, so she already knew that he was on the way. 
She'd open the door, she asked what's wrong, with Asta not having been home in multiple months, but still writing letters. Elizabeth would see Asta's arm and would gasp, shocked, as she sees it's all blackened, with a light faintly surrounding it. Hey, Mom. Uh, got a funny story to tell ya. Sit down now. Elizabeth would use in that mom tone. Asta would stand up straight, says yes ma'am, as he goes into the room and would then sit down, with Elizabeth being worried, biting her nails. She closed the door as she then walk in, asking Asta what the hell happened, with Asta then explaining what happened at the undersea temple. I fought against a guy who used this beast magic. His name was Veto. He's part of that terrorist organization that attacked the capital. And he... He what? Elizabeth would ask. He could use some sort of demonic magic. I've never seen it before. Anyway, he grew this really creepy eye out of his forehead, and then when he died, he cursed my arm, I think. This is some kind of curse magic, at least that's what the doctors at the capital said. Even I can't heal it. I've been using angelic magic on my entire arm and nothing's happening, Asta would say. So I was wondering if maybe you could... Elizabeth would nod, saying she'll give it her best shot, hoping that it would work. Elizabeth would hold her hands out as she would then close her eyes, having not had to use magic in many years at this point. She would then summon light magic as her eye would turn orange to the symbol of the goddess race, as she tries to heal the curse in Asa's arm. Uh, she'd be shocked as her pupils would dilate for a second. This is... I think this might be beyond me, she'd say. Whatever that curse was, it's nasty. I know there's some way to heal it, but honey, I don't think I can use light or holy magic to fix this. She'd whisper under her breath, if only Bon was still around. Huh? Asked would look up. Nothing, she'd be thinking. She'd remember the healing and restorative properties of Bon's blood, able to fix curses using the power of the Fountain of Youth from the fairies. Anyway, she'd look around. If there's any way that we can fix this, then let's do it as soon as possible. I can't bear to see you like this, she'd say. As Elizabeth would look at her son, she would then think about Meliodas, remembering when he had died, all seven of his hearts ripped out by the Ten Commandments. She would have a small PTSD attack as she breathes out, Mom, what's wrong? Nothing, nothing, Elizabeth would say. Elizabeth would turn around as she just says that, I remember when your father used to do this. I couldn't help back then either. We'd see a tear run down her face through the window from the reflection on the outside. Mom, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I wanted to check if maybe there was anything you could do, and Elizabeth would turn around saying she's sorry for being so useless. Asa would tell her that's not true, as he uses his good arm and wraps around his mom, giving her a hug. Elizabeth would tell him that there's anything that she can do, she'll try. She's gonna try and figure out if there's anything that she could think of. Asa would nod saying he'll be okay, as the doctor said that his magic should last for a while at least against the curse, so his arm won't be completely useless. Asa would then leave, saying goodbye to his mom, giving her a kiss on the cheek as she waves him goodbye, immediately closing the door before turning around. As Elizabeth would enter into her bedroom, she would then hold up a small portrait, as she would see all the seven deadly sins, thinking about them. <sighs> Those days were really the best, huh? She'd be thinking. Anyway, while Asa was gone, Finn would have told the rest of the Black Bulls about why Asta left, saying that he probably went to go see his mom explaining that Asta's right arm was completely unusable. The curse that Veto had attacked him with is not even able to be healed by him. So, if there's nothing they can do, or if there's nothing Asta's mom can do, then they're probably screwed and Asta might even have to have his right arm amputated. Everyone would be shocked, as you would see Finral, Noel, and especially Vanessa feeling conflicted as they think about how useless they'd been in the fight, completely relying on their junior in order for him to take down one of the strongest opponents they've ever faced. Damn it. Vanessa, as well as everyone else, would be feeling down, as Asta would enter the door, now wrapping his wing back around himself. Hey guys, what, what happened to the party? Asta would say. Yami and everyone would start laughing as they start drinking again, with everyone putting up the act so that Asta doesn't worry. Asta would then leave the party going up to his room saying that, He's tired and he's gonna go sleep. As Asta would be worried that not even his mom can fix this, who was amazing at healing magic, even better than him, maybe there's no way it can get fixed after all. Asta would be sitting on his bed looking down, as he would then squeeze his left fist. Well, if I only have one arm, then I gotta make it twice as strong. Asta would smile as he then gets on the ground doing one arm push-ups, saying, I'm not gonna give up. 
I'm going to keep going until I become the Wizard King. He'd scream out loud, laughing, as everyone would hear him, as this would cheer everyone up, which would be when Vanessa would suddenly get an idea. Vanessa would think, if there's one witch in this entire world who has the magic to heal curses, it would have to be her mother. Last time, Asta and the Black Bulls had a party, which was their celebration for having beaten the Undersea Temple as well as the Black Bulls, mainly Asta's, participation in the fight at Kiten against the Diamond Kingdom, who was attacking the Clover Kingdom. Asta had learned that his arms were effectively unhealable. Even his mother of the goddess race could not seem to heal this curse. That was just how deeply rooted in his demonic side of his arm it was. And she couldn't use her god's goddess side magic because it could hurt her son. So there was really nothing she could do. Asa went back to the Black Bull's hideout pretty dejected. And once everyone at the party knew, everyone was pretty down and depressed about it. Vanessa, though, had an idea. Now, getting back into today, Asa has woken up after having done a thousand push-ups last night and was ready for a new day. Ready to do his morning workouts, he heads downstairs looking for breakfast, but strangely, no one else from the Black Pools is around, except Captain Yami. Captain Yami? Where is everyone? Asa would ask. Yami would then point out that they all went out to go look for cures for his arm. Asa would feel all seven of his hearts beat. They're all doing that for me? Asta would cheer as he looks up smiling thinking, Wow, I must have made some really good friends, huh? Mom? Dad? Asta thinking about the memories of everything he remembered from the seven deadly sins, his dad's friends and close comrades in battle. Maybe the black bulls are like my, my sins. Asta would smile as he looks up to his captain, Captain Yami, and says he should go and make sure that their efforts aren't wasted. And so Asta would head out to go and do his morning workout. Asta then going outside would find Noel and Finral. Asta would listen in and hear what they were saying, as Finral and Noel talk about how everyone went off to different locations to find out how to heal Asta's wounded arm. Noel and Finral would also talk about how Asta had helped them in the past to keep fighting, and how they had pushed them to grow further beyond and break their limits. And now it's time for them all to pay back what they, he had done for them, to him. Asta leaves and then feels like he's about to cry, having this much emotion that he hasn't felt in a long time. Having just heard yesterday that not even his mom, who is a brilliant healer, could fix this. Those guys. Asa would scream as he starts doing laps, running around the hideout for the Black Bulls, training his magic as he uses his own magic to increase the gravity around his feet by pushing more magic power down to his legs, making it so that it would be hard to run. Asa using this self-imposed limiter would continue training for throughout the morning. Yami looking out and seeing everyone, everyone in his squad working so hard would then smile, laughing as he says, Maybe if their squad put this much effort into their normal work, they'd be the top of the Magic Knights. Outside, Finral then suggests that they go to a place that might be able to help. Noelle declares saying that she has somewhere else to go, and he can go wherever he wants to by himself. Noelle would make a hmm sound, and then she tells him where she wants to go. Finral would be wondering why she wants to go there, and also wonders where Vanessa might have gone. Elsewhere, Vanessa finally arrives at a large door, its wood heavily ingrained and clearly showing signs of age. It would have a strong magic power flowing all the way throughout it, like a barrier. Vanessa would then breathe in as she then yells out, I've... I've returned! As she screams this out, the door would begin to hinge itself open, as we can hear the large metal brass hinges clanging, the rust now opening and dusting themselves off from the force as a huge swarm of birds begins to burst out of the door and drag Vanessa inside. Meanwhile, Noelle and Finral arrive at the home, which Finral comments about, people here might know a way to cure Asta. Noelle heads in to find a naked man, who she would then attack, screaming and telling him to put some clothes on. Two women then rush into the room, who Noelle greets them as Domina and Mariella. After a brief argument between Domina and the naked man who we now are introduced to as Fonzo, Noel then tells them what happened to Asta. Noel asks if they may know of a way to help Asta, which Fonzo says that he does not know, but Domina says that the queen of her hometown, the witch's force, might be able to do something. 
Noelle asked about the place, which Dalmau tells her about the witch's forest. This being a land owned completely by witches, ruled by the great witch who's hundreds of years old and super powerful from what she remembered. Finra wonders if Vanessa might have actually gone there. And to their surprise, Dama would tell them that Vanessa and her are both fugitives of the forest because they left. So there's no way that Vanessa would ever go back there. Domino also says that Vanessa was one of the most important people to the queen. And if she did go back, there's no way she's ever leaving again. Domino would then comment on how dangerous that forest is, saying that if they really want to go, then it'll be a risk for all of their lives. Noelle hardens her eyes as she thinks that if there's anything they can do, it'll be this, saying that she'll be doing it. Finner would be shocked, gasping, really? Are you serious? Did you not hear how dangerous she just said it was? Noelle would turn asking if he's not going to be coming then. Finner would gulp saying, well, yeah, I guess I'll go. For Asta. Noelle would nod, as Fenzel and Mariella would also say that if they're really going to insist on going, then they should definitely come with since they were the only ones to have helped them when they had first escaped the forest. <sighs> anyway, back at the Black Bull's base, Asta is still exercising when suddenly a portal is created. Fonzil, Finral, Mariala, Domina, and Noel appear out of it, walking out into the field. They quickly see Asta, who is still running, and head out to tell Asta that they'll explain everything to Asta where they're going later. Asta having a small idea that they're going to be heading somewhere to fix his arm, which would get him pretty excited. At the witch's forest, Vanessa meets with the queen. The queen, looking down at her daughter, would feel only one thing. Disappointment. <laughs> I guess she hasn't mastered it yet. How sad. Guess my little experiment failed, she'd be thinking. Hoping that her having allowed Vanessa's escape would have been the very thing to allow Vanessa to bloom into her full potential. The queen tells Vanessa that the plan has now fallen short because she left. Vanessa telling the queen that she only came back to learn how to dispel ancient curses. Outside the witch's forest, Asta and the others finally arrive, a huge portal forming in front of the great door, which Vanessa herself had just entered moments before. At that time, Donna would tell them that the witch queen can survey the entire force of her magic, and they're going to have to use cloaks with her magic to protect them from her gaze. The group would then cover themselves with cloak, Asa pulling it over himself with his one arm, as they then enter the witch's forest in two groups. Once they're inside, Noel would look around, spotting a golem, a magical creature remotely controlled, much like a robot. Domino would explain how the golems work and their purpose is to protect the forest, while the queen and her witches don't have to fight so much. Anyway, suddenly, one of their cloaks would fall off. This would be when the golems would turn, sensing them, as they started to attack the now intruders of the forest. Everyone begins to run, as they quickly start rushing towards the queen's palace, Asta ripping open his angelic wing, as well as the others now hopping on magic broomsticks and making a getaway, as they now fly towards the castle, using Funeral's magic to boost their speed. The group would slam into the castle, Asta now breaking through the wall with his wing, as he lands to the ground, deactivating it with everyone now behind him, thanking him for the quick entry. The golems would turn away from the castle, going back to the forest, as they are automatic after all. Asta with his group, now inside the castle, would decide to go look for Vanessa, as they quickly rush to where the Queen's palace main hallway would be, with the Queen's throne. Once they enter the throne room, they would find Vanessa unconscious on the floor, with the Queen of Witches standing over her, her looking down at her failure of a daughter. Asta yells to the queen to leave Vanessa alone as she's bending down, prepared to stroke her hair. The queen would then look up, sharply responding, saying that it's her duty to discipline Vanessa for leaving. And that didn't even resonate to Asta. He had no idea. There's no way that someone would do that to their own kid just because they wanted to leave. Asta says that he doesn't care as he charges towards the queen. Fenro would create a portal and Asta would jump through it, appearing behind the queen. Asta would then quickly pull out out of his grimoire, Lost Vein, as he slices it at incredibly fast speeds. As she sees the blade, she'd be kind of shocked and also impressed, now knowing exactly who this is, having met the owner of that blade many years ago. 
Asta would slam the sword without any anti-magic or any magic of any kind directly into the queen, but the queen would simply block off her pinky finger, her nail being enough to stop Asta's attack. Asta would get pushed back by wind as he takes the sword with him, cutting into the ground to stop his push back. The queen would look down at her nail, noticing a cut into her fingernail, smirking and thinking about, this kid's pretty strong. The queen would look up and comment that Asus appears to have something rather unique about him, having noticed already an odd power within him, this not being the magic of his father that she was rather aware of, but a different demon. Of course, the queen doesn't allow Asa to know that she is well acquainted with Meliodas himself, but she decides that she'll keep this information to herself for now. The queen commenting this about his odd power would then notice his other arm, which was completely disabled. That's surprising, she'd be thinking, knowing that Asa's mother was like from the goddess race, should have incredible healing power. So that must have been why she wanted to learn about ancient curse dispelling. Hmm. The queen would comment about how Asa's the one that Vanessa was talking about, and how Vanessa would become the queen's slave, unable to leave here, if she would heal Asa's arm for him. The queen would smile as Asta looks up, looking down at his unconscious friend. Suddenly, before anyone can say anything, the queen would sense something along with Asta, feeling bloodlust from all the way over here. K what is that? Asta would be thinking. Outside the forest, two armies are approaching it. One from the Diamond Kingdom, and the other being the Eye of the Midnight Sun. The queen would smirk and then shows them the armies, using her magic as she can show her unseeing eye. Everyone would be watching as they see the two massive armies approaching. Asa would actually point out Fauna and Mars recognizing them as he points them out on the crystal gem view. Outside, near the Eye of the Midnight Sun's army, Fauna is then told that Asta and the Queen are inside the forest. Which Fauna would then use a spell in order to break through the foliage and burn it all down. The Queen would comment about how strong this fire spell was, stating that she might not be strong enough to defend the forest. Vanessa, still being unconscious, remembers that when she first met Yami, and sees the memories of him. Thinking about Yami having invited her to the Black Bulls and seeing everything, meeting everyone together. Suddenly, Vanessa would wake up, as she sees Asta and everyone else. Vanessa would look up, her eyes meeting Asta's, as she says that she found a way to heal his arm. He'll be able to use now both of his arms again, she says. Asta would look at her hard as he would then say that he'd rather have no arm at all than Vanessa becoming the queen's slave. Vanessa would look up, seeing that there was a deal that they were talking about, as she realizes what the queen actually wants. She would again get into an argument with Asta, Asta continuously refusing. Asta says that they still have one last method. Asta undoes all the bandages on the angelic half of his arm. He'd pull out, then using Lost Vein and use Anti-Magic, covering the blade as he then slams into his arm from the blunt side. Asa would feel pain, but nothing would happen. The curse would be far too deep-rooted for it to be disabled from such light Anti-Magic. Vanessa would scream for him to stop, Vanessa telling Asta that she can't lose any teammates, she can't lose any friends. Sometimes, Asta, your power won't be enough. Even though you're strong, you need to rely on everyone, okay? Vanessa would tell him that this is the only thing she can do. This is all she can do to save him. Asta would look up saying that he doesn't want to lose any of his friends. And he'd rather fight with his arm like this than not be able to fight at all with her. Asta decides to try it again as he then slams the sword again into his arm, feeling his bone crack from the pressure. Maybe if I stab it, Asta would think. No, everyone would yell, Vanessa agreeing with them, saying that he's insane. Noelle then comes up with an idea, she says to the queen that if she heals Asta's arm, then they will all help to protect the forest. The queen then decides to agree to this plan, and heals Asta's arms, casting a blood red spell, as she then covers Asta's entire body with it. Now knowing for certain with her magic scanning him, this is indeed the half-demon, half-god child, Astaroth, the prince of heaven and hell. She would be extremely pleased, noticing his anti-magic swords, which are from him. Another being that she was very well aware of, who was, as far as she remembered, a monster just like Meliodas was. 
Meanwhile, outside, the two armies which were about to enter into the forest to attack it would suddenly be shocked, as the forest would be healing. What's going on? They'd be so confused, as all the foliage would begin to automatically heal. This amount of magic is... it's impossible. Not even the queen should have that much power. Fawn would use more fire trying to burn it, but it was healing faster than she could fix it at this point. The queen sending her newfound forces out would now be plinking of a plan on how to obtain both Vanessa and this powerful child, along with those anti-magic swords he possesses. The queen would then use her blood magic, having completely healed Asta. At this point, Asta would feel his full strength having returned as he pulls out his second sword, clenching his fist, saying he's all ready for battle. He turns his sword now towards the door and turns back to his teammates, saying he's ready for them to go. Noel, Finral, and Vanessa would be happy that Asta's got his body back, and now everyone was ready to finally fight off this threat and defend the forest. Asta says that he'll hold up his end of the deal and says thanks for healing his arms. Fonzo tells Asta that he's so happy that Asta's arms are finally healed, and now he, along with Domina and Mariella, are going to face the Diamond Kingdom's army, which Asta says sounds fine and try not to die. At the battlefield, Fauna continues trying to burn down the forest, but it seems to be getting even more resilient. Why? Why? They couldn't even seem to scratch it, and the queen would know why. Anyway, the golems have now come from inside the forest out and are beginning to attack the armies. This actually giving enough time for the forces from the Black Bulls as well as their allies to make it to the edge of the forest and actually assess the battlefield before they charge headfirst in. As Asta arrives at the battlefield, suddenly pressure in the air from his magical power will begin to pressurize and crush the enemy forces. What is that? His magic power would be so strong and even though they couldn't sense it as magic power since it was on a different frequency as I mentioned multiple times before, the sheer pressure and gravity of his mana would be enough to make the enemy feel the pressure on their skulls, almost like being deep under the ocean. As Asta now flies over into the sun, they would look up seeing the two dark and light wings. Asta looking down as he tells everyone to stay back, saying that he'll take them all out in one shot. Asta would pull out his huge blade, the Demon Slayer sword as he prepares to cover of anti-magic. Asa would then rush down, flying, as he pushes his body to its absolute fastest, thinking, Black Meteorite. Asta would slam into the ground, and as he uses his anti-magic, pushing it across the battlefield, trees and grass would die, having their mana sucked out. However, all of the enemy soldiers would also have their mana drained, feeling their stamina having been halved. Asu would now go into battle mode, pulling out and switching his sword to Lost Vein, which gives him more speed and agility. Asu would move forward at blinding speed, cutting and destroying the enemy magic knights and all of their mages. Asu would be like a demon, literally. Everyone would be shocked seeing Asta actually doing this, having ripped through the enemy forces at such vigor. Even his allies would be rather intimidated, but now they'd remember the sheer power that Asta had, remembering that he actually could match with the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun in terms of power. Everyone would be shocked laughing and cheering, as Asta was actually destroying the crowd. It seemed like everything was almost over. Even Fauna and her salamander had been defeated already from Asta's just pure strength. And so, Fauna wasn't as big of a threat in this version as she was in the original, with Asta not really needing any support, aside from Noelle using her water to heal the burns and just, well, stop the flames and now licking the forest floor. Meanwhile, while Asta was dealing with the entire army of the Eye of the Midnight Sun, the other Black Bulls and their allies would have headed over to the Diamond Kingdom's army, as they were battling Mars as well as his forces. This would be where Ladros, Ladros being the guy that Asta originally defeated by using his anti-magic, and the original would have fought. However, as Fonzel is about to charge the Diamond Kingdom's army, suddenly Asta would turn, his eyes hollow and shocked, as he had just finished wiping out his army before he sensed this incredible magic power. What? What is that? Asta be saying, as we see the queen having released her trump card. As on the battlefield, we can hear him say, Fox Hunt. Suddenly, all of the hearts of the Diamond Kingdom's army would be ripped out, their magic power stripped. 
as you see a man standing there with long shaggy white hair and ripped red clothing. A man from the kingdom of witches? I thought men weren't even allowed in there, Vanessa would be thinking, having seen him come out of the forest just for a flash before he defeated them all. Mars and Lajos would be shocked, having barely avoided the attack with scratches over their chests, so deep that they could actually see one of their ribs. Lajos would be amazed and also horrified that he almost died, wondering who this strong fighter is. The man would turn around with his crimson eyes, licking his long, sharp teeth covered with blood, as he then turned saying, well, I guess I missed you, huh? I'm Bandit Bon, and I'm here to party. Masta had just finished off his half of the army that had been attacking the witch's forest, that being, well, the Eye of the Midnight Sun. The other half being the Diamond Kingdom was completely wiped out in a similar fashion, and Asta could feel it, the abundance of mana disappearing and crying out as it died. What? What is that? Asta be thinking. Asta would turn, having to rush back to his friends, as he goes running towards where this power was coming from. By the time he had arrived, the only one left standing was Noelle, barely able to hold on as her water dragon's nest was about to crack, about to crack and break under its own weight from the pressure being put on it. Asta would then see him. Standing there, he'd be in rough red clothing, splatter of blood from the fresh kills he had just made. He would have a long, shaggy, tangled mane of hair, gray and white like snow, his eyes a crimson red. He would notice Asta immediately, as Asta and Bon would make eye contact, Bon then moving his hand away as Noelle would fall over, her magic power having been completely depleted. Everyone on the field would be almost unconscious, with Vanessa barely able to be watching the fight, as she's about to see Asta take on this guy. Everyone would be trying to call out for Asta to run, saying he's too strong. As Bon would walk forward, he would then say something to this kid. You remind me of someone else I once knew a long time ago, he would say. Let's see if you can take a beating like he could. Suddenly, Bon would disappear, faster, as he then punches Asta in the gut. Asta didn't even have time to react, as he goes sent flying, a imprint of Bon's fist left in his abdomen. Asta would be shocked, his eyes now narrowing as he realizes this guy is no ordinary person. Bon would be moving again, as Asta is realizing his magic power is slowly draining. This guy's taking my magic, huh? Well then, switch. Asta would pull out of his grimoire a large black sword, that being the huge demon slayer sword. As Bon would then try to strike him hitting the sword, Bon would recoil, realizing that his magic power had just been drained. <laughs> Interesting, 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 Bon would say. You're gonna be fun to play with, he'd say, sticking his tongue out as we would see blood on the inside, just like a fox, saliva foaming at the edges of his mouth, ready for the kill. Bon would rip out the nunchucks from his side as he'd now be using a weapon too, slashing and cutting at the sword. Asta barely able to block with the large blade as Bon would be starting to aim for his legs. Asta would actually be on the back foot in this fight. Of course, Asta hadn't fully maximized his power yet, and he was about to. Asta would charge forward, just using anti-magic, as anytime he switched to his other magic types, Bon would just be able to steal his power. Who are you? Asta would ask. Bon would smirk, saying it's rude to ask someone their name before you give theirs. That is, if you have time to think about that before you're dodging, Bon would say, slashing at Asta faster. Asta would come up with a plan as he then pulls out another sword. This actually would distract Bon for a good two or three seconds. Why do you have- Asta would then use Lost Vein, summoning some clones as they go running towards Bon using different powers. One using his angelic size, he blasts Bon with light, blinding him, and the other going in for the kill, slashing with its Lost Vein clone blade as it tries to kill Bon, stabbing directly through his chest. Bon would cough up blood as he would then pretend to fall to the ground. Asta letting his guard down, thinking, that guy was ridiculously strong. Sorry I had to use such a cheap tactic like that, but I can't let my friends fall here. Before Asta could even say anything else, suddenly Bon would be grabbing him by the legs as he pulls him to the ground, Asta slamming his head to the dirt. As Bon then gets on top of him, starts punching him in the face, back and forth with strong punches, wind getting thrown back from his strength. 
<laughs> You're real funny, Bond would say, as Bond gets to hit harder and harder, using fox hunt and stealing Asa's magic power, as he then punches as hard as he can. Asa would coat Lost Vein in anti-magic as he slashes at Bond, cutting his cheek. This cut would not heal as fast as the other wounds. I guess my anti-magic has some sort of effect on his healing, but it doesn't seem to be doing a ton. <laughs> Bond would charge up a ball of magical power as he then blasts it towards Asta. As Bond's repairing the blast to Asta, he would then yell out to him saying he has no idea where he would have bought that sword. It must have been his dumbass friend selling it again. But I'll be taking it back from your corpse, Bond would say, smiling, as he blasts the beam of magical power directly towards Asta saying, goodbye using all of the magic he had stolen from Asta himself. Asta would smile saying, You think so, huh? As he then uses Lost Vein, preparing it. The sound ringing through the air as he then uses Full Counter. Asta would slash at the air as the magical power would then reflect off of the blade. As Bond would realize who this was, this would be his kid. Suddenly, a blast of magical power would then eviscerate Bon, blasting him back through the field as the dirt and corpses from the army that had fallen into Bon's hands were now coating him in a mountain of flesh, as Bon would have gotten sent flying backwards at miles of speed due to Asta's full counter. Bon would try and get up, as then Asta would use an imperfect technique, something he'd been working on for a while but still hadn't quite mastered. Revenge counter! Him now hitting Bond with all of the attacks that he had been slammed with, all the magic power that had been ripped into Asta himself. Bond would turn, trying to absorb the magic that's hitting him, saying, This is perfect. That's just enough time. As this would happen, Vanessa would use her string, now coating his arms as Bond would get pushed to the ground, thinking, Damn, one was still awake. All of the Black Bulls would then shout out, telling Asta, Do it now! Asta would then scream out, powering up to his maximum power. Bond now knowing for sure whose mother it was and father, that this was their kid. Asa would have both of his wings out, his angelic half and demonic side. Purple and black growing over his face, his eyes would turn a dark purple, the other glowing gold with the symbol of the goddess race. Go to hell, he'd say, blasting Bond with all the magic power he could muster in a single bright shining dark attack. Using both light and dark magic, Bond would be completely enveloped by the magic power, as Bond would be on the ground, now in bits and pieces. Bond would be in a state of consciousness thinking, <laughs> I guess he's just as strong as you were, huh, Captain? Far away in the snowy spade kingdom, Melitos would turn around, him looking off into the distance as if someone called his name. Meliodas would turn back as Dante asks, Lord Meliodas, what's wrong? Meliodas would say, it's nothing, as he then sits back down at the table as they continue their plans for taking down the rest of the kingdoms, as well as improving the three's devil form powers. With Meliodas being the key to the center of their plan, to reopen the demon world and connect the two sides. That being this world, the demon world, and the other side. Back at the battlefield, Asta would have used all of his magic power in one go, as he now only has anti-magic left. He fall to the ground, stabbing his sword into the ground, breathing heavily as his wings would then begin to disappear, folding back into his back, before turning out with a bright flare of light and dark. Asta would look up, his face feeling weary, as he would think, N no Bond would suddenly be standing there saying, Phew, that was pretty good. Sure, that would have sucked for me if I wasn't a mortal, he'd say. Yeah, an immortal, huh? Asta would say. <laughs> Damn it. Asta would fall to the ground unconscious as Bond begins walking forward as he then tells Asta he's about to kill him. Of course, in Bond's mind, this is not true. Meanwhile, the Queen of Witches would then whisper into Bond's mind, saying, That's enough. He, as well as my daughter, can be captured now. Take them back with you. Bond would nod, saying, Whatever, Merlin. Let's do this. I promised I'd only help you until this kid showed up anyway. Now you'll help me get back to Elaine, right, Merlin? Bond would say, his eyes looking up directly to the witch camera she was using. Underneath all of her outside perspective, Merlin was still the same person she had been from since all those years ago. Almost 300 years had passed since they had been sent to this world, 
and they still were unsuccessful and able to trying to reopen their path back to Leonis, and they had no idea why. After their battle against the Demon King, something had happened, something that had reverted them, something that had transported them here, separated them. They had only seen each other one last time before they were all split up, and there was no way to track each other's magic power in this world, too many interferences, but there were still demons and other creatures as well. So far, Bon and Merlin had only confirmed four of the people who had been traveling there, with Bon just confirming the fourth. They only knew about Meliodas, Merlin, and Bon themselves. That was it. They had no idea where King, Deanne, or Gother were, where they could have gone or been sent. And they had no idea if Elizabeth was here either until just now. Merlin in this time would be hoping to utilize the power of her daughter in order to bend fate, that being the power she knows she possesses. Vanessa holds the potential to be their key out of this world. She might be the one to be able to bend their fate back to where it was meant to go originally, before everything went wrong. Asta began to wake up, as Bond would be thinking this kid's got a ton of stamina, him trying to hit Asta in the neck. Before he could do anything, suddenly something would change, as Asta kicks Bond in the head and rolls over onto the ground. Vanessa falling off of Bond's shoulders, Bond turns around telling him, Hey, I don't need to get rough with you, but if you want another fight, you already know I'm immortal, right? Before Bond could say anything, he'd be shocked, looking as Asta wasn't there. Instead, his eyes would be purely white, as black was covering his entire body. The other demon. The anti-magic that Bon had not understood what it was earlier was now in free control. For you see, Asta had used both his magic power all the way to their limit, leaving him exclusively with the power of the anti-magic devil, the demon living inside of a demon. Kill. Kill. The demon within Asta began to awaken. As anti-magic would course over his body, as Asta finally enters into anti-magic demon mode for the first time in his life unprovoked. Bond would have no idea what was going to happen. Merlin had no clue what was happening, with he shouldn't be able to move. Now that she thought about it, she realized that Meliodas' kid had a grimoire. But how was that even possible? Suddenly, the magic camera she'd been using to watch outside the forest would be slashed and disappear, as the anti-magic devil would have cut them off, now cutting Bond out of the loop. Kill. He'd look up. The demon had fully taken over Asta, as this demon using Asta's body was far more merciless than Asta was. Moving forward at blinding speed using anti-magic to its fullest potential, slashing with Lost Vein and the Demon Slayer Sword, cutting at Bon. As Bon's trying to dodge, his arm would get severed, with this version of Asta being far faster than he had been before. <laughs> He's fast! As Bon tries to regrow his arm, he'd be shocked. It's it's so slow. The demon had realized that he couldn't be able to completely sever his immortality, but he could slow it down significantly. The demon had coated the blades in a coagulative version of anti-magic. The moment that this cut into Bond's skin, it would act like a blood thinner, except on his immortality that he had drank, meaning that his immortality would be a practically useless at this point. And if he got chopped all the way down before he could regenerate, he didn't know if he could get back up again. Bond would take this seriously as he then goes to full power, using Fox Hunt, as he then rips out one of Asta's hearts. This would barely affect the anti-magic demon as it turns around, now throwing the sword towards Bond. Bond would then use both of his arms to block it, his other arm having finally regenerated after what felt like hours. Bond taking the blow would have both of his arms severed, as he gets sent flying back, his magic power being cut in half. <laughs> what the hell? Bond would be pissed. As he then tries to lift himself up, but before he could, Asta would slam the sword next to Bomb's head into the ground, as black anti-magic would swirl around it. As Asta was about to deal the final blow, about to slash Lost Fan across Bond's head, Bond would be watching, just as the blade was about to cut his neck. Suddenly, his hand would stop moving, as his body began shaking. No. The demon would get forced back inside as Asta within his own soul would be battling the anti-magic demon. Don't think that you can take my body over that easily, because I never give up. Asta would be punching the anti-magic demon with its strength, overpowering it, as he then forces it back into the grimoire, forcing the anti-magic back, as Asta would fall over completely unconscious.
Barnaby laying on the ground, heaving and sighing, thinking, that was almost it. Elaine, that was almost the end. I was hoping that we'd be together in a different way. Bond would compose himself as he then pulls himself back up, feeling like crap. Bond would try again attempt to take Asta and Vanessa, walking back into the forest as they finally make it back to the witch's castle, or I guess I should say Merlin's castle at this point, with him dumping the two on the floor before he himself would pass out, falling back, laying down. He's now breathing heavily, saying he needs food. Food. Merlin would recognize the blades that Asta was using. That being the same blades that the elves had had when they had first entered this world all those years ago. The swords of Licht before he transformed into a demon. As Asta's consciousness would fade to black. The black bulls having no idea where their future was going to lead. As their fate was left in the hands of the queen of witches. And this incredibly powerful immortal. Who were they? What do they have to do with them? And why do they seem to know Asta? All these questions will be answered in the next part for What If Asta Was Melodus' Son, where we'll be getting into the end game of the first major arc of Black Clover, that being the Elf's Revival, as well as the Demon Zagreus. Oh, just because it's been a while, let's give a quick recap with that being Asta and the Black Bulls in the Forest of Witches, fighting off the Queen of Witches, who we find out to be Merlin, her underling, that being Bon, both the Foxen of Greed and an Immortal, which is strange because in this timeline it's confirmed that the events of Black Clover take place after the Demon King is struck, which I'll be getting into pretty soon, along with what Meliodas is doing. Anyway, there's some other key things that I said last time, so make sure you go and watch those because the recap of 30 seconds isn't going to cover it. But let's just start off fresh today with where we left off, that being Asta falling unconscious, Bon being impressed with his captain's son, Merlin as well, and taking the Black Bulls and Asta back to Merlin, who is confirmed to be the Queen of Witches in this timeline, and was summoned here along with Bon and Meliodas and Elizabeth almost 500 years ago. For some reason, Merlin had been developing Vanessa's magic, using her power to try and figure out the answer to something, that being the power of fate. But what could this have to do with their situation now? Well, let's get into that now. Merlin would eventually wake up the Black Bulls, specifically Asta, with Asta looking around seeing Bon standing next to her, the immortal reprimanding his temporary leader for her short notice that he had to fight both an army and this kid. Asta would just be watching as Merlin's looking at him annoyed. Bon would turn noticing that Meliodas' kid was awake. As he then walks forward asking, Hey kid, do you know who I am? Bon would ask. You're the guy I just fought. Why am I alive? Wouldn't you have killed us all by now? Asta would say, in genuine confusion. Well, yeah, I could if I wanted to kill you that is at least. Then you don't want to kill us? Asta would say, now confused more than he was before. Asta unknowingly having attacked Bon while he was unconscious due to the influence of the anti-magic demon, which took control only a few minutes ago, showing off Asta's newfound power being the anti-magic devil mode. Or just Black Asta if you watched the dubbed version. Anyhow, Merlin plays a image back of Asta entering the anti-magic devil mode before asking Asta if he knows what this is, Asta realizing that he doesn't remember doing any of that. Bon just watching from the corner as they begin to discuss the problem going on. Merlin, or the Queen of Witches, would reveal to Asta that he actually has another demon dwelling within his grimoire, which he shouldn't even be able to have to begin with. What? What? Asta would say. I'm sure you've realized it by now, but you can't sense other people's magic power, and nor can they sense yours. Merlin would explain to Asta about the magic power frequency, a difference between him and the rest of the humans from this world. Asta, Merlin, and Bond can sense each other's magic power. That's because they all are using the same frequency of magic. However, people like you know who are using magic in this world who have incantationless magic, that is in a grimoire like you know, don't necessarily have the same magic frequency not necessarily being weaker than magic from their world. 
What, what do you mean, our world? Asta would ask. With him having heard about the seven deadly sins from his mom, his mom had never explained that they were not from this world, something that he himself did not know about until now. This being something even after Merlin explains would confuse him. Merlin would sigh, saying that it all goes back to hundreds of years ago, where now we see Elizabeth and Meliodas walking towards the Demon Realm Gate. By this point, Bon had already given away his immortality back then in order to save Elaine, but something had gone wrong. When Elizabeth and Meliodas were walking towards the gate, suddenly a crumbling of stone began to fall. This time, however, Elaine would run forward trying to save Elizabeth, Bond going after her. At this moment, Merlin and a few of the others would try to save them as well from the huge collapse, this time them being able fast enough to actually see it. Instead of Zeldris appearing or the Demon King arriving, suddenly those who had ran after Elizabeth would have found themselves warping as they all had been ripped apart. Those who were together being Bon and Merlin, Elaine being nowhere to be found, and Elizabeth and Meliodas who had luckily been holding on to each other. Elaine, King, and Diane. Those were the other three who had been missing. Immediately after they had been summoned to this world, they had no clue what was going on. Meliodas had thought they might have just been teleported, but he couldn't sense any magic anywhere. None of them could. Not even Merlin, who was an expert on it. They would check and all their powers were still there, but something was wrong. This day is the day where the elves would be getting attacked, as Licht would be turning himself into a demon. Merlin thinks that somehow the seven of them had been teleported to somewhere else, like they had slipped through reality. But how is that possible? And they had to get back, the Demon King was still there. There was no one defending Leonis. The only people who were, at least so far, unaccounted for from the teleportation that could have been there would be Escanor and Zeldris, neither of which were near or relatively near the portal at all when the teleportation incident had occurred. Vanessa, in her memories, is thinking of how she was saved from this place when Merlin and Bon were experimenting on her in order to try and awaken her dormant fate magic the magic that might be capable of perhaps rewriting fate and saving all of them from this world. At least that was Merlin's idea. Bon, of course, isn't exactly against this since he's not truly a morality type of person. He tried to kill Meliodas just to be able to revive Elaine, and even though Bon wasn't proud of it, he was still willing to do whatever it took in order to bring Elaine back to life. Anyway, with Asta being Meliodas' son and Bon and both Merlin realizing it, their hope would now have come true, as well as Bon's promise to stay with Merlin until he arrived. Basically what this means is that Bon's going to be going with the Black Bulls back to the Clover Kingdom, out of the Forest of Witches while Merlin stays there. Anyway, Bon and the others would then head back to the Clover Kingdom, with Asta flying after his recovery and not being unconscious. The good news out of this is that Asta's arms are healed, so the curse that he couldn't even heal with his goddess magic because it was so deeply rooted in his body is gone. Merlin would have freely given up the magic stone earring because she killed the Queen of Witches in this timeline all those years ago and took her position, so it makes sense that she would still have the magic stone on her just like the Queen in the original timeline. Bon would actually be the one in this version to tell them about the Eye of the Midnight Sun and the Elves, with them having explained all they could about what happened before they split up with Meliodas. All that they knew was that Meliodas and Elizabeth would send a sign eventually when it was time. Or at least Meliodas said that. Asta obviously being the signal that Meliodas was mentioning. Bon would tell Asta everything he remembered about the elves, and that the swords that he has, aside from, of course, Lost Vein, being elvish weapons, which would be, of course, a big surprise for Asta. Anyway, I'll digress. For now, the others as well as Bon would make it back to the Black Bull's hideout, with them all walking in, Bon wondering what kind of trash heap this was. As he says this, the door would open into the bathroom, as Yami has finished his eternal shit. Yami pulling himself up as he sees this weird guy with white hair. Huh? Who's this? Yami would ask. I don't know if I like your tone, Bon would say. Asta would be trying to play mediator while the other black bulls would just slump over, exhausted from all the work that they'd been doing that day and the past couple of days during the week to try and help Asta. With Asa's arms finally being healed, Yami would feel reassured, but he would not like this Bon guy. 
He gets in my nerves, the both of them will be thinking. Yami and Bomb would have quite a few similarities, which would mean that they would fight often. Yami would attempt to grab Bon and hurt him, with him telling him to get out of his face, the two trying to fight. Asta was already getting scared, as well as everyone else would probably die from the impact as the two powerhouses are going at it. As he tries to stab Bon, just trying to kill him, Bon would grab the sword, as the two are now bickering. Well, they're gonna make good friends, Asta would say. Asta would walk away with Vanessa telling them to knock it off. Yami looking over annoyed. He would eventually stop saying, I don't like it, as he walks away. Bon huffing saying, this guy sucks, he's nowhere near as good of a captain as Meliodas. Who the hell's that, Yami would say. Again, Bon and Yami would get back into it. At least all's well that ends well. Vanessa sighing as she finally feels like they're back at home. And with this, the Forest of Witches arc would end, with the next arc coming to place being the Royal Knights and the Star Festival, which we'll be getting into right now. Yami would force Asta to take a break from missions temporarily, with Asta insisting that he's fine, showing his arm as he buffs up the muscle. Yami sighing, saying he's not willing to risk it. Asta would dramatically ask what he has left to him without his missions. With the others who were out searching, not with the Forest of Witches, arriving back from their searches on how to heal Asta, they would all find Asta's arms to be already healed, which would be a relief for everyone in the Black Bulls. Noelle would be shocked as well as Asta on how so many of them had changed from their journey, particularly Charmy and Gordon. After they would apologize for not being able to find a cure for Asta, Asta would make them feel better saying that he appreciates the effort that they all put in. Anyway. Now that they would return home, most of them would begin to go back to their former lazy selves, just lying around doing nothing. Yami would inform Asta and Noelle that a certain festival would be coming up, this being the Star Festival. Finral would explain what it represents and also the opportunity to get girls there, as well as how the other teams will be showing up to claim their rankings among all the Magic Knight squads. With everyone preparing to leave for the festival, before they leave, Asta would ask Fenrir to go and get a few people to bring with for him. This being Kahono, as well as Kayato, and his mother, Elizabeth. Elizabeth would be delighted to be invited to the Star Festival, and also be able to see the Wizard King Julius again, since it had been so long since they had last seen each other with the last time having been when Meliodas was still here. Anyway, as Asa is introducing his mom to everyone, Bond would walk out as he then greets Elizabeth. Elizabeth excited to see her old friend again, rushing forward, as she gives Bond a hug. Oh yeah, you would know him, wouldn't you? Bond, this is my mom. Elizabeth would be happy to see Bond again after it had been so long. So we get that nice reunion, with them talking about Elaine, Merlin, and them not being able to find King and Deanne quite yet. Some other events that had taken place over the past couple of years. After using Fenrir's magic to arrive at the festival, Kahono would be deciding to plan a double date with Asta and Noel. Kahono would be egging Noel on, explaining how she's going to plan to steal Asta from her. With them all heading off into their groups, Asta being with Kahono, Noel being with Kayato. Kayato and Kahono, for those who don't remember, are the two twins with the dancing and singing magic abilities from the Undersea Temple. Anyway, at the festival, Noelle would be disheartened seeing how well Kahono and Asta get along. Elizabeth would take notice as she walks up behind Noelle, grabbing her on the shoulders and telling her to do her best. This being Asta's mother, Noelle would recognize that she actually can see a lot of her in herself. She's thinking about how noble Asta's mom feels. She would gulp, thinking of her own mother, as she decides that she'll try her best thanking Asta's mother with her introducing herself as Elizabeth. Kahono and Asta would be by themselves when Kahono decides to ask Asta what Noel is to him. Before Asta can make an answer, they would notice there would be a crying little girl. Asta would walk over asking what's going on, as we can hear shouting from nobles who are harassing the girl for being a peasant. Noel would step into the scene to stop the royals, asking why is this going on, and the girl would still not stop crying. Asta, Kayato, and Kahono would try and entertain her, making silly faces, and the two twins trying to put on a show for the girl, which would actually work and cause her to stop crying. The little girl would reveal that her name's Emma, as she explains what happened to her, with her mom and her getting separated. 
Kahuna would use her song magic to spread the girl's name around using sound, and eventually Emma's mom would show up and thank them for helping her daughter and her get back together. She would also notice that Noelle is a member of the royal family and profusely apologize for what disgrace she saw. Noelle would then explain how even though she is a member of the royal family, she'll still help her hand to anyone in need in the Clover Kingdom, and that everyone should be able to enjoy the festival. Asa looks back, kind of surprised by this, having heard how Noel was from the very start, remembering how elitist she used to be, making fun of him for being a peasant, even though he was stronger than her. Asa remembers Kahono's question and says that he does like Noel. This decision would make Elizabeth smile, who's walking with Yami and Bon, the two staring at each other, annoyed. Anyway, Noel would hear this answer and use Sundere mode, blasting Asa with water as he gets sent flying away. Elizabeth calling out for Asta, Asta would eventually come back saying he's fine. Anyway, Kahono would comment how the two makes a good match, which would be a parallel to what Noelle had thought in her head and said beforehand, with Kahono saying her and Noelle should go and enjoy the festival together. Asta would be wandering around wondering what the hell was wrong with Noelle and why she did that, rubbing his head thinking that hurt, using some goddess magic to heal himself. He would overhear some people talking about this pretty woman. Suddenly, a nobleman called Bauman would approach the girl for her company. If you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? He's trying to put his anti-magic sword on a grimoire, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, basically, he would get mad after the woman would ignore him. Asa would be about to intervene to defend her when suddenly thorns would begin to sprout, this being the magic of the Blue Rose Captain. This would be when Saul, the second in command, would appear and throw them off away. Anyway, Asa would try and stop the captain before she kills the noble, Balman, but before he can, he'd run to Sol, who remembers him. The two would begin to get into an argument, but before the Blue Rose captain can kill Balman, Asa would use a little bit of his power, saying, sorry, as he pushes the girl aside, running forward and slashing with Lost in the thorns away, asking if he's alright. He would look up at Charlotte as the two's eyes would meet. Asa in this timeline isn't afraid of angering magic captains, since he's easily as strong as Captain Yami, maybe even a little stronger, especially now after he's been able to tap into more anti-magic, now having three magic power sources. Anyway, Saul would try and get back into the fight throwing a punch at Asta. Asa would simply take his hand and grab the block, taking the full force of the attack and not even budging an inch. This would show Saul how much stronger Asta was than her, with even her captain not able to take a full hit attack from her without any damage. Anyway, before things can get serious, this would be when Sol remembers something, as she pulls out a dress she had bought for Charlotte, that being the Magic Knight captain, and forces her to wear it. A lot of the men in the crowd would be ooing at her beauty, Asta just watching, thinking what's going on. Charlotte would now be embarrassed, thinking she can't let any of the other captains see her like this, and is shocked when Yami and Bon show up, the two walking around the festival together, Elizabeth having gone with Vanessa and the other black bulls. Anyway, Yami would recognize her and comments about Charlotte wearing a dress, saying, You know, I'm kind of surprised it actually fits you. I never think that a man-beating woman like you would wear anything like that. This quickly switches Charlotte's mood from embarrassed to annoyed. <laughs> as she then comments that Yami's dressed practically naked. Vanessa and Elizabeth would eventually show up looking for Bon and Yami, and this would be when Yami would comment that he likes women who can drink. Vanessa and Charlotte would notice each other and think about how they can't lose, saying that they have to win this challenge. Anyway, Vanessa would challenge Charlotte to a drinking contest, who would then be subsequently crowd-punished by Sol, her younger junior, saying she should do it and show her who's the boss and why she's a Magic Knight captain. Elizabeth would break into the conversation asking if she can join, Elizabeth smiling innocently. The other two women would have no problem with her joining, as they then get into their drinking contest. The challenge starts and Vanessa passes out after drinking, while Charlotte reveals that she actually is a lightweight. Little did they all know that they thought the two of them would be the main challengers, while it was in fact actually Elizabeth. Elizabeth would have a small laugh as she then mentions that she actually used to work in a tavern, with her drinking Charlotte and Vanessa under a table. Yami and Bon would be laughing, with Bon remembering how she couldn't even handle a drink back then either, commenting that she's gotten stronger. Anyway. Charlotte remembers how her family was cursed, and in her drunk state, it was Yami that had saved her, and when she fell for him. 
Yamu would grab the mug from Charlotte's hand before she passes out as she then falls to the table, blushing. The match is declared with Elizabeth as the winner. Asu would notice all the people heading towards the Great Hall, cheering for his mom as he then begins to follow after towards the main ceremony. Asu looks towards Yami, who comments that they can't be late for this and wonders what they're going to be doing since all the other Magic Knight captains are going to be up there. The ceremony for the Star Warding Festival would begin, with the Magic Emperor Julius arriving and announcing that he'll be presenting the awards. Julius would explain why they are going to hold the ceremony, saying that he wishes to reward all the Magic Knight groups who have tried their hardest to improve the kingdom this year. He would introduce all the Magic Knight captains, except for Yami and Charlotte, who wouldn't show up, which would cause Julius to be a surprise, for Charlotte at least. Yami was never to these kind of events early. Anyway, Julius would begin the ceremony announcing the Golden Dawn in first place. He would also reveal that Yuna would be the number one contributor of the Golden Dawn, which would surprise everyone, thinking about what a promising rookie he was. Yuna just worrying about how much stars Asta would have gotten, with Asta having always been stronger than he was as a kid, Yuna actually being the hard worker in this timeline. Yulis would then announce that the squad in second place was the Black Bulls. This would cause everyone to be shocked except for Asta, who would punch his hand to his fist thinking, Damn! If it wasn't that week of everyone looking to try and save me, I know we could have won. Ugh. Him being frustrated that he actually lost to you know at something. Anyway, the crowd wonders if the Black Bulls cheated, with them having been the worst Magic Knight squad for years in the negatives. Someone in the crowd would say that the Black Bulls had helped them and that they're trustworthy. Other people murmuring amongst the crowd that they had noticed that things like that were going on. Anyway, Ulysses would announce all the Black Bulls' accomplishments, saying that they're all true, and ask if any members of the Black Bulls would be in the crowd. Yami would turn towards Asta, saying to get up there, as he grabs him by the back of the collar. Yami and Bond then heaving Asta as they throw them towards the stage. Asta landing perfectly, as he then uses his wings landing directly on top of the stage, as he then greets Yuno, waving his hand, saying, Yo, Yuno, what's up? Yuno quickly sweating, saying, Asta... How's it been? Asta and Yuno would get into a small conversation, with Yuno mocking that Asta got less stars than him. Ah, I see you don't like breathing very much, Asta would say. Well, I can end your free life subscription of it. This would stop when Yuno announces to the crowd that Asta and Yuno are the top two rookies of the year, with both of them having earned almost all of the stars for their teams. The crowd would be amazed by both Asta and Yuno, as Seke would then come out of seemingly nowhere, yelling into the crowd that both of them are slum rats and peasants. Seke and his mind be thinking that he'll do whatever he has to to drag Asta down and hold him back. The crowd would then wonder if Asta and Yuno had really earned their stars. Yuno would turn, saying let's do this Asta, as Yuno would reveal his full power. This would be when Yuno would then blast a huge massive burst at wind at Asta. You know, you know, if you really want to show off your power, this is how you do it. Asu would hold his hand up, blocking the attack with one hand, as Asu would power up, causing the entire area to shake. Elizabeth would recognize what's going on, she can actually feel his magic power, and Bon. Bon whistling, saying that's pretty impressive, as Asta would have both his angelic and demonic half unsealed. No one could feel his magic power, but they could feel the vibrations coming off of his body. Everyone thinking he must be so powerful they can't even feel it. Anyway, this would cause Yuno to tell Asta to please stop. Asta would then sigh he says he's not really trying to hurt Yuno anyway. Anyway, after the crowd is amazed by the two, Asta would then power off as the crowd cheers for both Asta and Yuno's strength. Both of the two, almost brothers, look out into the crowd realizing how far they've come from just being some poor kids out in the sticks to supporting the kingdom as their main frontrunners. As the crowd cheers for Asta and Yuno, Yulis would come up behind them and then talk about that their results are beginning to show, like what he had mentioned the first time he had met the two. Anyway, the Silver Eagles would come in third, Blue Rose in fourth, Crimson Lion in fifth, Green Mantis in sixth, with Coral Peacock in seventh, the Violet Orcas in eighth, and the Aqua Deer as last. This would be a shock for Rill, the captain of his squad, and he would ask Asta how he had gotten all his stars. Anyway, everyone would be cheering for the Magic Knights as this was a night to be celebrated. The Clover Kingdom's king, this being King Clover, would make his way to the stage, Julius announcing his arrival, 
and this would be when we finally meet Augustus Kier Clover, the 13th. After the crowd cheers softly, Augustus shouts at them about how great he is, and Julius would ask the king to calm down. The king in this version is just as jealous of Julius as he is in the original, with him gritting his teeth on how Julius is more popular than, than he is. He would think of a way to try and win back more of the people's support. The king announces to the crowd that they have found the headquarters of the Eye of the Midnight Sun, and will be launching an all-out strike with a new squad called the Royal Knights. The king reveals that they will be holding an exam to choose the best magic knights of each squad to enter, creating one massive elite squad, and then the Eye of the Midnight Sun will fall. The crowd would cheer much louder now, and the king would think that he is definitely winning the people over, and selling Julius' own plan. This being the Wizard King having come up with the Royal Knights himself. Asu would comment absentmindedly that the Wizard King and all the Magic Knights are way more amazing than the actual King. Asu just murmuring about how the King is pretty much the worst up here on the stage would cause Julius and the Captain, alongside Yuno, to worry, as this would cause the King to freak out and order Asu to be put to death, Elizabeth face palming. Julius would step in the Wizard King and ask the King to forgive since both Asta and Yuno may one day become shields to protect the King, and he would then once again ask the King to forgive Asta, Julius then grabbing Asta's head and telling him to not be so hot-headed, thinking of his father and how he pretty much said the same thing all those years ago, almost getting beheaded himself. Anyway, the crowd would have high hopes for the Royal Knights and the Magic Knights to display their power and protect the Kingdom. The crowd cheers for the Wizard King, and the King would be again jealous of Julius. And with that, the ceremony would come to an end with the Wizard King meeting up with Asta and Yuno, telling them to try their best in the Royal Knights exam and gain that opportunity to go fight the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Asta would sigh, thinking he's just going to be the one to take out Licht anyway, the leader, since last time he almost killed him anyway. Unless he got really that much stronger. I also have no idea as the date comes to a close, before the exams would begin for the Royal Knights, that he'd be fighting someone much, much more powerful than Licht, than any of the elves. He'd be fighting someone of his own race in fact. A demon working under his own father. A demon called Zagreus. G quick stop him, Xerx would say. Xerx being the co-captain of the Purple Orca squad, the vice captain. The vice captain would be confronting a man with dark red hair, his eyes pulled tightly back, his gaze as sharp as his eyes, almost like the edge of a knife. You, you're, you're Zora, aren't you? You've been killing off magic knights, not to mention you're wanted around the kingdom. I'll have to punish a rogue such as yourself for obstructing my duties. Xerx would then summon his subordinates, revealing that due to his status he doesn't have to fight such lowly trash. Talking about how great he is. Zora would then slyly laugh as he replies that I don't care about any of that. You and your stupid squad? Look at you wearing that ugly getup. You really think you can beat me looking so ridiculous? How, how dare you, Xerx would say. Zora would easily have goaded Xerx into pu trying to punish him in the sake of justice himself. The subordinates of Xerx would also get angry, saying that he'll take him down, and that Zora will regret insulting the magic knights. Xerx would create a ton of icicles using his ice magic. Ice Slicer! Using his strong magic powers, he then threatened Zora, saying that if he doesn't stand down, he'll kill him where he stands. But they had all fallen right into his trap. Xerx and all of his subordinates would have been taken out by some sort of spell, as the camera fades to black. It's the day of the exam. Asta and the other Black Bulls who are interested in becoming Royal Knights would have arrived. Not to mention the other Magic Knight squads, some of which people we recognize from prior arcs, like characters from the Golden Dawn and the Blue Rose Knights and other such groups. Asta, with him arriving through Thunril's portal magic, along with the rest of the Black Bulls who are interested, would then see Klaus and Mimosa already waiting, who he'd run over to to say hi. Yo, Klaus, Mimosa, it's been a while. <laughs> You guys sure look stronger, Asta would say. Asta peering to his left would see Yuno still being the same standoffish, awkward self he always has been. Asta walking forward to Yuno and asking how he's been. We have a slight flashback to when, before this all happened, Asta was almost abducted by Meredith along with the rest of the Black Bulls to go train at this 
mana zone place, that being the volcano of the Crimson Lions, their training ground. You know had been successfully dragged with, but Asta put up a fight. Asta didn't feel like going, so he and Yami were going to stay behind. The moment Meredith reached for his head of her flaming arms, Asta would just look up as he then throws his hand upward, blocking the grab. Huh? Little punk, she'd say, as Meredith gets into her fighting position. Her and Asa about to duke it out. Yami would yell at Meredith to just leave them the hell alone. Yami would tell her that he's gonna borrow the kid and go off into town and have some fun. Yami and Asta, Asta being dragged against his will with Yami, to go off into town for more gambling. Asta sufficing as Magna for Yami's partner to this time. You know would sigh remembering the struggle he had to go through, having to climb up the mountain by himself using spirit dive and mana zone. Anyway, Leopold would even join in saying that he wishes his rival Asta had been there. Asta saying he was having his own heck of a day. Him and Yami having gone gambling. You should have seen the match that Bon and Yami had. Bon showed up at the tavern and it was... It was horrifying, Asta would say. I wouldn't even want to get in a fight between those two. It was awful. Before Yuno can ask what was awful, Julius would show up. The Wizard King. He would show up thanking all of the members of the Magic Knights. Thank you everyone for showing up to this event. Today, we'll be building a team. A team to take down the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Asta would whistle saying he could probably take them all down by himself, with Yuno nudging him with his elbow. Anyway, Julius would cough, <clears throat> announcing that they're going to start the exam. This is when King Clover, Augustus Clover, would show up saying that he'll take over, since he is royalty after all. King Clover would think about how he's going to win back his popularity with this move. As he announces that this tournament will take place with a team competition involving a crystal battle. A what? Asta would say. Ugh, oh, it sounds like a pain. The king would bite his tongue, annoyed at this little imp, wondering why he gets under his skin so much. This brat kind of reminds me of that other guy, the, the blonde one that Julius introduced to me. Ugh, he was just as annoying as this kid. Before he gets off track, the king would then explain, coughing as he had stopped talking for a while, that they'll be looking for an order of magic knights to join the royal knights. And the reason why they want to do this team competition is in order to test the teamwork of the Magic Knights, since they will be fighting a group of terrorists against the kingdom. So naturally, it made sense that they would all have to work together at least in some capacity. Anyway, I digress. Ulysses would reveal the teams, with Asta seeing that he's teamed up with Mimosa and someone called Xerx Lugner. Suddenly, a man with red hair, and he'd be wearing a purple orca's cloak would appear, being the last person to arrive. He would apologize for being late, with the Wizard King deciding to forgive him. Xerx, or I guess Zora, goes over to shake Asta's hand, since they are on the same team after all. Asta would think nothing of it, getting tricked as Zora puts a stink bug in Asta's hand. Asta would be disgusted as he then throws the bug away and asks if he's really planning to work on a team with him. Zora would laugh, saying that he's not planning to work at all with anyone, insulting Asta, saying, Asta is probably going to be the one holding them back the most, shrimp. Asta would sigh, saying he hasn't heard that one before, as he then asks if the teams are locked in and if Zora only came to mock everyone. The members of the Purple Orca squad would wonder if this person is really Xerx, since no one's even seen the Vice Captain for a long time. They've only heard rumors about his power. Asta wouldn't complain. Whatever. It's not like he needs a team anyway to take the other team down. Mimosa should be plenty of support for everything they need to do. You know and Noel will be on the same team as well. Magna and Sol, that being the Vice Captain of the Blue Rose Knights, as well as Klaus and Luck. Finner would also be on his own team, and Solid and Alec Dora, being Noel's siblings, would notice that they would be on the same team, explaining that they're going to have to take down Noel, proving that their magic and their noble status is superior to her. Anyway, you also begin the exam, the whole group heading over to the exam site. A magic knight from the Purple Orcas, that being Cobb Portaport, creates a portal that everyone is able to walk through, now at the site of the exam. Once there, Julius and Marx would reveal the bracket for the tournament. Noel and Solid would be fighting each other. 
Nola gulp, realizing that she has to fight her older brother. Can, can I really win? She'd be thinking, as she'd already be feeling negative thoughts. Fenrir will be having to face his own brother, his younger brother and the vice captain for the Golden Dawn. Elias would explain the rules saying that the teams will be fighting each other attempting to break the crystals on the battlefield that each team is protecting, and they can fight each other in any way they wish as long as they don't kill the other. Asa would sigh, now he has to weaken himself considerably. Asa lowering himself down to about 30% of his strength so as to not accidentally kill anyone in the fight. Asa's team would actually be in the first round. The enemy team being pissed off at Xerx or Zora for disrespecting the Wizard King. Asa wouldn't care, he's just excited to start the fight. With Zora insulting Asa saying that they should be scoping out the battlefield to see what the others are capable of. Asta ignoring him as he decides to go off on their own. Mimosa telling Asta to come back. Zora would get annoyed by this hot headed kid as Mimosa then lets him know that Asta really has a reason to be so confident, explaining that by himself, Asta almost killed the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun in a one on one fight. And to give reference, the Eye of the Midnight Sun's leader had more magic power than Captain Yami, who's one of the stronger magic knight captains. So basically, what I'm saying is. I've got this by myself, Asta would say. Asta wouldn't even need help from Zora or Mimosa as Mimosa cheers him on. Suddenly Asta would turn as the crystal is about to get attacked. Mimosa would try to block the crystal, but there's another attack about to crack it. This is long range magic. Asta wouldn't waste any time as he then summons his grimoire, telling them to just guard the crystal, he'll handle the fight, as Asta throws two swords out, that being his two anti-magic blades. Asta would throw them behind him as they land to the ground, as he tells Mimosa to hide the crystal behind his swords, almost forming a wall. Asta would then summon forth Lost Vein, coating it in anti-magic, as he then moves forward faster than Zora can even react, shocked, as Asta slices through the other team's crystal before they can launch off another attack, their crystal barely getting any damage, as the enemy teams would just fall apart under the anti-magic, in one clean strike. Whew, that is some speed, you used to be thinking, impressed with Asa's power, remembering Meliodas when he fought Meliodas one time. We go back in memory with Meliodas and Julius sparring, Julius wanting to see what Meliodas can do, as the Wizard King would battle this strange wanderer. We would see Elizabeth on the sidelines cheering Meliodas on, as Meliodas tells Julius he's not going to hold back. Julius gulping as he's ready to use his time magic. Melios would be wielding Lost Vein, the very same sword that his son was using now. As we see Meliodas summon some clones, Meliodas not going into his full power assault mode for obvious reasons, as he begins to fight Julius, sending clones forward. The memory would fade off before we see any more of the battle, but Julius would snicker, remembering Meliodas' insane speed. The other teams would be shocked, you know already trying to think of a way to counter Asta, and not coming up with anything yet. Asta's senses are incredible, his strength, speed, and power are all off the charts. And it's not like he doesn't have long range spells too. Asta can use his thousand divine cuts if he really can't get close to an enemy. And those flames burn so hot they can probably burn right through any wind I could cast, you know, be thinking. The final round was not looking to be pleasant. King Clover would be filled with rage, seeing how Asta had easily made quick work of those other magic knights. I couldn't even sense any magic power. What was he doing? Some kind of trick? He'd be thinking. Asa would thank Mimosa for guarding the crystal as he then picks up his other swords, throwing them back easily as they fall into his grimoire, his grimoire then sealing back up tightly as it goes back to his wayside. Zora would choose to be cautious with this kid, realizing that he's way more powerful than he could have imagined. He couldn't sense any magic power from him before at all, so how is he so strong so fast? Owen, the doctor who would be on the field for anyone, would offer Asta some healing as Asta holds his hand up saying no need. Asta holding out his left arm as he activates his angelic half, and simply healing himself and his magic power. I'll just let myself regenerate for a few minutes before the next round. This would be when Asta sees the next team being Magna and Sol about to fight, and a third person being Kirsch Vermilion. Mimosa would cover her face saying that's her, her brother and she just wishes he'd disappear, being super embarrassed from him. Kirsch complains about how this world is so full of non-beautiful people, commenting on Asta's ugliness, saying that he only has one wing? Look how half and lopsided he is. 
I also would fall over from this comment saying, but but I do have two wings. I just, I'm not using the other one right. No, 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 not as beautiful as me, Kirsch would say. I'm jumping around with just flowers appearing beside him. Mimosa wants to die at this point. Anyway, Sol Magna would tell him to shut up, with Kirsch ignoring them and continually talking about his beauty. <clears throat> Going full Janice Charles mode right there. Kirsch would then notice Mimosa and greet her. Mimosa would go tell him to kill himself. As Kirsch would fall over, she calls him gross, walking away. Kirsch would beg Mimosa to come back. Asa turning and walking off saying, yeah, what she said. Mimosa makes a hmm, sound telling her brother to go in a hurry and win his match so that Asa can go crush him in the next round. Kirsch, Magna, and Sol would easily win their round with Kirsch forcing his control using his magic over the other two, just like he would have in the original. Asta actually being quite impressed with this use of magic. Kirsch having a ton of magic power, but still wasting a lot of it. Soon the third fight would begin, with this being pretty much a filler fight. Leopold suggesting their magic be the linchpin of the fight. Anyway, Finral would use his ability with his spatial magic to try and do his best to defend his side, with Leopold eventually winning. Basically the same result as what happened in the original anime. Anyway, the crowd would be talking, impressed with Finral's unique ability and how useful he was a spatial magic, not having seen anyone use support spatial magic like that before. Longer should be listening in on the crowd. Hearing what the crowd had said about his older brother, he remained silent, gritting his teeth. The teams would talk about how they should have a nice meal after this, since they actually worked on some good teamwork. Leopold suggesting an eating contest, Finral saying he personally isn't up for it. Soon the fourth fight would begin with Langris being on this team, with him and Seke also being together in one party. Langris using his spatial magic to destroy Team H's crystal, announcing his team as the winner. Asta would be shocked seeing the destructive nature of Langris' spatial magic, wondering if he can even counter that with anti-magic, how that would work. Asta already working on counter plans, noticing the speed of the attack, thinking he could probably outblitz Longris in terms of speed. He could even use his clones using Lost Vanor to distract Longris so that he can't be attacked all at once. That could also be pretty effective. As Longris heads back, he would then tell Finral to watch out, explaining that his older brother's magic is just a delivery service, while Longris's is a vacuum, able to destroy all of the void. He warns Finral not to get caught in his magic since he could take his whole body away. But if I did that, it would probably make our parents, along with her, sad. Finral would go cold as he remembers Miss Finnis. Finral responds by acting, saying that won't happen since he will be defeating Longris here. Longris grits his teeth, responding to Finral that he's acting all high and mighty now, huh? For someone who ran away. The two brothers obviously having a battle with each other on and off the field. Charming would be making lunch for everyone, having come to support Yuno, know, who she still has a crush on this timeline, just so you all know. Both Captain Rill and Lux battles would go by pretty quickly in the anime, with the two looking forward to fighting each other. It's finally time for Yuno and Noelle's fight, with them fighting against Solid, Noelle's older brother. Noelle would take defensive, while Yuno would take forward, deciding that he'll be the one to take this out, like a fast intrepid wind, similar to how Asa's technique was in his round. Anyway, Yuno would launch a spell at Team O, Team O easily dodging out of the attack. Dimitri Prince launching a spell at Team P, that being Noelle and Yuno's team for reference. Noelle would counter this by putting up a barrier using her Dragon Sea Lair, and successfully protects the crystal. Solid would laugh, saying it's impressive she can even maintain a spell like that, saying that her magic control has suddenly improved for some reason. However, Elector would suddenly use a spell absorbing Noelle's barrier, you know, quickly flying back in spirit dive, grabbing Noelle and the crystal and escaping. You know, would tell Noelle that he'll head out to the crystal of Team O if Noelle and N can protect their own. Noelle asks you to let her go, as you know drops Noelle down from the sky. Noelle getting ready to take out the crystal. You know, wonders if she can really do it, hearing from Asa that Noelle is actually pretty amazing, as he decides to put his faith in Asta, and in Noelle by extension. Asta be confronted by Alec Dora, who would be pissed off that Yuno is disrespecting Captain Vengeance like this. He had such high expectations for Yuno, and, and Yuno claimed that he would become the captain of the Golden Dawn someday. Such arrogance. I can't let it stand within my squad, he would say, as Yuno would then hold his hand forward ready for battle. Yuno would easily take on this threat, using his power and spells, 
thinking about how Asta would be way more of a threat in the later rounds. Noelle eventually taking the crystal out and taking the victory. Soon it was time for Kirsch's match against Mimosa and Asta, saying that he's going to take out the filth that Mimosa decides to hang around so she can continue to be beautiful. Mimosa gritting her teeth as she tells Asta not to hold back. Huh? Are, are you sure? Yeah, she says. Kill him. Oh, my beloved sister. Kill him. Now. Asta would gulp as he says, uh, okay, 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 calm, calm down, Mimosa, as the match would begin. Kirsch covering their entire side of the field with a cloak. A cloak of magic that nothing could seemingly get through. As Mimosa looks to Asta, nodding. Asta would gulp as he pulls out his sword, the demon destroyer, his largest blade. As using his pure physical strength, he just swipes down with full power, causing such a burst of wind that the entire cloud is brushed away like nothing. Not even having used a ton of anti-magic, just from that single strike. Asta would lure Kirsch away, flying up into the sky, using both wings as he tells Kirsch to come get him if he's so high and mighty above him. Asta would then pull his eye down, telling him to come at him, Kirsch flying up to him, and Asta then putting his swords away, using purely his fists. Asta would steal some of Bond's technique, remembering how he had used Fox Hunt. Instead, Asta would use anti-magic, covering his fists with it, as he throws punches at Kirsch, who wouldn't be fast enough to get out of the way, as he drains Kirsch's magic slowly, eventually knocking him out as he punches him to the ground, sending him flying into a crater, Dragon Ball Z style. Huh, I'll have to thank Mr. Bond for that later, Asta would say. As Mimosa would then confront Sol using her magic flower cannon, blasting off her golem and sending her flying to the ground. It would be up to Zoro, back at the cave, to take over. It would be up left to Asa to fight both Magna and Kirsch at the same time. Kirsch already being out for the count, Magna would be trying his best to attack Asta, who would just with his bare fist be brushing off the fireballs. Anyway, Asta is just too much of an overwhelming force, being basically above a Magic Knight captain, that it would be up to Mimosa and Zoro to destroy the crystal, which they would in almost no time, Asta holding off the other members of the other team. After the match, Asta would comment that Zoro actually can work in a team, saying he did a good job. Zoro would sigh at the compliment, Mimosa thanking Asta for his help and taking down that stupid older brother of hers. Asta nodding, saying he gets why she's so annoyed by him. Anyway, the match that everyone in this video who's made it to this point has been waiting for is finally here. Finral vs. Longris. It basically happens just like the original, as Langris is abusing the other team. Fenrir is surprisingly able to keep up just a little bit, Langris being even more angered by this. Sekiro would be teleported to the Black Bull's headquarters where Yami is currently arguing with Bon, as the two are about to throw a punch at each other, Seke teleporting right in between them as he gets full power blasted from both Bon and Yami, all of his teeth falling out as he falls to the ground, the two thinking, oops. This would be when Langris gets more angry, as Finral explains how his magic works and how he's just going to teleport Langris away, saying he doesn't want to hurt his younger brother. Langris gets pissed using his grimoire, saying that it's not like he's going to fall to him as he begins to prepare a spell. We see a flashback of both Finral and Langris' past, how the parents of the both of them favored Langris' his entire life how he was treated superior, how Finral was treated as a failure. Finral seeing the darkness in his younger brother would then use a spell similar, telling Langris he won't let him fall like this. And Langris would call him a coward, calls Finral a coward for running away from home. Langris tells Finral to stop acting like his older brother as he launches his spell. Finral says he's going to stop Langris using his own as the spells begin to clash, seeing the spatial magic attack. This would be Finral's loss, as his crystal is destroyed, Finral wounded on the ground. Leopold, who had been out of the way, had successfully taken out Longris' crystal, but the officials would announce Team G to be the winner of the match. As Longris is standing over Finral, Longris would begin to think about how people comment on how the two are so different. Longris wondering always why Finral was so nice to him, and why his parents were only kind to him and not his older brother. Longris prepares to finish Finral off, and as he holds his hand up for a spell, all of the black bulls would react, Asta sensing the bloodlust. Magna, Luck, Asta would suddenly appear, Asta ripping through the wind, activating 100% power as he has lost fame summoned to his hand. Magna standing in front of the baseball bat aflame, Luck in full lightning mode, as Asta has his demon mark activated, his eyes filled with malice, his dark power remanating over the land, as his blade is at Longris' neck. 
Asura whispered into Longris' ear, The match is over. What's wrong? Longris. Longris would feel the power against his neck. Just one simple quick strike and it'd be over. There'd be no way that he could outspeed Asura from this close of a distance or the other two who are right in front of him. Fenrir would be unconscious as he would stand down. Ulysses would appear along with Marks and Owen, who begin to heal Finral. Ulysses tells Longris that he can't trust a man who goes easy on his comrades, but he can't trust someone even more who would willingly kill them. Austin pulls his blade back, reminding Longris what Finral had said the last time they had met, saying that Finral is a far better magic knight than Longris will ever be. Walking away, Longris gets pissed at Asa, commenting how Asa is so full of himself for making it this far, thinking that trash like him just because he has a little special power means that he's better than any noble. Longris would ask for permission to fight Asta. Longris would then attack Asta with a spell, Asta easily turning as he sees the spatial magic, saying weak, as Asta suddenly uses a thousand divine cuts, slashing through the spatial magic, burning it away with an infinite hell flame. Longris would be scared and upset, as Marks asked them, telling them they should stop. Julius, the Wizard King, would tell him to continue, knowing that Asta is far stronger than Longris. Longris says he never liked Asta since they first met, saying that he's just someone who thinks he's special just because he worked a little harder than some other peasants, some other rat trash to get higher up on the ladder saying that he'll always be stronger than Asta, beginning to laugh. King Clover, seeing this unofficial match, would be angry, trying to use a boundary spell on the bow for them. But even Longris and his rage would be able to dispel this, Asta turning and easily punching off the spell, as the two look at each other with malice. In Ulysses' mind, telling Asta to teach Longris a lesson of humility. The battle would begin, as we see Asta now using a single hand against Longris, who began blasting spatial magic as he tries to move back out of Asta's reach. Asta wouldn't even use his speed, as he quickly summons clones of Lost Vein, tanking the attacks, using them as shields. What is that? Well, how can you use that magic? He'd be saying, as Longris is getting more and more insane. Asta would then pull himself back, as he reveals 100% of his power activating his full Demon King, Angelic King mode, King of the Void. Both sides of him begin to illuminate as we see an infinite darkness and light, a perfect yin and yang, 100% magical power. The entire area began to crack as vibrations just like back then would begin to shake off of Asa's body, reverberating around the area and even further out into the kingdom as the sky began to darken, turning to a light gray. The great color beginning to envelop everything, as Longris wouldn't even be able to see in front of him getting nauseated, purely from this insane amount of power he's feeling, as Asta then bends his knees, looking into Longris' eyes as he simply quickly pulls Lost Vein out of its sheath for a split of an instant. Suddenly, Longris would look down as there's blood on his hands. What? what Asta's more than a hundred meters away. How did- Longris would fall over, a pool of blood beginning to fall out of him, as Asta tells the others that Owen should go over and heal him if they don't want him to die. Asta would deactivate his power, saying that it's over. As everyone on the field, even the king himself, would let out a sigh of relief. Everyone had been holding their breath. The moment Asta had gone full power, even Julius stopped, the wizard king being amazed, wondering if Asta might even be stronger than his dad. Julius having only fought Meliodas once in assault mode, never having even seen Meliodas' true 100% power, like what Asta had just revealed. Asta then realized that Bon and Merlin and his mom would probably have felt that, hoping none of them run over here worried that something big just happened, as Asta sighs. Noel and the other Golden Dawn members would be impressed. A ton of the Black Bulls would be impressed too, with them and having most of them never having seen Asta in this full power mode. Longris would have fallen unconscious before the blade had even struck, from over a hundred meters away, a physical attack. That's how fast Asta moved. Asta was definitely confirmed to be one of the strongest beings within the Clover Kingdom, at least one that was known about. The rest of the matches would continue on as normal, with Asta being confirmed to be a royal knight by the king immediately. Everything that he had said about Asta before this point would never come out of his mouth ever again realizing just how powerful this kid really was. Even without sensing magic power, the pure physical strength emanating off of Asta was enough to give everyone in there a heart attack. The only one who could even maybe fight Asta would probably be Julius using his time magic. 
And so the trials would come to an end as the Clover King would announce that he'll be letting everyone who passed know about the Royal Knights and when they'll be setting their strike attack on the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Asuin Nod, already knowing that he got in, as he then waits for Finral, saying he's going to go away and see how he's recovering, seeing if he can help using his angelic magic. Asa then going with Julius to where Finral is. When Asa had released 100% power earlier, not only did he, Bon, Merlin, and his mother feel it, but someone else did too. Ah yes, my time of awakening's almost here. I can feel the magic power over me. So strong, so strong, master. I can't believe his majesty wants me to fight my young lord, young Lord Astaroth. Zagreus would say, excited in preparation to be able to fight a demon, but not just any demon, a demon royal. Zagreus would be excited under the orders of his lord and master, Demon King Meliodas. The day has arrived as the royal knights had all gathered together, with them now beginning to plan their strike to attack the Eye of the Midnight Sun. They had arrived. Aside from Asta, everyone would be wearing long cloaks, as we see a huge group of mages on broomstick, riding as they approach a huge stone floating in the sky, this being one of the strong mana zones. The Royal Knights would have arrived at the Gravito Rock Zone. Meryl Leona would inform the Royal Knights what kind of place this area is, saying that it's one of the most powerful magic zones in the Clover Kingdom, on the border of the Clover Kingdom and the Diamond Kingdom. Mirelliona would then ask Nozelle why he had his squad check out this place. Nozelle would call one of his subordinates forward, Siren, and ask him to create a model of the zone. Siren's able to create a full-scale model of the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, and all the members located inside. So that's the kind of magic you use, huh? Interesting. Anyway, after figuring out where the leader may be out of all these magic traces, Mirelliona would say that they'd split off into teams. Asta and Zora then being sent off with the same team as Mariona. Zora commenting about how Mariona hanging around commoners? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? His obvious hatred of royals still peering through, his father's death still being the royals' fault in his eyes. Mariona would explain that she doesn't care about social status, it's all about strength and power. And Zora and Asta are here because they're strong. Mariona would then order the squad to enter the base. Asta would smirk as he says, Let's do this. Their war cry as they rush inside of the gravity zone, ready to attack the Eye of the Midnight Sun. Now inside the base, a member would be waiting, as we see one of the members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun cloaked torturing a woman. Luck would then rush into the room, smashing his fist covered with electricity into the member. Moreliana would have told her entire team, the Royal Knights, to fight as much as possible, cause destruction and havoc in the base. Anyway, the enemies would then begin to confront both Meriona and Nozel's teams, both of them easily being able to defeat them, thinking how weak they are, wondering, why are we being greeted by such weak members of this terrorist organization? They must not know who we are. They'd push forward, saying they're going to get vengeance for what they did to Fungolion. Elsewhere in the base, Raya, one of the Eye of the Midnight Sun's subordinates, says that he's going to go confront the enemy. A third eye manifesting on his forehead. The same eye that had appeared when Asta had fought one of the strongest members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun himself, what felt like ages ago. Nozel would push forward with his assault squadron, his teammates commenting about how none of the enemy or traps are even affecting them, Nozel's magic just being far above this level. Nozel would order one of his subordinates to use his special magic to make sure none of them can escape, locking off the zone with magic basically creating a barrier to all spatial magic, flight magic, and any other forms of escape. Elsewhere, Noel's team would be taking out enemies left and right, Kirsch commenting how he'd cast away his extravagant self, that being, as we remembered last time, Mimosa's incredibly annoying brother. Noel says that he's still creepy though, shutting him down. Luck would be defeating enemies as well, commenting how they're going to be able to boast about to the captain once they get back home of course. Klaus would be with the Team Yuno's location, listening to the members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun talk about their true forms, Mimosa noticing these odd patterns on the wall. So almost immediately, Yuno would hear something, stopping his movement. Asta and Zora would be commenting about how the Eye of the Midnight Sun's efforts are all useless when Mariona is easily defeating them. At this rate, I might not even have to fight, he'd say. Suddenly, two Astas would appear, Mariona setting both of them on fire. The real Asta wouldn't even do anything, just tanking it, thinking, huh? Is something tickling me? 
while the other would try and douse out the flame and heal himself. The other Asta being Raya, the one member of the Eye of the Midnight Sun capable of such transformation. He would then ask Marilino, saying that he would love to go offer a drink of her if she wasn't royalty. She would reply by promptly feeding Raya all the flames of hell that he would like. Raya would easily take this as he says he's already drank the flames as he launches one of Yami's spells at Marilona, who easily destroys herself a punch, commenting how Yami's are far more powerful. She would then use a spell to set Raya aflame on the outside, burning him to death slowly. She recognizes that in order to have these abilities, the ability to withstand flame like this, he must have been the one to have to have killed Fungolion. Mareliona would then use a mana zone. Raya would summon one of Asta's swords, Lost Vein, a copy, a cheap imitation, as he tries to make clones of himself, Mareliona easily defeating him and destroying the sword. Asta would be cheering her on clapping, as Raya would just be thinking that he's done for. Anyway, back to Yuno. You know had taken out some of the members of the other man's son, continuing to the base, wondering what that weird feeling was. You know, using his mana zone as well. As they continue more into the base, you know can hear an odd pulse, like a heartbeat. Back at the Black Bull's base, Gosh, along with Grey, and Gordon would be fighting off zombies. Raids, the guy who had originally attacked the capital all those months ago, had been passing by on another errand and decide that they just destroy the Black Bull's base for fun. Ghost tries to attack with his mirror magic, but Sally uses her gel to divert the spell. Sally says that they were ordered not to kill Ghost, and Ghost remembered that his magic doesn't work on Sally. Now they have to think of another plan. Yami had left already, so it was just them. This is when Henry would intervene, with Ghost, Grey, and Gordon being called out by this strange person. Asta being the only person who actually knew of Henry. Henry uses the base to fight them off, punching Sally Salamander and defeating number zero of raid zombies. But somehow the Salamander would be unaffected, pulling itself back up, as Sally uses another artifact to increase the gel's fluidity, covering the entire base. The rest of the Black Bulls would rush over to Henry, saying that the spell's too big. Ghost uses his magic mirror to create multiple greys, grey using that magic to convert Sally's gel magic to plants. Gordon then uses a spell to destroy Sally's spell, and then raids his number zero attack Ghost. Eventually, this fight of cat and mouse working out with raids failing, the other midnight sun trying to escape through one of Valtos' portals, Ghost wondering why they were even here to begin with. Yami would be at the Golden Dawn's base, summoned away, waiting for William, wondering why he had been summoned here. While he is distracted and kept busy at the Golden Dawn, the kingdom's capital, Julius, is now waiting, watching the city, when William shows up. What's wrong, William? Julius would say. William thanks him for all of this time, removing his helmet. His woman expresses how deep his respect for Julius is. Julius is embarrassed to hear all that, saying that he's proven himself more than enough times to be quite loyal to him. William would go on to explain that he is another person that he treasures, and it's incredibly hard to choose between them. So, that's why I let my two friends choose. As suddenly, William's scars on his face begin to heal, as William turns into Licht. <sighs> Thanks, William. As Licht would introduce himself to Julius. Tch, <laughs> I didn't want it to be true. My own captain betraying me. Julius remembering how he and Yami had been suspicious of William. Licht would introduce himself to Julius. Julius would recognize that there's two souls sharing a single body. Julius would ask about the scar on his face, Licht replying that the scar is a curse that doesn't affect him, it affects William's soul. Licht also explains how William understands his hatred of humans, and that this is the only way to quell it, the two of them being partners. Licht would tell Julius that it was foolish to have sent that boy away saying that now he can kill Julius, take the magic stones and escape, saying the only threat is hundreds of miles away. <laughs> William's quite a kind man. I'll have to win for him so that way I can get rid of you. Lift replies that Julius is going to die here. Julius will take responsibility of all the sins of the Glover Kingdom. As he attacks him with a huge light spell, Julius easily countering the spell, saying, that he's not unable to counter light magic. Julius's time and Lick's light being able to counter each other. This would be when Julius would dodge out of the way, Lick thinking of a good counterattack, 
Julius would use his time edge to predict the future, dodging out of the way. Licht would quickly get behind Julius using a short sword, slashing at him and wounding him. <laughs> Just as I thought, there is a limit to your time magic. This explains how his time magic finally works. How he can use time to heal himself, reversing it. Lulu is saying that even though he was born with the magic to steal others' futures, he plans to create a future of no discrimination. Lulu is saying that he's not going to die until his dream is accomplished. That petty dream will never come true after I kill you. Julius dodges again from another blast of light, Licht getting behind him, as Julius teleports then again behind Licht. Licht thinking about how Julius' foresight has increased, it's accelerating. Licht tries to attack, but Julius easily counters it. Julius telling Licht that he can already see Licht's future, and there's no way that he'll be winning against him. People begin to notice the battle in the skies above the royal capital. Marx, who wishes to help, wouldn't be able to, knowing he'd just get in the way. As he informs the other captains about the battle, Yami immediately knowing he's been tricked departs the Golden Dawn's headquarters, moving at max speed to get to the fight in time. Meanwhile in the battle, Lick launches a huge sword at Julius. Julius easily dodges out of the way, catching the blade. As he sends the spell back, managing to cut Lick by accelerating the time of the speed, accelerating the momentum on the sword faster as it slashes Lick's cheek. Julius then appears behind Lick and tries to catch him back, trying to lock him but I'd like to dodge it. He began to wonder what kind of person Julius is, asking Julius what his grimoire is like, what a person like the Wizard King, what is within it. Julius would smirk, pointing upward, as Lick would look to the skies, seeing hundreds of pages all flowing in a circle, like a clock, moving over and over again. Julius explaining that his grimoire, it's so different and unique, he began questioning himself even after obtaining it. A book without end, huh? Does that mean that I'm a person without end? Or that I nearly never had a start to begin with? Licked would smirk saying that Julius might actually be a challenge after all. Having two walls of defense in the Clover Kingdom, they're the last stronghold against what they're going to do. Julius says that he'll protect the kingdom with his life and the people behind it. And if the fate of the world of his world, the Clover Kingdom rests upon the shoulders of that young boy, then so be it. Licht would dodge his attack, as he then uses a spell to release the seal on his body, preparing a huge spell to attack the city, saying he's going to punish all of humankind. Yami would arrive at the capital, wondering if Yulis is alright, and he sees Licht's spell. <laughs> How much mana does this guy have? Yulis would say, smiling. He wonders if Licht plans to unleash on all the citizens. Licht saying he's just going to kill everyone except Julius, and launches the spell. Julius thinks of how he had found his purpose as a magic knight, remembering having met Zora's father, Zara, how he had been a true magic knight, sacrificing himself in order to change things. Zara had been killed. He had been killed because he was a commoner, because in this world the weak die and the strong live. Lulis would then use a spell to protect the kingdom, erasing a lick's spell and using all of his magic. Yami would reach there just in time, as he watches Lick pierce Julius with a sword of light, commenting on how being the Wizard King is your weakness. If you had let them die, he would have lived and you could have easily killed me. Yami's mouth be gaping as he sees Julius fall to the ground. Lick taking the magic stones. Hey, asshole, Yami would say, confronting Lick, confusing him for William. Licht would turn, introducing himself to Yami, saying that William's currently asleep. Yami notices Marks and tells him to go help. Go save Julius! Licht would then tell him that the Wizard King is beyond saving. Valdos would suddenly appear from a portal. Yami tries to attack Licht, but Licht would escape through the portal faster than Yami could attack. Yami runs forward, cradling Julius, as Julius compliments Yami's spell. Julius saying that he's at ease. Asta, no. The next generation will be able to carry his hopes and his dreams. Back at the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, Asta, Meliona, and Zora would continue their assault, fighting Raya. This would be when Asta would come to realize that they're not so different, understanding the discrimination the elves had experienced, learning about what happened. Raya would notice and comment on Asta being similar to the first magic emperor from long ago, Asta himself being from two worlds as well, a demon and an angel. Raya says that it's too late for this to stop, 
as Licton Valtus would appear before the stone tablet in the base that will accept the magic stones and bring rise to a new world. As the magic stones are placed within the tablet, Helios tells Yami that Licht has something else planned. The leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun is capable of killing everyone in the capital all by himself. Hell, the whole kingdom. There's something else up their sleeve. You have to go there. You have to save the kingdom. Yami remembers the time he had worked for Julius under the Great Deer, as he agrees to Julius's final wish. Julius commenting that he was so happy he was able to meet so many kinds of people and see so many kinds of magic. As he closes his eyes for the last time, Yami would stand, saying that they will protect the kingdom. No tears would come out. Yami's mind would immediately go on how he's going to punish William and that guy licked. They're going to pay for what they did to Julius. At the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, Yino's group would have pushed into the main room, finding a floating tree, the Tree of Life Monument Stone. He activates it, placing the last stone into place. Everyone's excited about what's going to happen. Like reveals everything that he told his comrades that was all a lie, and that he finds them all disgusting to the humans who had been working for him. Licked placing a final stone to the monument as his true plan begins. The light reaches the base. The person that was floating in the center of the room had awoken. Mimosa and Yuno's group being terrified. This person having so much magic power. We, we need to run, she'd say, turning to Yuno, as they notice that Yuno is glowing. Within Licked's memories, we see Patoli, that being the actual elf who had been reincarnated alongside William's body. He remembers how Licht had originally obtained his first four-leaf look clover grimoire. He'd gone to meet with Licht on how the humans might attack them. Licht laughing and saying that they're just afraid of them. Saying that they're capable of understanding us. There, there could be a way for us to grow closer to each other. A tornado would appear as Licht and a human would easily stop the tornado. Licht saving the woman who was trapped in it. This being Tetia. Tetia's brother also has a four-leaf clover, a grimoire just as powerful as Licht's. Licht would become friends with the two, as she would have gotten closer to Tetia, this leading to the relationship between them. Patoli wondering how Licht could spend time with humans, this leading to the development that elves and humans are actually capable of working together. And this is when Licht and Tetia would be revealed to have a child. This would be the first time an elf and a human would be together, the coronation of two royals. But it would not be happy, the memory burning into his mind as the wedding would have been attacked. They would all die. He would see Lit standing up in his final moments casting a spell, and as he fits off into death, he notices that he looks just like Lit, but is in a human body. Patoli would have figured out that Lit had cast reincarnation magic, and that it wasn't only him who had been reincarnated. Patoli retrieves a grimoire for himself and plans to become licked, enacting revenge upon the humans for what they had done. He had gathered the magic stones to reincarnate the rest of the elves. Valto, Sally, and Ray to be confused about what he had just said. Ray's accusing Patoli of fooling them. This was all a lie. Patoli says that they've been marked as sacrifices for forbidden magic, as he had given them their true names. Valtos would ask if they were ever comrades. The fake licked lying as he smiles, saying that. They're comrades, all right. Precious sacrifices to revive my fallen comrades. As the members of the Eye of the Midnight Sun suddenly begin to die, the Royal Knights will be wondering what's happening as they're all falling to the ground. People across the Clover Kingdom will begin to glow, as people in the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base also begin to glow in color. Asa would ask what's going on, and Raya would simply reply in the time's up for the humans. Mimosa wondering what's happening. Klaus will be glowing, telling Mimosa to be silent since she is not one of them. Klaus, Yuno, and Hamon have become elves, the Yuno squad. As the revived elves begin to attack the humans, Patoli comments about how it's time for revenge against all the humans, and how his resurrection had begun. Noel wonders what's happening to Luck and Ben, Kirsch recognizing this mana being the same sinister mana that Longris had during the exam. Now Ryu would be glowing, his magic power tripling, as Zora asks Asta what they're going to do. Asa would say that he's going to find a path forward. Meriona, I'll deal with this. Suddenly, he really would crash into the room with a huge creature, introducing himself to Raya as Lyra. Zora and Meriona would think that Rill is somehow similar to Raya, and the spell is also affecting him, as their mana would be so high, their power having increased. Asa would tell Lyra that they're friends, that he's one of the magic knights. 
I would never be friends with a human, Lyra would say. Lyra, in Rill's body, of course, attacks Zora, Asta, and Meliona, but Asta would easily counter using anti-magic. When he tries to erase the mana coming out of Rill's body, slashing him, it wouldn't work, as Rill comments that hurt, trying to push Asta back. They would escape, Meliona you know, telling them to let them get away. They have bigger fish to fry. Asta would just wipe them all away using his power, as the elves would be unconscious. Asta would grit his teeth thinking about what a hypocrite he is, saying that he could have understood them, that they could have worked together. But no. He just had to brute force it again. Come on, let's go take them down, Asta would say, pushing through with Meliona and Zora, who wouldn't understand why Asta sounds so sad. Meanwhile, Mimosa had been captured, as Asta would push through with his group, making it down to the bottom floor, as they would see Yuno, Hamon, Klaus, and other elves gathering. As Asta would then jump down, slashing with his sword as he pushes them all back. Yuno, you awake in there? Would I have to kick your ass? You would wake up saying he's going to become the Wizard King. Asta punching him in the head saying, of course he's not going to be the Wizard King, since I'm going to be the Wizard King, pointing at himself. He, he isn't fully reincarnated, the elves would say, noticing that Yuno's elf self would have still not awakened yet. They would go with their full power trying to attack Asta and the rest of the group, saying they need to free Yuno of his memories. Asta easily blocking the spell of his bare fists. Yuno himself blocking another spell that was going towards Zora. As Mimosa and Raya are shocked that Asta and Yuno are actually winning against the elves, Asta would look up feeling this intense pressure. What is... what is that, he'd be thinking, as he sees someone floating. It's... it's that guy that I fought before- no, no it can't be, he's... he's so strong! As the elves begin to fall, Licked, the real Licked, would suddenly teleport, catching them as they fall. Asta would pull out Lost Vein and the Demon Dweller Sword, Licked noticing this, as he runs forward and takes Asta's Demon Dweller Sword before he can even react. Licked attacking and managing to send both Asta and Yuno flying into a wall. This guy's nothing like what I had fought before. How? How can he use my sword like that? It has anti-magic in it, he shouldn't be able to- Suddenly the sword would be right about to pierce Asta's right in the eye. As Asta barely dodges out of the way in time, the sword plowing through the stone as it slams all the way into the back. Licked easily pulling it out and slashing at Asta again, practically ignoring Yuno. Yuno know would enter spirit dive as he tries to attack, using his full power of Sylph and his own and his elf power, but Licked would simply block out the Demon Dweller sword, knowing that in Licked's mind he has to get rid of this threat first. No, I won't be defeated like this, Asta would say, as Asta tries to power up to 100%, his demon and angel wings growing, but oh sorry, too slow. Licked would cut off both of Asta's wings as he screams, falling to the ground, Asta's magic power being cut off. As Asta's eyes turns white, he he didn't have enough time to power up, there's there's no way. Asta would have barely enough time to tell everyone to run, as Licked would stab Asta in the heart, Asta coughing up blood. Asta's thoughts would simply be that I, I underestimated him as Licked would have Asta hanging off of the end of his sword. Anyway, today I had left you guys, and last time in part 15, on a pretty big cliffhanger, so I think we should start from there. Now, let's see, where was I? Ah, yes, Asta was hanging off the end of Licked's sword. Having just pierced him through the heart and severed his wings, we return to the Eye of the Midnight Sun arc. Let's get into it. This is a tale of ancient times, an era before the human and non-human worlds would forever be divided. In the kingdom of Leonis, there was a legendary order of knights, known as the Seven Deadly Sins. Dragon Sin Meliodas and Princess Elizabeth one day would come to have a son in a faraway land called the Clover Kingdom, and his name was Asta. After enduring thousands of years of torture, Meliodas and Elizabeth had escaped to this new kingdom, but what had become of the other Seven Deadly Sins, and what had become of Meliodas? Now, Asta is a magic knight in the Clover Kingdom, defends the kingdom with his power to fight off the Eye of the Midnight Sun, all in order to achieve his ultimate dream, to become the Wizard King. Uh, Asta! You know his words would catch in his throat, as we see Licked piercing Asta through the chest, right through Asta's heart, as we see the Demon Dweller Sword poking out through Asta's body onto the other side. You know would be horrified. If this guy's stronger than Asta, then... then we're screwed, Yuno would be thinking. 
Licked would flick his sword, Asa's body getting sent flying across the room. Asa's body making a loud crash as it rams into the stone walls. Asa would lie there motionless for a bit, unconscious. You know now charging at Licked, about to attack. As Licked would turn, simply making eye contact with Yuno. You know stopping still in his tracks. Licked would take the Demon Dweller Sword, leaving the Demon Destroyer Sword with Asta. One of Licked's subordinates, Raya, would then comment that Licked may as well just destroyed the Scrimmar and swords. Licked would reply, simply saying that those swords no longer belong to himself. Uh, I see. Which would be his reply. The elves would then use spatial magic to meet their other comrades and go and destroy the humans in the entire kingdom. While Yuno is still shocked that Licked had just killed Asta, Asta would suddenly sit up as he starts patting his chest. As he sees a glowing light on Asta's hand, he starts to heal himself. Ah, oh, man, that hurt, Asta would say. You know, be screaming. You you just got stabbed in the heart. How, how are you alive? You know, his eyes bulging out. Insert the Enaru One Piece meme here. Asta would turn saying that, didn't he know that all higher level demons have seven hearts? If that guy really wanted to kill me, he would have had to do that at least six more times. Asta, after patching the skin and the flesh over the hole on both sides, would pull himself up, now jumping up as he then grabs the demon destroyer sword and throws it into his grimoire, saying he's going to have to figure out what that does later. Walking over to Yuno, he'd tell him that this time he's going to go 100% from the beginning, as Asta slowly closes his eyes, activating his 100% power. Now Asta's wings begin to grow this time, not being slashed off by a licked, as Asta opens his eyes, both of his eyes having changed color, and now a huge wave of pressure coming off of him, as Asta squeezes his fists. <laughs> there. That guy's not gonna hold a candle to me next time I see him, Asta would say. I'm not gonna let him do that ever again. You know when Asta would then leave the dungeon, as they see the destruction now having gone on outside. Zora would inform Asta what had happened inside the dungeon, Asta asking what happened to Mariliona, when he knows that she's actually still unconscious. Nozel and En would show up explaining what had happened to their comrades, along with how they had luckily managed to escape. As Nozel's about to use a healing artifact, Asta would then hold his hands up saying he already healed everyone. Asta reminding him that he can use healing magic. Suddenly Nozel would start to get reports from his fellow squadmates that there's attacks happening all around the kingdom. And now, we have to go defend them. Nozel says that they have to save the kingdom, and even if they have to kill their comrades in the process who had been taken over by the elves. Noel would say that they're going to save everyone and their friends, saying that if they're really magic knights, then they can accomplish the impossible. Nozel would make a clicking sound of his tongue, saying that's naive, as the royal knights would then split up to go rescue the kingdom. Now Asta, along with Yuna, would head out to the village of Hodge, now Zora and the others taking care of the middle of the realm, the Forsaken Realm being left to Yuno and Asta. Asta and Yuno splitting up, with Asta taking Hodge, and Yuno starting on the other edge of the Forbidden Realm, with each of them being able to handle the entire ring around the kingdom by themselves. Asta would arrive in the city to find that nothing was wrong. Huh? He'd see his mom using her angelic powers, healing people on the streets, and he would see Bon holding up one of the royal knights who had transformed into an elf. Uh, uh Uncle Bon? Bon would look up saying hi, asking what Asta's doing out here. Asta's here? This would be when Elizabeth would turn around waving to her son, smiling, asking if he's willing to help them out. Asta would come down as she would explain that she's able to heal all the poison in their body, even the internal stuff, but, but since it's just her working on it, it's taking a little long. Asta would laugh saying, yeah, I get it, as he would help his mom using his healing powers, the two of them now working together, healing everyone in the village. Bon would laugh his ass off saying that he had been visiting Elizabeth, and when he was in her house they had heard something happen in the street, and they came outside and saw that guy was causing trouble, so, so Bon naturally took care of it, while Elizabeth started healing the people who had been poisoned. Asta would go check on Sister Lily, asking if she's alright, and also asking if she'd marry him again. Lily telling Asa he's so silly, as she blasts him with water. Asa would say, huh, well, that's rejection number 565. Eh, whatever. Once I become the Wizard King, it won't matter anyway, Asta would say. Asa would throw himself up, as Elizabeth would ask Asta if he's alright. Asa would nod, saying he has to get going if they're alright, and he would tell Bon that there's trouble going on all around the kingdom, with elves attacking the entire kingdom. Bon would say he'd go help out, as Elizabeth would be the last one left behind in town, Elizabeth giving her son a kiss on the cheek and telling him to be safe. 
Asa would turn waving to his mom as he then heads off, flying carrying Bond as they continue going around the Forsaken Realm, kicking all the elves who are out there and sending them flying, until they eventually would run into Yuno who had been sweeping the other side. The trio would then head further into the middle of the kingdom, now moving on into the common realm. Yuno would say he can sense two magic powers in different directions, telling Asta and Bond to go take care of it and he'll head further into the next realm. And as they nod, Bond starting to run off in the direction that Yuno pointed, Asta heading towards the other, since neither Bond nor Asta can sense you know, the magic powers in this world. Although Asta and Bond can sense each other. Elsewhere, Magna and Vanessa would arrive in town, wondering what's going on, and they would notice Luck. Magna would ask what the hell Luck's doing, the elf replying that this body no longer belongs to their former friend, but to him. Well, he also introduced himself as Lufulu. Lufulu charging, he'd miss both Magna and Vanessa, noticing Rogue. Rogue being the small red cat that Vanessa has that can change fate. Magna would then send numerous fireballs, flying at Luck. This would be when the one inhabiting Luck's body would say that those fireballs aren't going to hit them. Suddenly the flames would all vanish, but he could still sense them as he dodges all of them, saying that the humans are not going to defeat him, wondering if Magna can truly dodge his attack. Vanessa would pull Magna out of the way, which Magna would take that opportunity to throw more fire. Luck saying that the fireballs aren't going to hit him, the fireballs suddenly explode. Magna explaining this new spell, throwing more of them. Explaining these new timed charge balls. Magna would suddenly appear behind Luck as he throws another fireball. Luck easily turning around and catching it. As he says that he knows what Magna is capable of. The other fireball in Magna's hand would explode. Luck wondering what's happening. Magna would explain that Luck would have known what to do. That the original holder of that body is far stronger than he is. And Magna is that guy's equal. Magna would grab a hold of the elf, throwing more fireballs and hitting them and exploding them. Magna explains to Luck that he is the best there is at taking a beating, and hits Luck with another giant fireball. Magna then uses a huge spell of flame to restrain him, and explain how Luck will not be able to defeat him like this. Magna would say give Luck back, now. Lufulu would free himself by releasing a lightning bolt that crashes and breaks through the flame bond. Asta flying in the distance could actually see this huge discharge of lightning. Magna and Vanessa would see this huge power increase and be now nervous, not knowing if they can actually defeat him anymore. Luck would start laughing, asking how they plan to defeat him now. Magna would grit his teeth saying he's going to beat him until Luck wakes up. Magna preparing to throw a huge fireball, but Luck disappears. Suddenly, electricity would start to destroy the town. Magna would realize that he's moving at intense speed. Suddenly, Luck would strike at Magna, and he would miss. What? He would try and do it again, thinking that Magna must have dodged the blow. And again, he would miss. Damn it! What's going on? He would then realize, th that cat, it's, it's all her fault. I just have to take her down and then there'll be easy pickings. He begins thinking about how her spells work and eventually figures out about the ability to combine magic with fate. He wonders whose mana will give out first, and after a little bit, he'd finally manage to defeat Magna and Vanessa, commenting how that was much sooner than he thought. He'd hold his hands up saying that the whole kingdom will be destroyed. Magna and Vanessa would turn, telling him to shut up and give luck back. The elf would turn, saying that their idiocy is annoying him. You're not able to break reincarnation magic of a bond. Magna would then say, oh yeah? Then why are you crying? Magna tries to wake Luck up by explaining how strong he's gotten. Vanessa's saying that she's not going to let Luck be taken away. As he turns to go and kill Magna, suddenly Asta would appear. I won't let you kill my friends, he'd say. And I won't let you take them away either. Asta would then reach into his grimoire, pulling out the Demon Destroyer's sword, as he slashes at the elf. Suddenly, Luck's eyes would turn white as Asta casts the anti-magic through the blade, slicing the reincarnation magic and pulling it away from Luck's body. Lufalu's last thoughts would be thinking, he's, he's so fast, he might even be stronger than- And his voice would disappear, as Luck's body is now back in its rightful owner's hands. Uh, Asta, Magna would say. It's like I said, you're all my precious comrades, and that can never be taken away. As the elf's soul is leaving Luck's body, he remembers suddenly what Licht's friend had once said. 
how humans and elves could befriend each other, as his last final thoughts would be how he wished he had gotten to know humans like them. The magic is fully undone, and Luck would then get back up in his own body, saying that he is the Black Bull's comrade, so tears running down his face, remembering the image of his mother in his mind, and how he had almost gone to her instead of them. The person who had pushed him to perfection, and had ignited his lust for battle. Magna would hug Lux, saying that he's an idiot, but he's their comrade. Vanessa now joining the hug, Asta cheering. Luck, you're, you're back. And I guess with this sword, I can, I can save everyone. Vanessa and Magna would ask Asta about the new sword, as he replies that the sword is capable to undo the reincarnation magic. I, I think the sword is capable of removing one's mana from their very soul. Asta would say that the elves were not bad guys to start with. I can, I can feel it, he'd say. Luck replies saying that he agrees that the elves were truly kind, and that he felt happiness when Luflu was released. Asta says he's going to save everyone else with this sword, as Vanessa and Magna would be confused by Asta's everyone comment. Oh, yeah, uh, you guys didn't get that part. Asta would reveal that the elves had taken over hundreds of people within the kingdom, anyone who had enough mana to be capable of hosting the elf souls. Vanessa would tell Asta about the light they had saw in the distance and that they should be heading to their base, which Luck replies that he'll handle that. Luck, with Vanessa's help, along with the strength he had gained from his time being an elf, his awakening, brings everyone to the base. Once they arrive at the base's location, they notice that the base is completely destroyed, wondering what happened. There they'd find Gordon, Gray, and Henry. Maya noticing Henry and wondering who that is when trying to get closer to him. But he would then drop to the ground after all of his mana would be sucked out by Henry's curse. Magna in this dazed state would say that Henry's an enemy, his eyes are now all dizzy. Asta would then quickly say that Henry's not an enemy, saying that he was able to meet him at the base before, saying that he's the one who manages the Black Bull's base. Magna still won't get it even after everyone explaining it to him. Everyone would explain to him that Ghosh had turned to an elf and then headed off to the capital after destroying the base. Vanessa says they have to go after Ghosh, but mostly everyone's out of mana. That is, except Asta. Suddenly Asta would turn, feeling that intense pressure of the other magic. The magic frequency that he and Bon can't feel, thinking it could be another elf. Learning to sense pressure like this from Merlin and Bon in order to sense other worlders' magic. Asta would turn off Lost Vein out as he's ready to strike, when suddenly they would notice Charmy, thinking that she had turned into the elf. Karin would then calmly ask who destroyed her garden, which they would tell her that it was the elves. Charmy would be incredibly pissed off, as she says that they're going to come with her to defeat the elves. When they all realize that they're out of mana, Charmy would turn using her magic to create a chef to cook food and tells them to eat it. Once they eat the food, they notice their mana begins to replenish. Charmy explaining that the spell is capable of restoring all the eater's mana. Asta would try eating it too, but it won't do anything since he doesn't have any of that mana from this world to begin with, so it's not like he can use it at all. Though, he would still thank her for the nutritious meal, saying that he does feel a bit better. While they're eating, everyone would then exchange information, revealing that Yami had gone to the Golden Dawn's base, Noelle had gone to the capital with her brother, and that Zora is a member of the Black Bulls. Henry would use his magic to reconstruct the base and transport everyone to the capital to go and save the kingdom. As the Black Bulls, literally, the Black Bulls base, charges towards the capital, Luck would sense that there are several elves in town ahead of them. Three, to be specific. One of the elves knows that something's heading towards them, which another elf would use earth magic to create a huge wall. The Black Bull easily manages to dodge and break through the wall, surprising the elf. Henry arranges the base and attacks the elves, but the elves would then dodge. As rubble starts to fall on the citizens, Charmy and Vanessa would use their magic to save people, using clouds of sheep wool and threads in order to move them out of the way. Grey would use her magic to free all the citizens that are trapped by elves, using transformation magic to transform their bonds. The elves would all try to attack the base, but due to Vanessa's magic of fate, they would all miss. Magna, Luck, and Gordon would fire spells at the elves through enormous base cannons, which Henry can use to increase the power of a spell along with making sure that the spell would hit them. The elves would get angry as they prepare to fire a combined spell in order to harm the citizens, since they can't hurt the black bulls. At this point, Henry would then fire Asta out of a cannon as the elves shoot the spell out towards the city. Asta would land in front of the spell, lost Vayne out, as he swipes in front of him, a faint bell sound being heard as he then whispers, Double full counter. Anti-magic full counter. 
Asua combined the power of anti-magic coating Lost Vein as the blade turns black. Using both anti-magic and the spell Full Counter at the same time, Asta would reflect the power of the blast twice, effectively creating a combo spell that can do three times the damage of the original attack. Since Full Counter has a two times increase in power when it's reflected, and Asa's anti-magic can reflect the original blast, that's three times the amount of strength of that original combined spell. The three elves would be knocked unconscious in a single blow, all falling to the ground, barely clinging to life. Asta, realizing what's going on, quickly drops the blade as he runs over to them and starts using healing magic, not wanting to kill the original hosts. Once their bodies are away from almost death, Asa would use the Demon Destroyer sword as he then purges the reincarnation magic. Asa would pick up Lost Vane as he throws both swords back into his grimoire. He would tell the rest of the Black Bulls that the elves have been neutralized, saying they need to head now deeper into the capital. Almost as if on cue, suddenly, three people would appear. This being Sally, Raids, and Valtos. What do you want, Asta would say? You were the guy who attacked the whole capital city before and tried to kill people, right? And Fingolion. Raids would say that he's going to use the Black Bulls for his revenge, Asa narrowing his eyes, saying that he could just take them all out right here instead. Raids replies to hold up their quick shot, saying that he wants to kill Patoli for using him for his own goals, saying that that elf has to pay. Asa would grit his teeth, saying that he can't work with people if their goals are too different. Raids would then continue saying that if they work together, they can transport the Black Bull's base with Valtos' teleport magic. If they work together, then we have a deal. Luck would comment that the remaining elves are all heading towards the capital, Raids asking if they're going to team up or not. Suddenly, the three would feel an intense pressure as Asa says, You think I really need you? The three would be feeling the fate of death upon them, as Asa would then take a deep breath, remembering when Licht had pierced him in his heart. <laughs> it's my overconfidence that always gets me into these situations. Fine, Asta would say. We'll take your help, but you're gonna have to repay all the people you hurt by helping save the city and save the kingdom. The three would wonder if he was originally joking, when Asta says he's completely serious. And just like that, Asta basically threatens them and says if they don't work with him, he'll just kill them. Showing off the perverted demon troublemaker vibe that his father, Meliodas, has, as they would be forced to work with them as they teleport the entire Black Bulls to the capital. Once they arrive, the city will be in ruins, and people will be wondering as they scream and cry if this is the end of the Clover Kingdom. As the Black Bulls base appears, people will be wondering, what's going on? thinking that this might be the people to save us. Now, just a little quick flashback, we see Yami during the reincarnation original incident, wondering what that magical presence is, but it's not an attack. Owen and Marks would suddenly appear before Yami in a giant jellyfish, trying to attack Yami while he's unguarded. Yami would realize that these two's magic is way more powerful, as he realizes that these aren't his friends, that the elves had taken over them. They would notice that Yami was protecting Yulius' corpse and comments on how they're going to desecrate it in front of Yami. Yami hearing this gets pissed at their common charges, saying they're even more annoying than that Bond guy. An elf would comment about how this is going to make Yami way easier to hit. Mark's firing multiple arrows. Yami would counter them all with his katana, slicing them up, and destroys the jellyfish with his dark magic. As the elves are surprised by Yami's intense speed and movements, Yami would take this chance to knock them unconscious. Yami says that those elves were super powerful, even though Marks and Owen weren't even battle-type mages. When roses suddenly start to grab hold of the elves, and Charlotte appears, calling them about how her brethren were careless, and how they can rest within her magic for now. Yami realizes that this is not her, saying that she's been reincarnated by those elves too, huh? This isn't like Charlotte at all, Yami would say. The elf replies that she does not know him, but all humans must be eliminated. Yami would defend her rose thorn attack, as he comes across some citizens and tells him to get out of the way or she's going to kill them. Yami thinks about how he has to get rid of the roses or they're all going to be in trouble, remembering how he had saved Charlotte the first time that her magic had gone out of control. He'd realize that the roses are actually covering the elf's scent, but he'd still be able to manage to locate the elf's key. Yami launches a dark slash, thinking about how the elf's use of Charlotte's magic is way different from Charlotte, and that this defense has no openings. And when he thinks about how the elf is taking over Charlotte's body, her magic had returned to its original power. While he continues to attack and dodge the elf, Yami comments that Charlotte was able to make herself strong even though her magic was weakened by a curse, saying how pathetic it is that she's letting someone else control her body. 
Suddenly, Sol would show up, Charlotte's subordinate, and asks why Charlotte had attacked them. The elf replies for Sol not to speak to her so familiarly. Yami explained to Sol the situation that she had been taken over by an elf, and that he's going to take care of her. Yami tells Sol to go and take care of Yulius' body, Sol saying that she'll be the one to free Charlotte instead, and telling him to go take care of the ex-wizard king. She goes on to say that she'll make sure to wake Charlotte up even if she has to die. Yami would tell Sol to keep living for Charlotte's sake, saying that as a magic knight captain, no, as a friend, I'll take care of her for you. Now go, take Julius. Sol would cry thanking Captain Yami as she runs forward, grabbing Julius and getting out of the way. The elf would manage to surround Yami with thorns, but Yami then uses a dark magic spell to free himself, Yami closing the distance and trying to wake Charlotte up by telling the elf what she's doing to her subordinates. The elf would move away saying that she acknowledges Yami's strength and that she's going to use all of her power to kill him. Yami realizes how strong the attack is and prepares for it, saying that he has always acknowledged how strong Charlotte is. As the elf launches the spell, Yami says that she's not going to kill her as he destroys the entire spell. Sol would hide Yulius' body by burying it underground using her earth magic, when she notices a surge of mana and worries about Charlotte. Meanwhile, back at the fight, the elf would think about how even though her spell was more powerful, Yami was able to cut her spell in half and destroy one of her gauntlets. The elf begin to wonder if humans are actually capable of overturning the outcome of battles regardless of the mana quantity which they possess. The elf then thinks about how she has used way too much mana and decides to retrieve the other two elves saying that she'll have to deal with underestimating the humans later. As the elf heads out she would notice Licht and the others are just arriving. Sol would ask Captain Yami what happened as she's worried about Yami. Yami would then pull out the rubble saying he's not done fighting yet. Yami notices her and asks what happened to Yulis' body, saying she had hid it in a safe place. So then asks Yami what that was all about saving Charlotte, saying she just saw her flying away. Yami responds saying that next time they can fight together now that Yulis was out of the way. But first off we need to go save civilians. They would both agree with this as they then leave the Golden Dawn's base to go and help civilians. Anyway, some stuff happens with the Crimson Lions, and it's revealed that Fungolian survived and is here, saving his little brother, and defeating the Vice Captain who had been an elf. After that short little synopsis, let's actually get back to the castle where the main conflict is now happening. Yami and Jack would save the king, defeating the two escaped convicts. Now at the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, Patoli would arrive with a huge group of elves possessing Ghosh and some other characters that we know. Raya replying that Licht has not regained his memories yet and is currently asleep. Raya also saying that the magic is incomplete as of right now, and that the rest are waiting inside. Patoli says that the humans are trying to fix all the members of the Golden Dawn, who says that the king is most likely dead. Anyway, once they place this final magic stone that's in their possession to the pedestal, they'll finally be reborn as elves, and then eradicate the humans to reclaim the calm, tranquil world for them. In the castle, Yami would comment how there are a bunch of tough ones inside the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, Yami wondering where the rest of the magic knights are. If they lag any longer, then he's going to take them all out himself. At the Eye of the Midnight Sun's base, the elves would place the magic stone onto the door, as they would prepare to use a spell to open the door to the Realm of the Dead, aka Purgatory and the home of the Demon King, being Asta's grandfather. The Demon King. Starting off exactly where we were last time, the elves had just begun their spell to open the door to the realm of the dead. As the dark castle is being summoned, everyone's wondering what is it, which Babel would explain that the castle is the Shadow Palace, and that the elves will be fully reincarnated once the final magic stone is placed in this pedestal here in the Shadow Palace. Kirsch would say that he will not allow that to happen, attacking the elves, but Babel easily stops the attack. Babel then leaves while telling them to give it their best shot, although now it's just useless. Jack and Yami will be discussing what they're going to do. Elves coming down from the castle, having sensed their mana, saying that they're going to stop them from interfering. At this point, Noel, Zora, Yami, and Jack prepare to fight the elves, the Black Bulls suddenly appearing from out of seemingly out of nowhere, crashing into the base using the huge Black Bull and attacking the elves. Everyone that had arrived quickly checking to see if anyone at the castle is okay which the elves would simply just start attacking them with. Thanks to luck, Vanessa and Charmy's magic though, they're easily able to take on the elves while defending everyone else. Patoli will be witnessing all of this, Reeves saying that she'll take care of this, using her magic to teleport Vanessa, Magna, Luck, Charmy, and Sally to another dimension. 
Patoli and Drow would then use a spell to destroy the Black Bull's base, with Patoli leaving, heading into the Shadow Castle to begin the ritual, while leaving the rest of the work to Drawa, one of the other elves left behind. Now, inside the alternate dimension, Reeve would welcome her captives to the world under her whim. As the five begin to wonder about the oddities of this weird dimension, Reeve, which is the name of the elf who had taken over the leader of the Coral Peacocks' Magic Knight Squad, would explain to her captives that inside of this space, the impossible is now possible, explaining that everything exists according to her whim and her thoughts, as she suddenly has a bed the five are all standing on to restrain them. Reeve would then create a huge curtain that attacks all five of them. Reeve thinking that they're all dead, she'd be shocked to find all five of them still alive. Reeve figuring out that it was Vanessa's magic that's able to change the results of fate. And that's going to be problematic. Sally is amazed by everything that's happening around her, and that both Vanessa and Reeve's magic is incredible. Charmy would use her special magic to restore Vanessa's mana, and Reeve would think about how difficult it's going to become to defeat her enemies so long as Charmy and Vanessa are both in play. Both Magna and Luck would try to use their offensive magic to attack Reeve, to which she would simply deactivate the magic, having no issues blocking the attack. The spell is being useless. Vanessa thinks about how bad of the situation is, and they can only defend against Reeve. And they have to either find a way to escape this dimension, or wait till she runs out of mana. Reeve would attack, but the five are able to easily destroy that incoming attack. Reeve wondering if there's a limit to their mana recovery, as she begins to launch a stream of water and bladed fish at the five. Sally would instruct both Magna and Luck to use their respective magic on the water, which would cause a huge explosion of steam from Magna's flames and lightning electrocuting the water. The others would be wondering what had even happened, Sally explaining what they did and how Reeve's magic works. As the steam clears, it would be revealed that Reeve had protected herself with a barrier. Magnus saying they have to find a way out of this dimension as soon as possible. Reeve would then tell them that it's already too late. Vanessa looks to Charmy and notices she's starting to fall asleep, and Vanessa also is beginning to feel tired. Reeve would explain to them that all those within the glamour world will never awaken once they fall asleep. The dream world. As Sally thinks about Reeve's looking tired is making them tired, she figures out something. Sally makes a figure out of glass for her fingers and tells Reeve to guess what they are as glasses are suddenly created out of nowhere. And just like this, Sally would prove that Reeve is unable to control what she creates. It will simply create whatever Reeve is currently thinking about at that time, and how that'll appear. Sally then tells Reeve to create an exit, which multiple doors would suddenly appear. Sally saying how hard it is to get rid of something that just pops into your head. The five mages would try to escape through the exits, which would then promptly be sealed by Reeve, so that they can't escape. As they are wondering what they're going to do, Luck would come up with an idea informing the others. Mana using his fireballs would create a huge smoke screen, Reeve clearing away the smoke easily. As the smoke clears, Reeve would notice a doll that resembles Dorothy made of Vanessa and Charmy's magic. As Reeve summons Dorothy by accident, Dorothy wakes up and tells the Black Bulls they did a jo good job summoning her. Along with that, she'll handle the rest. Dorothy being the leader of the peacocks and also someone who can control the dimension. So Reeve basically summoned Dorothy's soul from within her own body. Reeve would attack Dorothy who can block it and explains that she finally has an opponent who shares the same dreams as her. Reeve and Dorothy basically entering into an endless battle until the glamour world collapses. Once the glamour world disappears, Dorothy bids the Black Bulls farewell and how much fun she had, saying that once they get back to the real world, the rest will be up to them. Mana and Luck would then attack Reeve with a huge combination spell after escaping the world and knock them out. A little while back after Reeve had brought the five to the glamour world, Patoli and Drawa had used a combination spell to destroy the Black Bulls base, Grey and Gordon using their magics to save the others from the fall, Patoli then leaving to the Shadow Palace, as I mentioned. Valtos and raids falling behind them. The Black Bulls knows that they are running low on mana, Yami saying that they can handle this and they need to surpass their limits. The Black Bulls agreeing as Yami and Jack would then head inside the Shadow Palace themselves. It was at this point that Reeve had taken the five mages into the dream world with her. Drow noticing that some of the humans have escaped and says they're going to finish them off after handling the ones here. 
Drow are an E-clan then using a combination spell, paralyzing all the humans. For reference, Drawa is Ghosh, and Eclat is his younger sister Marie. Anyway, Eclat has the ability to use magic casts through her eyes, and can also combine her eye magic with Drawa's mirror magic to create an immense magic power. I'd also be impressed saying that someone else can use magic without a grimoire just like him, as she would begin to battle with Asta. Asta, in kind, also not using his grimoire, simply using the magic power within him as well. Drow would be preparing to kill them all. Asta using Lost Vein, his sword to free himself along with Grey, Gordon, and Henry from the paralysis. Drow seeing Asta's sword Lost Vein, for some reason would recognize it, as he says that he's seen that sword before, as he then fires a spell at Asta saying he's going to kill him. He would say that anyone who wields that sword deserves to die, as Asta remembers that Lost Vein was originally his father's sword, wondering what Meliodas had done to the elves. Dre, Gordon, and Henry would manage to block the attack, while Asta would then reflect the spell using a full counter back at Drawa. Asta, Grey, Gordon, and Henry would then start to explain who Ghosh is, as they say they're going to get him back. Drawa saying that he can tell that they're well acquainted with one another, but I'm not out of tricks yet, he would say, as he turns to a clat, signaling that they're going to use that technique. At this point, Asa's done with this all, and since he's there, he easily overpowers the two elves. Asa saying he's done playing around as he just moves forward at a wicked speed. Even before they even try to activate the spell, launching it at Asta before it's completed, Asta just using a full counter as he deactivates the spell and hits them back with it, the two being knocked to the ground. Asta would summon his grimoire, pulling out the demon destroyer blade that he had gotten from Licht, as he uses the ability slashing the two, the two elves falling to the ground as their souls disperse. Yeah, there's no wholesome moment here like in the original where Drawa forgave the humans and figures that if he had met humans like these, then he could have been friends with them. Asta just straight up KOs them, and it's over. Because fodder. So they're gone. Anyway, now that Ghost and Marie would be saved, Charmy would then begin making food for everyone else so that they could restore their mana before entering the Shadow Palace. After taking a short break, outside the castle, Guldur would notice that the Shadow Palace had arrived, informing Revchi about how it's an ancient magical dimension, a door between worlds, to some would say, that contains ancient magical artifacts, and treasures, grand treasures within it that were the weapons of people called the Holy Knights. Legends about them say they were some of the strongest knights in the entire world. Everyone ate their food while walking to the castle. They would decide to take care of all the enemies that are in the capital. Asui then comments if anyone needs any healing, saying that he has plenty of mana left. Mimosa offering the same. While they heal other people, Noah would comment that Asta pushed himself way too much as he looks up, his eyes catching hers. She then turned, noticing Sally as she asks what's she doing here. Sally commenting that Asta had promised to allow her to have her way of his body once this was all over, which would completely shock both Noelle and Mimosa, the two of them just stuttering because of how that was phrased. Asta would turn, just looking at Sally weirdly, wondering why everyone's freaked out. Luck would turn, saying that there's two elves heading to their location, as the elves launch attacks at the group, Meriliona and Fungolian would show up, defeating the elves in flames. A fully healed Nozel would be watching the battle from above, commenting how the Vermilion family has returned to the battlefield. Mango would turn back, saying that it looks like the portal to the Shadow Palace is getting smaller, Mimosa informing everyone what happens to the elves when the final magic stone in the pedestal is put to place in the Shadow Palace, she'd say. There'll be no way to save anyone who's been reincarnated at that point, she'll say. Basically, that it will erase the souls out of everyone who the elves had taken over. It's at this point that the huge group of elves from the Golden Dawn would show up, intending to kill all the humans. Mereliona thinking about how they're not going to be able to go into the portal before it closes. The groups would then begin to decide who's going into the Shadow Palace. Asta would immediately say that he's going, with no one complaining, because Asta is one of the strongest people in the kingdom already by this point and has the Demon Destroyer Sword, which is the ability to free the elves and save them. At this point, this makes Mimosa basically useless, so she doesn't have to go whip so she can stay behind, since Asta can already heal everyone else in the group. Mireliona and Fungolion, as well as Nozel would also head with, which are all magic captain level people. And then, at that point, Noel would also volunteer who Nozel would agree to take with. 
So the final group heading into the castle is Asta, Noel, Fuengolion, Mereliona, and Nozel. They would head into the palace, and as the elves try to stop them, the black bulls and their group of magic knights would get in the way. Fuengolion and Nozel using Salamander, and Nozel using his silver eagle, to fly into the shadow palace, carrying Noel and Mereliona with them, while Asta would fly himself behind them. As the group enters into the Shadow Palace, they would then notice the mana around them feels strange. Everyone would be feeling really weird except for Asta, who'd suddenly be covering his ears. Ugh, what the? What is this? Asta would be thinking. Asta's vision would be changing, feeling blurry. There's so many new senses now going into his brain. It would feel nauseating. He'd feel sick as Asta would fall over to the ground. This being the first time Asta had ever experienced so much of the same magic conduit type that his is, besides Bon. He had on only ever sensed himself, Merlin, and Bon's mana at this point. And now, basically the entire world that they had entered this dimension was made up of the mana that Asta himself frequencies with. Asta would then pull himself up saying, as he's, he's okay. As blood would be coming out of his nose, everyone would be incredibly worried. Asta healing himself and saying he's fine. They'd comment with Nozel saying that the Shadow Palace is the place between life and death, the living world and the afterlife. Asta and the others will all be split up, Asta on his own. Asta this time wouldn't have Mimosa with him since there was no need to bring two healers, so that Mimosa moment is gone unfortunately. But Asta is able to break through the Shadow Palace walls, just going from room to room, just looking to find the elves. Each of the elves having stationed themselves in a different room. While the group would be spreading out, all in order to defeat the boss that's at the top of the palace, Asta figures that the elves' boss is going to be licked, and this time he's finally going to be able to get his revenge, saying that they're all going to rendezvous once they reach the top with each other. Asta would reach the room directly above him, smashing through the floor as he climbs into the next room. The fight would continue, and Asta would basically just be sweeping through all of the elves that come at him from each room, not even really feeling any challenge from them at all. Outside of the Shadow Palace, the Black Bulls continued to fight the elves when Yuno and other magic knights would show up in the capital, you know, defeating the elves that had been attacking. Zora would be thinking about how Yuno was able to help all the magic knights across the entire kingdom, and even defeat the elves here. Bon would also be waiting outside for Yuno to show up, and he too had been helping just fend off the elves until Yuno had arrived. Charmy would greet Yuno and offer him some food, Yuno noticing that his mana is recovering while he eats. You know, asking what's going on, Bon would inform him that Asta and the others had headed down to the Shadow Palace to take on the stronger foes. Bon saying he got here a little too late to actually make it into the portal, so he just figured he'd help out out here. Suddenly, Yuno's pendant would release a huge light that opens a portal into the Shadow Palace. As Yuno would then walk into the Shadow Palace, Bon would tag along with him in place of Charmy. Charmy about to follow behind them with the rest of the mages saying they need Charmy here to help restore everyone's mana so they can heal and help the citizens. Once Bon and Yuno head into the portal, Bon would be separated from Yuno and wondering where he is. Luckily though, he could still sense Asta as well as notice that the magic around him was way more familiar now. We must be close to purgatory, he'd think. Anyway, he knows that Asta was battling against foes with his power, and Asta would suddenly notice Bond's energy appear out of nowhere as well. Asta turning and asking why Bond's here, to which Bond would say that he'd come down to this weird place following Yuno to see if he could help out. Asta would be shocked that Yuno's come out in here too, but would then tell Bond that all these monsters are linked by Lyra's magic. Lyra being the elf he was currently fighting at the time, who was summoning monsters. That's the leader of the silver gray deer who can paint stuff and turn it into real things. The elf will begin to panic, saying that he doesn't want to paint monsters to just kill humans anymore. He wants to paint a beautiful monster. Bon would offer to help Lyra out by telling him just to take a nice portrait of him, since he's already quite the monster himself. Lyra would get really angry as he smacks Bon away and saying that he would never draw something disgusting looking like Bon. Bon gets pissed off at this and saying, ah, fine, I was just trying to be nice anyway, and attacks with a wild fox hunt. 
Bond's attacks just wreck Lyra and knock him out, sending him flying to the ground with all of his magic power having been pulled out of him by Bond. A result of this is that Charmy does not know that she's half dwarf or about her powers yet. So that has not occurred at all yet. Now that Bond and Osted cleared their room, at Noelle's location, Noelle would be fighting Fauna, the girl who was the friend of Mars, the first antagonist of the dungeon arc. But none of her spells are having any effect on Fauna. Fauna decided to just finish Noelle off with her flames, but then Fauna would be suddenly attacked by Jack, the blade user who was also the Magic Knight captain of the Green Mantis. Fauna being shocked by the sudden appearance, Jack would express how he'd finally found a woman worth ripping apart. Noelle asking why Jack had to be the one to appear. Which Jack asks if she has some prom with him. Noelle turning away and making a face saying she doesn't. Asa and Bond were decided to try and find out where Yuno was, heading down towards the top of the castle, towards where the leader of the Eye of the Midnight Sun would be, that possibly being licked. Meanwhile, at Yuno's location, the elves would count how Yuno is luckily here, even when they had already sent others to capture him. The elves being pleased that Yuno had arrived here safely and then tell him to hand over the magic stone. Patoli and Raya then launching spells at Yuno, but Yuno uses a huge spell to avoid all of them, by flying away at a fast speed as quick as the wind. As the elves are shocked by Yuno's enhanced speed and strength, Yuno would take this chance to attack the elves with a wind tornado using the power of the Wind Spirit, Sylph. However, they'd still manage to dodge the attack, Raya noticing that Yuno's gotten far stronger, and that Yuno might even be stronger than Licked now. Suddenly, Rani would get close to Yuno and try to grab him, but Yuno manages to escape and get out of the way, Rana then getting close again without Yuno detecting him. Yuno began to figure out that his ability is somehow to negate his own magic trace, so that it basically means his existence disappears for a few moments, meaning that Yuno can't even detect him. This would be when Yuno would try to figure out how to get away from him, as he managed to gain some distance, but Ronnie manages to snatch the magic stone. Raya would compliment Ronnie about the magic stone, saying that that was an expert use of their elven technique. Ron says that he'll now finally be able to be repaid for everything that's occurred till now. Raya would think about Ronnie and remember the kind person that Ronnie had been back in their previous lives. This is not something that a friend like this would say. Raya would ask who Raya truly is, Ron smiling and managing to wound Raya. Raya thinks about how he had known that the human revealing their location was a lie, but said nothing because he wanted to see his friends again. Raya also thinks about how the costume lying was a hole in his gut, and wonders truly who the person that had caused all this to begin with was. Patoli would ask why Ronnie did it, why, which the person inside of this shell would begin to reveal that he's actually the devil within the five leaf clover. He explains how he was both between the chosen, the chosen people who had possessed two four leaf clover grimoires in order to create the grimoire of despair. As he would then places the final magic stone to the pedestal, he would explain how he had obtained what he desires and how he'll obtain it from hell. As suddenly, Ost would sense it. A huge black mass begin to appear. The soul within Ronnie would then exit its own body and force itself into this black mass. As both Yuno and Patoli notice the cold black mana, Patoli would comment that it's... It's a devil. The devil would comment how it feels so wonderful to have a body again. Although this one's incomplete, luckily there's a little half-demon here who I can gain some strength from. My lord Meliodas. The devil tells Patoli that he can feel the same despair from him that Licht had that day. What do you mean, Patoli would say. The devil reveals that he was the one who had tricked the humans into destroying the elves. The demon saying that all the elves are fools for carrying out such a vengeance, just as he had strung them all on. Now that I've regained my body, I can go meet up with Lord Meliodas, and then we can enact our plan along this world. The plan that the King of Demons has set into play. D damn you! Patoli would say, getting angry at the devil and fires a spell at him, using his light magic. The devil easily blocking the spell and returning it back to Patoli. You know what then use a spell of wind, saving Patoli and Raya from the attack. He'd be confused why Yuno saves him, with Yuno saying he's not gonna let him do with Captain Zvonjins' body as he pleases. 
the devil would comment how he had planned to deal with Yuno later. To which Yuno would reply that he's going to crush this devil to end it all, saying that he's fought a demon way stronger than you. Yuno would launch a spell at the devil, but the devil would easily destroy the spell, saying that everything's meaningless for him and his word reality magic. This would be when Yuno realizes how strong this devil's magic is and how terrifying this could be. He might not even be able to defeat him if he was alone. Suddenly, Asta and Bomb would arrive, to which Yuno would say, Asta's late. The demon would turn, seeing Asta. Ah, yes, my lord, you're finally here. If you don't mind, I would like a little stipend of your magic power just to complete this form. Nothing more. I'm sure you understand. The devil would suddenly move towards Asta, ignoring Yuno, Patoli, and Raya, as Bomb would be ready for a fight, ready to intercept the attack before... Suddenly, Bomb would be slashed in half as he gets pushed out of the way. Asta could hardly believe his eyes. What? What? M mom Asta would see in one arm of this man, he would see his mother, Elizabeth, laying limp and unconscious. You! What did you- What did you do? The devil in front of Asta would suddenly turn as it then falls to one knee. My lord, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to bring you here. I could have handled them all by myself. <laughs> Idiot. Zagreus, did you not sense one of the seven deadly sins was here? Not to mention that useless grandson of mine. What? What are you? Shut up, boy. The words coming out of Meliodos' mouth didn't match his face. As Meliodos would turn, his eyes being full of a dark cruelty. Zagreus would explain, saying he was just going to take a, a bit, a smidgen of a higher royal's magic power just in order to restore himself. Before he could say another word, Asta's lost fame would be disappear from his hand, as Meliodas would have it in his. Meliodas would stab Zagreus through the heart several times, as Zagreus would fall to the ground dead before he could even react. Asta would be immediately pushed to 100% power, falling back as he pulls out all three of the demon swords he has, now that Lost Fan's been taken from him. In one hand he holds the Demon Destroyer Sword, in the other the Demon Dweller Sword, and the Demon Slayer Sword, all three anti-magic blades. I don't know who you are, but get your hands off of my mother, Asta would say. Asta would move forward at a quick speed, his wing, his demon wing being cover of anti-magic as well, double coating him with demonic power as he slashes at Meliodas. Meliodas with just his fingers would grab the blade out of midair as he pulls it from Asta's hand and stabs Asta across the face with lost vein. Asta falling over as blood pools out of the wound. Asta would turn with his left hand as he thrusts his arm towards Meliodas. Holy magic! Ark! Asta would use the purging magic of Ark. The only spell he knows from Elizabeth that's able to actually kill a demon. But this demon king, Meliodas, would simply slash the attack and smack it away. Asa's arc disappearing, as he would then say, Huh, I guess I overestimated you, boy. You can't even master one half of your powers. I guess it's an issue of you have too many skills, and now you're not good at any of them. Wh what are you? Suddenly, Lost Fame would have slashed through Asa's outstretched arm that had activated Ark. Asta would fall to the ground, falling back as he clutches his arm, his arm being completely severed from his body as he tries to use his demon power to reattach the arm. Meliodas would simply step onto his arm as he says, I'm not done with you yet. He'd begin to prepare another attack as suddenly he turned, sensing Bonds back up. I gotta get out of here, he'd think. Bond would be about to use Gift, Bond's power that he had gained after training in Purgatory after he had fought the Demon King the first time. However, Meliodas was not willing to take on a 2 on 1. He simply needed the girl so he could reactivate the curse and put everything back to the way it was. And now that Zagreus had arrived, the door had been opened. Meliodas would fly out of the Shadow Palace, breaking out of the portal and taking Elizabeth with him, as Asta screams, holding his arm up, saying, I'll, I'll kill you! Asta would reattach his arm, flying up as he tries to follow the pathway that Meliodas had created, as Bon would grab his leg. Bon, let me go! He, he, he took her! Bon, we have to- Bon would have a look of pain in his face, saying, gritting his teeth, Kid, you- you aren't ready for that yet. 
He'd be tightening his grip around Asta's legs. He throws him into the ground, Asta being knocked out. As Bond clutches his fist, wondering what that guy's up to now. Did, did it really happen? Did, did Meliodas do what he said he was going to? It's at this point we have a flashback to over a hundred years ago in the Black Clover world, when the seven deadly sins assigned from Escanor had all been thrown into this world. Bond had tried to save Elaine before they were teleported, but he was never able to transfer the immortality. He was never able to bring her back to, from death. Bond was taken here. Meliodas, after arriving, would gather up with the rest of the group that he could find, with King and Diane having seemingly gone missing. Meliodas and Elizabeth would have happened to find Gother, Bond, and Merlin. By this point, by the time the meeting had taken place, it had been a long time before they were able to find each other. Meliodas having already had Asta with Elizabeth for a year now. Asta was already a year old when they had finally been able to have this meeting with Bon, Merlin, and Gother. Meliodas would explain his plan, saying that he thinks that the Demon King must have sent them here in order to break them off and drain their powers slowly, commenting that all of their magic has been getting weaker once they entered this world. Some reason after all those elves we met, had fought that demon that we subjugated, and it died, something else came into this world too, almost like a vacuum. And so at that point, Bon, Elizabeth, Meliodas, and Merlin's powers had already begun to be drained. Everyone except Asta. Asta's powers for some reason just weren't able to be lowered, maybe because he was born in this world. Meliodas would explain that their powers, while this drain was incredibly minuscule, were slowly shrinking. And that in time, it's possible the Demon King's going to wait to wear me out before he finally comes to take my body. And at that point, there will be nothing any of us can do, even you, Bon. That's why. Meliodas would tighten his fist before letting it go soft, as he touches his son's hand, smiling down at his so son, Elizabeth holding him tightly. As Meliodas would then harden his eyes looking up to his friends, saying that, I'm going to leave it up to this kid, he'd say. Once I get taken over by the Demon King, I'll probably do something to try and take Elizabeth to reactivate the spell, since neither of those two old bastards has any plan of letting us go. I'm sure Asta's going to find you guys at some point in the future, if not everyone else in the Seven Deadly Sins. So, what I'm suggesting is, the memory would fade out, as Bond finishes explaining to Asta saying that this was all part of his dad's plan, that once Asta was strong enough, he was going to be one to rid the Demon King's soul from them forever. To defeat both the Goddess Race's prime deity and the Demon King. Asta would be shocked, realizing what all had happened, as he turns grouping his fists, knowing now that that guy wasn't his dad. It was... So... So Gramps already took over his body then, huh? Asta would say. Asta would have tears in his eyes as he thinks, I really wanted to meet you, Dad. I guess you're making me wait a little longer. Asa pulled himself up asking Bon what he's supposed to do exactly. Bon put his hand on Asa's shoulder saying, It's your job, kid, to get strong enough to beat a god, alright? But, but what about, what about mom? Asta would say, as Bon would then tell Asta that they have at least a month before the Demon King can execute his plan. A hole's already been opened in purgatory here. That means that there's no way for another hole to be opened to that realm for an, a while. So there's no way for him to escape now. I'd say the rift here will last at least another month. But once it's fully closed, then he'll be able to escape with Meliodas and Elizabeth's bodies and return back to our original world to reclaim his glory and reinstall the curse that had originally been placed. Gah, it's all so confusing, Asta would say as he punches himself in the head. I just want to kick that guy's ass right now, he'd say as he punches his hand to his fist. He even took my sword, he'd say. They begin to notice around them that the elves were fading. The magic that the devil had originally used to reincarnate the elves was beginning to disappear. As the elves' bodies would fall to the ground, Patoli being confused as to what was going on, wondering why, as William was now coming back into consciousness. With the elves disappearing, knowing that they had been tricked, and that the humans had never intended to hurt them all along. Patoli now saying goodbye to Licht, as the elves' soul returned to the afterlife. We have to get out of here, Bon would say. It's... that's closing. But wasn't it supposed to be open for another month, Asta would say? Bon would turn back to telling Asta that a portal that we can actually exit through will be closing now, 
The rift in it will still be wounded, though, so... Uh, I wish Merlin was here. This is the annoying parts. God, I hate explaining things. All right, everyone, grab your friends, and let's get the hell out of here, Bond would say. As Asta would then pull himself up, along with grabbing William's body, you know, and the rest of the elves that they could, they would then fly out of the castle at the Shadow Palace, escaping through the door. Back in the real world, the reason the portal was closing for them to physically escape so fast was because Finral and Nero would be removing the magic stones from the stone tablet. By the time Nero was planning to revive the Wizard King, it would have already been over. Nero would have then turned back into Sekre, the girl from 500 years ago, as the Magic Emperor explains that the fight's already over, saying that the Demon King has emerged from Purgatory, and telling Finral about everything saying that once they reach the capital, it'll be all up to them. He would tell him about the curse that Nero had been placed under for 500 years, the seal that Nero had placed on herself. They would drop off Finral and tell him to return to his friends, while they'll use Nero's magic to try and prolong the seal on the Shadow Palace. As the first Wizard King and Sekre would then head to the portal by the Shadow Palace, Nero using her spell to open the wound longer. The Wizard King having some understanding of what the true goal of the Demon King was. To return back to his own original world with Meliodas's his friend's body. Lumiere would then take care of all of the elves that were still outside of the Shadow Palace and had not reached the connection with the devil and so the reincarnation rampage magic was still in place. Lumiere and Sekere taking care of it this time and siphoning by deactivating the reincarnation magic, all the elves would be freed. Asta, now escaping out of the portal along with everyone else, would run into Lumiere, the first Wizard King, as Lumiere and Bon would recognize each other. B bon Hey, it's it's you! Uh, lady dude. It's Lumiere, he'd say. Oh yeah, that. Sorry about that. So I guess you still are alive. I always thought you were lying about the immortal thing. Huh. I'm wondering what you're doing alive. You should have been six feet under for a couple hundred now, shouldn't ya? Lumiere would say his time is up as he recognizes Asta as Melos' son and sees Yuno. Recognizing that Yuno must be, he'd smile thinking that Yuno is, must be the reincarnation of his sister and Lick's child. Sekiro would tell Lumiel how grateful she has been to serve him as he crumbles away. Lumiel now saying goodbye to Bond for the last time. As Bond says, see ya, old friend. And now the reconstruction of the kingdom was to begin with Yami and William first going to try and find Julius' body, where it had originally been buried by him and Sol, to find that there was only an empty crevice. Then they would notice a presence behind them and look, suddenly seeing that Julius is before the two in a younger body, apologizing since his magic took longer to activate than he had thought. The magic he has that sacrifices his grimoire in order for him to regain time. Yami began to complain to Julius about how he had mourned his death and his determination to avenge Julius, and then he didn't even get to fight the demon thing, but says that he is glad he can see Julius again. Julius would tell William that he has a lot to atone for since he had betrayed the kingdom, Yami wondering why Julius is even being lenient on William. Julius saying that he's partially responsible for inviting William to the Magic Knights, and even made him a captain, saying that most of his plan wouldn't have even been possible without Julius helping him. Julius would tell William that his atonement will be to help him fix and save the kingdom, to which William would agree to follow him in. Sekre had successfully, by this point, managed to open the seal in the Shadow Palace much longer, up to the point of at least making it three months. This will be giving Asta way more time to train and give him time to fight and defeat the Demon King Meliodas, as well as whatever demons that Meliodas has by his side, that being the Dark Triad. Of course, this is still unknown to the kingdom at this point. A couple days later, Julius would send a summon out to both Sekre and Asta, saying that they have many things to talk about. In the letter saying to Asta that they have many, many things to discuss, particularly about your father. As Asta and Sekre prepared to go to the royal capital to meet with Julius. So, last time we ended with Asta's defeat to the recently reincarnated Demon King, that being Meliodas, Asa's father's body, having finally run out of power, being drained by the frequency of magic in Black Clover's world, and the Demon King passing through and taking over 
Meliodas' body. This Demon King having his full power reincarnated into Meliodas has only one potential weakness, that being the trifecta power of Asta's anti-magic, divine, and demonic magic. Asta being the null magic user, being a individual being half devil, half angel, that has the power to wipe out both races. Bond told Asta about his origins, with Meliodas and the other seven deadly sins, aside from Escanor who had been left behind, being summoned into this world. With Asta being born in Black Clover, he would have the DNA inherited powers from the seven deadly sins world, being his mother and Meliodas. Meanwhile, he himself would have the frequency of magic from this world, which is what allowed him to exist and actually gain power here, unlike the rest of them who were slowly being drained. When Asta asked Bond why his dad was succumbing so much quicker than Bond did, asking why Bond still has his full power and why his mom's still okay and everyone else who was from their world, Bond would explain that Meliodas had diverted some of his power to Elizabeth so that she wouldn't die. With, of course, the curse still being broken, it was likely that she would now have a human length of lifespan. But if her magic power ran out before then, but since she didn't have as much as when she had been incarnated as a goddess, it was more likely that she would die from the mana drain. Versus Meliodas who had more magic power to spare, as well as a Meliodas who had the commandments. Him explaining to Asa that the commandments were a form of power split off of half of the Demon King, which have now been reclaimed, obviously. Anyway, it's from this point that Bon, alongside the other Black Bulls, would report to the Wizard King, Julius, detailing the situation and how the arrival of someone from the Spade Kingdom, the one of the members of the Dark Quadrad, had appeared. Eventually, Asta would once again be placed on trial with the Magical Court, with that guy who had the scales, with the idea that they would be punishing Asta for the sins of the elves, as well as his father being part of the Dark Quadrat and deserting the kingdom. Asta would go to attend the trial, with everyone saving Asta just like the original Noel and Mimosa stepping in, and of course Asta would be saved, with Asta now having his trial placed on hold until the whole ordeal with the Spade Kingdom is done and over with. And in the meantime, an alliance with the Heart Kingdom is what would be sought after with the representatives being sent to go from the squads, being who they were in the anime, with Bon being left alongside Captain Yami to protect the kingdom, as well as the other Magic Knight captains. When Asta tells Bon where he's heading out and to protect his mom while he's gone, Bon would look in the direction Asta's pointing, which is towards the Heart Kingdom, thinking that he might be able to actually find some of the other Seven Deadly Sins there. Asta would ask Bon what he should say if he runs into anyone, or what they might look like. Bond would think about it for a while, but being his chaotic self, would tell Asta that he'll manage something as he pushes Asta on his way with Noel telling him to come along. Asta hopping alongside the magic broom with her driving it as they would head off in the direction of the Heart Kingdom to train with the Heart Knights and learn about their magic abilities so that the two kingdoms can team up against the inevitable attack of the Spade Kingdom. And so, Asta and the rest from the Clover Kingdom would then make their way over to the Heart. On the way, Asta, while flying, would see a large orange rock, wondering what that could even be, telling Noel to go down since he wants to check it out. Asta feeling a weird presence off of it, realizing that this weird thing has magic power that he can actually sense. As Asta drops to the ground, Noel will be wondering why Asta was so curious. As Asta walks forward and starts poking at it, hearing a small shriek. As the ground would rumble and we would see Deanne pull herself up. As she looks around asking who's touching her when she's sleeping, but now grasping her sacred treasure, her huge hammer, about to thwap whoever it is and turn them into a nice meat paste. Deanne would turn seeing this small guy with a sword, and from afar would almost think it was... Meliodas? But, alas, after closer inspection, she would notice that the color of his hair was completely different, but his magic power was insane. It was one of the only magic powers that she's actually been able to feel in this world at all. In the last, what, hundred or so years she's been awake? Anyway, she'd pull herself up yawning, and as she does so, uh, Asta would notice on her thigh a specific tattoo. That, of course, being of the snake, Envy, one of the seven deadly sin tattoos that Bond had told him about. Then that means you're the sin of Envy? Ost would have little yellow stars in his eyes, as he does in Black Clover, 
excited about meeting another one of his dad's teammates, telling Deanne in a excited and hurried voice that his parents are Meliodas and Elizabeth, if she remembers them. Huh? Elizabeth? As Deanne is now fully awake, excited to meet Asta, who is, of course, Meliodas' son, suddenly a rustling in the tree leaves would occur as Noelle would prepare for a battle, with Deanne telling her to put her weapon down, saying that this is another one of her allies, as Gother would come walking out into the field, with the only peer person in the last couple hundred years that Deanne was able to find being Gother. Both Deanne and Gother would be the only ones working in the Heart Kingdom, with Gother asking who this strange little midget is. B midget? Asta would feel like a stabbing pain in his heart, almost as if Gother had used his legendary sacred treasure to give him depression as he falls over, with Deanne shaking her hand saying that, Well, from my perspective up here, everyone's short, so uh, I can't even really tell the difference. Deanne and Gother have been searching for King for a long time, having been unable to find anyone, with Gother having run into Meliodas, Bon, and Merlin that one meeting a long time ago, and actually recognizing Asta. This meant that currently there were only two members of the Seven Deadly Sins in this world that were really missing. That of course, one being Merlin, who Asta knew was the Queen of Witches in the Witch Forest, and the second being King, who no one has seen since they teleported, no one having any idea where he could have been sent or where he even is. Gother would then explain to Asta that when they had been sent here, Deanne had actually been sent into the Diamond Kingdom and was being held underground and experimented on for her giant lineage. But Gother, who had been sent to the Heart Kingdom and after his meeting with the trio of Meliodas, Bon, and Merlin, would go off searching for other sins. Having actually run into the Diamond Kingdom and being captured himself, his sacred treasure would be invisible, since it's inside of his body, so he's able to summon it at will, would have broken himself out of the Diamond Kingdom's lab and have saved himself and Deanne some time ago. That was, what, about 60 years ago? and took her back to the Heart Kingdom, having to cross over a strong magic zone just to get there. After they had arrived back at the Heart Kingdom, they had pretty much gone undetected, but figured it was still a good idea to earn some protection, are now actually working under the Heart Queen as two of her generals. Deciding to take Asta and Noel back with them to the Heart Kingdom, the four would then head back to the center of the Heart Kingdom, where the Water Spirit would be defending everyone, now meeting up with the rest of those who had been sent from the Clover Kingdom. Laura Pechica would ask Gother to use his power to transvert the events of the last several months as to why their alliance is happening, with him using his bow to send the emotions of her queen into everyone, shooting into the Clover members the emotions of Queen Laura Pechica, as well as the effect of the curse from Ejucula, one of the demons currently serving under Meliodas, or, well, should I say, the Demon King. Deanne and Gother would explain to Asta that this kingdom has a unique way of dividing people who use magic into different skill and talent ratings. It's called Into the Ten Magic Stages, with Stage 0 being at the top and the ninth stage being at the bottom, with Arcane Magic being above Stage 0. The kingdom possesses seven spirit guardians who are all rated as Stage 0, with the five from the original canon and Gother and Deanne making the extra two, giving the kingdom seven spirit guardians total. Alas, just like the original timeline, the Clover Kingdom would have a small competition against the spirit guardians with some magic knights, with everyone else's fights ending up pretty much the same as the original, aside of course from Asta, the guy who has bonuses from his race class advantage, and just being overall way stronger than everyone else in the Clover Kingdom, aside from the seven deadly sins and, well, the opponents they're facing. But just like the manga, we don't got time for no Spirit Guardian screen time. And so the time skip happens. Yes, Asta does have his fight with Undine, just like in the original. Am I gonna say what happens? No, because it's boring. Anyway, we do get the lake scene. You guys know if you've watched Black Clover, the lake scene, where we have Noel, Mimosa, and Sekre discussing with Lolo Pechica on which of them is dating Asta. This would cause a brief discussion with Mimosa again serving the plot and saying that they don't have time right now because of some demons or whatever. And Noel, of course, being a Sundare saying Bakasta and brushing it off. Sekker would simply say that Asta's head makes a nice perch. <clears throat> Asta gives good head. <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. What? <clears throat> anyway. 
Gentlemen, let's get back to business. With the Spade Kingdom steadily approaching and the Spade Resistance mounting its force, everyone would be training their hardest during the next six months, with Asta ending up training with Deanne and Gother being the two who could actually help him gain in strength, mostly because of their sacred treasures and using their magic power, with the two of them being the strongest in the Heart Kingdom and actually able to give Asta a challenge with preparing him for his fight against the Demon King. We get a snippet of them fighting, with Gother supporting Dien from the back in a 2 versus one fight, Asta releasing both sides of his demonic and angelic origin. Gother would successfully snipe Asta with one of his magic arrows, piercing Asta's black wing, sending him sprawling to the ground. At that point, Dian would then use her earth magic, shaking and dancing across it with her hammer as she smashes the hammer down on Asta's body. Asta would have both his arms up trying to carry the weight of the blow, but Dian's power and force and physical might would just be too much and overwhelm him, causing him to be crushed into the ground. Asta would then have a burst of light healing himself, his wings recovering as he flies back into the air, now pulling out the Demon Slayer's sword. Using it as he blocks Dian's hammer midair, using his own physical force with Dian being impressed with his combat skill. Dian and Asta going blow to blow, while Gother supports Dian from behind using his arrows. Eventually the two would bring Asta down as he runs out of power, falling to the ground and passing out, with the two of them knowing that there's still more that they need to do in order for Asta to be ready. Six months would pass. And as the team is standing together, they would receive a report from an attack on one of the villages in the Spade Kingdom, with the Dark Quadro collecting more villagers to drain their mana in order to power their huge machines, just like they were doing in the original. Inside the Grand Magic Zone, a large structure is being powered by the mana of the people of the Spade Kingdom to move across the belt. Inside of this large structure, a soldier would say that it's moving ridiculously slow saying that Candelo, the name of the structure, is running on the power of the people inside the fortress, and that those people run out of mana so quickly. Another soldier says they only need about half the people to live to get across the belt still, and that they're about to be wrung out of all of their mana. Upon seeing the images Undyne is transmitting to her, she would tell everyone that the Spade Kingdom has already taken over most of the Diamond Kingdom, and is now moving towards the Clover and Heart Kingdoms respectively. In a private conversation with Ganja, Lola Petrica would comment that Asta has gained a ton of strength in just the last couple of months, saying that through training with two of the Spirit Guardians, Deanne and Gother, he's become an arcane stage mage himself and says that the kind of person Asta is is someone who's always moving forward, saying that that type of personality trait with someone like him who has so much potential can cause him to grow at a rapid rate. At the Moving Fortress, the soldiers would continue to move people into chambers to replenish their mana, and of course supplies. One of the women there would beg for the soldiers to spare her child. Heh, <laughs> we'll use you people like cattle, and whatever the hell way we want. Ripping her off as she falls to the floor. Suddenly, the Demon Slayer sword would fly into the fortress, crashing through the glass and slashing into the wall, Asta landing onto the floor. Asta would stand up as he holds his hand out and calls the sword back to him, the sword ripping out of the wall and flying back, spinning into his hand. The soldier would recognize that Asta is a mage of the Clover Kingdom, seeing the black bull mark on his left side, and on his other side, his open shoulder, will be a dragon tattoo, the Sin of Wrath. The soldier would laugh, saying that's yeah, just him, then he's an idiot for coming here alone, saying he'll take care of Asta in a flash, attacking him with a lightning spell. Asta would easily tank the spell, not even having to deflect it, as he runs forward and defeats the soldier for a single swing, Asta turning and telling all the soldiers to come at him, and that he'll defeat them easily. Back in Hajj village, Sister Lee would walk outside of the church, saying that the weather seems to be rainy today. Looking down, she would find a stranger in ragged clothes, on the ground mumbling Yuno's name. Back inside the fortress, Asta would be telling everyone that they can, they're can they free to go, telling the hostages that everything's okay and they're free to leave. The woman saying that they're the current power source of the fortress and there's nowhere to run to. Asta would think about for a second saying he'll go and defeat all the soldiers and whoever the captain of this fortress is, and then all of them should be freed. They would all be shocked telling Asta there's no way he can do that, with the captain having this ominous magic power that is way stronger than any of the soldiers he just fought. Suddenly more soldiers would enter the room, but Asta would quickly summon the Demon Dweller's sword and destroy them, cutting through them like a hot knife through butter. Asta would quickly use some Hell Flames to 
relieve the room of the corpses. As he then continues running through the fortress, cutting through it and cutting down anyone who stands in his way, inevitably making it to the captain's quarters. The captain turning and sensing the power of a demon coming off of Asta. The first thing Asta would say is that the Spade Kingdom made his treat their citizens like dirt, clutching his sword as his eyes would narrow on the captain. The captain scoffs at this, saying that the Spade peasants should be honored that they can fuel their majestic kingdom's mobile fortresses, saying that that's all they're good for anyway. The captain commenting that Asta is going to be no match for his high stage poison magic. Using his demonic power from poison, he would use a basilisk's breath, Asta revealing his demon destroyer sword and erasing the magic. The captain would be wondering how he's able to dissolve his poison, with Asa telling the captain that it looks like he's the real trash here. Asa using his demon slayer sword and a black divider to cut the entire fortress in half, commenting that if the spade kingdom is going to pick a fight, then he's going to smash all of it to bits. Outside of the fortress, Noel Silva had just arrived alongside Mimosa and Finral, using his portal. Inside the fortress, Asa would return back to the hostages, explaining that he has defeated all of the soldiers inside of the fortress. Asa would then notice outside seeing Noel, Mimosa, and Finral having arrived. Once the three of them having entered, Mimosa would use her Princess Healing Flower Paradise. I'm not even joking that that's the name you can you can check on the wiki to heal all the civilians in the area that had their mana drained by the machine. Upon seeing this, the civilians are wondering what they're going to do now. Noel will tell them that it's not a problem, saying that they're going to be taking back the territory inside the Spade Kingdom and also their old villages so they can all go home. And of course, by this point, Luck and Leopold had already managed to defeat all the soldiers and liberate the village inside the Spade Kingdom's town. They would contact Austin, informing them if they had finished off their end of the deal, Fenril using his portal to meet up with them as they had already marked the place, bringing all of the villagers back home. They would ask again what they're planning to do with the village, Asa saying that the people can do whatever they want, saying it is their village after all. Inside the Spade Kingdom's capital, the Dark Triad of Zenon, Vanica, and Dante would have a meeting, with at the head of the table being their lord, the Demon King. Of course, the Demon King would only refer to the Zograti siblings as Lucifero, Magicula, and Beelzebul, the demons that reside inside of them. The three would be asked by Meliodas on how well their demon powers have been developing. The three would say that they've gotten much more comfortable with them, saying that they're ready to attack at any time. Back in the Clover Kingdom, Yuna would arrive back at Hajj, thinking about his past in the village along with how he's gotten his necklace back after the Elf Ark. When Yuna arrives at the church, Lily would greet him, bringing him inside. Once in, Yuna would meet with a man that Lily says he claims is from the Spade Kingdom. You know, commenting that the Spade Kingdom is currently the most dangerous country and definitely not an ally with the Clover Kingdom, getting ready to fight. The man would say quickly that he's not their enemy, explaining that the Spade Kingdom was originally a peaceful country about 20 years ago, before the Dark Quadrat had shown up and took over the kingdom, ruling over its people with fear. The man would point at Yuno, saying that Yuno is actually a member of the true royalty of the Spade Kingdom and the current heir to the throne. The father at the church, along with Sylph, would both be amazed that Yuno is actually a prince from another kingdom. The guy from the Spade Kingdom wondering about Sylph, then realizing that Yuno must be the one to have contracted with the Wind Spirit and actually having Sylph serve him. The man would use trace magic to show Yuno the memories that he had inherited from Yuno's birth to the point he was dropped and left at the church. The guy explained to Yuno that he shouldn't know that everything he just shown him was true. Yuno would reject this, saying that he is Yuno of the Clover Kingdom. Yuno would suddenly receive a call to, as he is the vice captain, saying that the squad is under attack, with at the Golden Dawn headquarters being destroyed. The spade mages having entered with their leader, Zenon, asking if they can go berserk. Zenon tells them they can kill everyone except their target. With Yuno fleeing through Hajj, you know, flies back on his broom trying to get as quickly as possible back to the Golden Dawn base to fight off the spade threat. While the base is being destroyed from both sides of the Dark Disciples and the Golden Dawn members fighting to the death, Zenon would meet up with the captain of the Golden Dawn, William Vengeance. And so the battle between Zenon's bone magic and William's world tree magic would begin. Yuno would arrive back at the base, beginning his fight with Gadaroys, a stone magic user who's being enhanced by devil power. Being one of the dark disciples, would attack Yuno. 
You know, saying he's not feeling like dealing with this trash would activate his spell using the spirit of Zephyr. Gadaroy's managing to actually block it. Splo beginning to gloat that you know spirit dive is no way even close to being powerful enough to defeat him. At this point, he managed to notice that you know spell is actually eroding his stone. You know's magic managing to cut down Ganaroy's, proclaiming that he's going to shut down the devil's operation. Suddenly, Zenon and William would come crashing down to the ceiling, as all of the Golden Dawn members would notice, turning to find that William had been defeated. Zenon noticing instead that some of the Golden Dawn members are somehow still alive. Soph would tell Yuno to quickly activate his spirit die spell, saying that Zenon's bad news. Zenon would activate his bone magic, the three realizing there's no place to evade inside of this space, trying to defend themselves. Yuno would manage to create a wind sword, cutting through the bone and blocking the attack. As he turned, seeing Klaus and some of the other members had failed to do so and were now severely injured and impaled by the bones. Zenon would claim that seeing Yuno was able to cut through his bones, that Yuno is clearly at least a stage zero mage, saying that he'll show Yuno 55% of his devil's power. Zenon would quickly defeat Yuno, stating that it's not that Yuno's weak, it's just that he's too strong. Yuno would grit his teeth, saying that that's nothing compared to a real devil, thinking of Asta's demonic power, as he tries his best to fend off Zenon and defend the kingdom. The guy from earlier from the Spade Kingdom would be arriving into the Golden Dawn's headquarters, having rode in on a broom with Sister Lily and Father, walking into the base to see the building completely wrecked, and to find Yuno laying on the ground with a bone sword impaling through him as Sylph the Wind Spirits begin to fade away, crying over his now dying form. Suddenly, Captain Vyonjins' last spell would activate, healing all of the members who were still alive of the Golden Dawn, Although some had been killed, Yuno would be furious upon his recovery and would realize that it was his failure to protect his comrades and that he had failed in his duties as vice captain. In another corner of the world, Vanika and her dark disciples were prepared to attack the Heart Kingdom. Meanwhile, back in the Spade Kingdom, Dante would comment how about mankind's evil true nature, saying that mankind makes the world a boring place to live. Dante would yawn, standing up as he then heads out, turning and waving to his master. The blonde golden hair of the King of Demons simply nodding, as Dante would leave wondering what kind of mage Yami Tsukuhiro would turn out to be. While Asta is still on the border of the Spade Kingdom with Finral and the other members of the Black Bulls, Asta would be talking to the rest of the squad, with Finral now running back and opening a portal to enter into the get Captain Yami, Henry would suddenly inform everyone that they're being invaded, and that their base is actually floating, Dante being outside the base using his gravity magic. Noticing that Yami's not there, would decide to play with the remaining Black Bulls until he shows up. The Black Bulls would try to attack Dante, but using his gravity magic, he would just stop them easily, basically bullying them, while they're surprised by his powerful magic attribute. Dante would be glad that the Black Bulls have a, yet another stage zero mage like Yami. He would say this while Vanessa would be using her power of Rouge to undo the deaths of everyone around her. Of course, her being the highest level mage besides Yami there right now. As Dante prepares himself to kill Vanessa, saying that it's a shame he has to kill such a pretty girl, suddenly his hand would stop as a bead of sweat would drip down the back of his wrist. What? What is that? He's not even using his gravity magic, but it felt like the pressure on his body had exuded by 10, no, 20%. He could feel it, like an electric shock streaking across his body. This is the same type of magic power as the king. Dante would turn, seeing a portal open, as Finral would have sent Asta back to the Black Bull's base. Asta would fly through, slashing Lucifero's arm off from his body. Cutting the entire arm off in a single slash, Dante would kick himself back, realizing that he's completely outclassed just from that first strike. Quickly trying to up the percentage rate of the devil that he's using up past 50%, releasing 60% of Lucifero. No, no, it's not enough. It's nowhere near enough. Why? Dante and Lucifero would be shocked, as even pushing their power to Dante's limits of his body, they would be unable to even scratch Asta. Asta would clutch his fingers on his left hand, squeezing them and whispering, Ark. 
A ball of light would enshroud Lucifero, completely highlighting his body in a golden light as Asta would squeeze his fists together. The entire magical power of his angel half enveloping Lucifero, completely destroying Dante's body. Yami would arrive on the scene to see a Dante that has been completely ripped to shreds. Asta not even having to use most of his power after having been trained by Deanne and Gother for the last six months. Dante would die, his soul passing on and Lucifero's connection to the current world being sent back, and with his vessel being destroyed, Lucifero's power would return back to purgatory. Zagris would arrive with him trying to steal Dante, and Asta would immediately begin to fight with him too with him being surprised wondering if Dante had not yet arrived, before seeing the pile of ashes that was waiting for him. While Magicula is being taken care of by Noelle, just like the original, we get that really cool fight with her Valkyrie armor and the past of history between the Silva and, of course, Magicula, Asta would be bullying Yuno's adversary. Basically playing with him as the bone magic would have no effect, with him burning the bones using a hell flame. As Beelzebub looks into the eyes of Asta, his dark purple miasma covering his entire right side, Asta would envelop him in a complete darkness, pulling out the demon slayer sword and executing Beelzebub before he can escape. With his intense power, Asta would have executed two of the higher ranked demons from the Zagrati's siblings, completely ruining the Demon King's plan, forcing him to either have to show up and battle Asta in order to take Yami. And with William Vengeance already having been taken back to the Spade Kingdom, that becomes the only option, which is exactly what Asta was counting on. Now, it's all the Black Bulls against the Demon King, as Melodos' form would show up out of the darkness using teleportation as a void would appear. With Meliodas' form, the Demon King, of course, inside of it, appearing before his grandson. The fight between Asta, the Black Bulls, and the Demon King would begin. With the Demon King using all of the powers at his command, including the commandments, he would be blitzing the Black Bulls. Even Asta would be having a hard time using his sword against Lost Vane as he's trying to defect against Meliodas' speed and power. But even after six months of training, not even Asta was strong enough to hold back this enhanced Demon King with the power of his Ten Commandments alongside Meliodas' uh, unique magic, which is this destroyer ability that he shows off towards the end of Seven Deadly Sins. The Demon King would be able to cancel out Rouge's fate-altering powers using his commandments. The moment Rouge would be disintegrated, this is when Yami and Asta would turn to tell the Black Bulls to all run. With Finral using his portal magic and them all escaping into the capital, leaving Asta and Yami behind to fight the Demon King. This is where the animation budget goes crazy. And I mean crazy. We get the Yudapon cubes, we get the entire landscape being slashed apart, mountains being torn asunder, Yami using his badass dark slash, Katana using his mana skin, Asta helping him with his anti-magic, and using his angelic healing abilities to help support Yami while his demonic attack power is being used against his own grandfather, with the two slashing and cutting all of the Demon King's attacks. Asta and Yami be on the back foot, not able to even do anything to defend against the Demon King, with all of his power and strength being far too much for them. That is, until Fenrir reappears. A portal opening in the sky as a huge giant crash could be heard, an orange jumpsuit scene, and Deanne, Gother, and Bon alongside Merlin have arrived. And finally coming down through the portal at last is Elizabeth, Asta's mom. B bon I said to protect her, why are you bringing her here? It's way too dangerous. Asta would be arguing with Bon, while the other four of the Seven Deadly Sins, Gother, Deanne, Merlin, and Bon have arrived to help Asta and Yami. The only members missing are King, Meliodas is sort of here, <laughs> and Escanor, who was never sent to this world to begin with. The final battle would take place as the Demon King uses all of his energy to fight off the Seven Deadly Sins, who were being weakened already from this world, trying to go after Elizabeth. Bon would be protecting Elizabeth alongside Yami, as Asta would be charging in the front. The dragon sin tattoo that he had embedded on him during his time in the Heart Kingdom, shining as his dragon fights against Meliodas's. Man, that sounds really bad in, in hindsight, but we're gonna keep it. <laughs> Are you already ready for a headphone check? <laughs> Alright, we chill, we chill, we good, we good. I'm, I'm not playing around anymore, okay? Let's get serious. <clears throat> 
with Bon, Asta, Deanne, Gother, and Merlin all working together. We have four of the original Seven Deadly Sins, Elizabeth on support, and Asta leading the front as their temporary captain, as the temporary dragon sin of the Seven Deadly Sins. Anyway, the battle will begin. It will be pretty epic with Deanne using her hammer, Gother using his arrows, Bon using his snatch, and <laughs> his ability snatch. <laughs> And, uh, and Asta just destroying everything with physical power. And as the, as the fight goes on between Asta and the Demon King, things would get heated up with Asta using a sword slash. Using Lost Vein to block it, the Demon King would then create some clones to fight off the rest of the Sins, with his compatibility between himself and Melodus' body increasing all the further. As the battle is reaching its climax, with Deanne being taken out, one of her legs being severed, with Elizabeth using her magic to try and heal her, the others would be holding off Meliodas, or well, the Demon King. Finally, the time would come as he would blitz past them all towards Elizabeth. Elizabeth would be shocked as she tries to dodge, but of course being way too slow. As she falls backward, Asa would charge basically almost at full speed blocking the blow as he finally has the inner demon of the anti-magic book working with him, with his memories completely aligning with his, Liebe having failed to protect his mother and the, his backstory still, and her being killed alongside quote-unquote Asta, Asta would also be feeling these same memories. Using his full 100% unequated power, he would block the attack before slashing with his sword, cutting Meliodas' body in two. At this point, Asta would retrieve the Demon Destroyer Sword, that being the spade-shaped blade that he received from Licht that can destroy magic. Asta would stick the blade between Meliodas' halves, purging the Demon King's soul out of Meliodas' body. Having defeated the Demon King and resealed him back inside of Purgatory, Asta would be victorious and Meliodas could finally be put back together and healed by Elizabeth and Asta. With Meliodas' soul still being deep within Meliodas' his body, he would currently be unconscious for the next several weeks. With the Dark Triad having been defeated, there is no need for a retrieval arc into the Spade Kingdom like in the original Black Clover. I didn't mention this earlier, but I figured most of you would assume, since Deanne and Gother were in the Heart Kingdom, which was being attacked by Magicula, that they were helping Noel in defeating her before they had arrived by Portal. But alas, with the Demon King being finally killed, the Seven Deadly Sins would be able to return home. Or so I'd like to say. Because even if they opened up the Portal to return back to the world they originated from, King is still missing. And while their magic power is still being drained here, there's no immediate threat to them, so they might just take the next couple of years to try and find King across the world somewhere. Looking for King is what Bon and Deanne would be up to, with the two of them wanting to return back home as soon as possible and Deanne just wanting to find King. Meliodas would recover meeting Asta for the first time, with them looking each other in the eye seeing how tall the other one is. Meliodas would be squeezing Asta's muscles before looking at how scrawny he looks in comparison, asking Elizabeth if he should start working out. Bon would greet his captain once again being awake, telling him that they're going to go off looking for King, saying that Yami Sukihiro, that guy from the Black Bulls, had tipped them off about some place outside of the Four Kingdoms where they'd been searching so far, somewhere called the Land of the Sun and that when they inevitably found him, they would come back and they could all head home. But for now, that brings us to what Merlin and Gother are up to. Gother would be hanging out with Merlin back in the Witch's Forest, having said goodbye to Lil Petchika. Noel and the rest of the Magic Knights would be thanked for their duties by, via the Wizard King, with Meliodas' recovery going smoothly with Asta and Elizabeth's help, and Elizabeth finally being reunited with her husband and their son. Asta would continue his work for the Black Bulls, now protecting a much safer kingdom, as they would all be working together with the dot remnants of the Diamond Kingdom and the Heart Kingdom to reinstate the former Spade Kingdom and make sure all four kingdoms can return back to prosperity. And that brings us to the end of Asta's story. Well, so far, unless you want to get into the manga stuff with things going on in the, the Sun Kingdom, but I typically don't do that, so from here on, you'll have to write your own story for Asta. Anyway, thank you all so much for supporting this series over the past two years that it's been coming out. I'm sure you guys have been enjoying this entire video if you've watched it this far. 
with my voice going up and down and up and down and nasally and not nasally. And I just want to say thank you so much for watching my whole story. And uh, I hope you all really enjoyed it. But all good things must come to an end. And as such, this is the finale to What If Asta Was Meliodas' Son? <laughs>